Welcome to Old Time Rewind. I'm your host, Raven. Get comfy, get cozy. Tonight's rewind is... X minus one. Tonight, the Ray Bradbury story entitled, And the Moon Be Still as Bright. The first three expeditions for Mars left Earth in a mushroom of flame, arced through the atmosphere, and finally dwindled to tiny specks in the big eye of the Mount Palomar telescope, and then were lost to sight forever. The prearranged landing signals flashed back to Earth, and then the radios went dead. One after the other, ships had disappeared and were never heard from again. But still, the rockets came. The fourth expedition emerged from the silent gulfs of space angled down toward the floating red disk of Mars, down into an orbit as the order came to land. The last blast of the bow jets broke red against the blue desert sands, and the ship slid to a halt at the edge of a vast city that reflected the icy glare of the moonlight. For a while, all was still. All right, Parkfield. Open the airlock. Hi, sir. Fresh air. Hey, it's cold out here. Who cares? We got here. I thought I'd never hit solid ground again. Hey, how about a fire, Captain Wildey? It's freezing. Later. We have work to do. Oh, smell that air. Why, you could get drunk on it. Say, there's an idea. Why don't we break out a bottle and celebrate? Biggs, there will be no drinking done till we're secured. But we're landed, Captain. Three other expeditions landed and disappeared within 24 hours. Now, we're not relaxing security till we find out what happened to them. What do you mean? Maybe Martian? Sender, you're an archaeologist. How old would you say they are? I can't tell till I study them more closely. It's the kind of engineering we couldn't duplicate on Earth. Well, I'm not interested in the architecture now. I want to make sure there's nothing there that might be dangerous. Mr. Hathaway. Yes, sir? I want you and Spender to take a reconnaissance party into the city and find out what's there. We'll set up camp here. No man is to go more than 50 feet from this rocket. And there'll be no celebration till Hathaway and his party report back. In the sea bottoms, the wind stirred along faint vapors. And from the mountains, great stone visages looked upon the silvery rocket and the small fire. The sky was black overhead as the two racing moons threw knife-edged double shadows on the desert. All right. Come and get it. Ciao. Hey, what do you got there, Jackie? Sawdust smothered in cold chicken fat. Good. I thought it was something I couldn't eat. <laughs> hey, Captain. Mr. Hathaway's back. Oh, Captain. Captain Wilder. Oh, yes. Over here, Mr. Hathaway. Well, most of the city's dead. Spender says it's been dead a good many thousand years, but we found one part about a mile over toward the... People were living in it last week, sir. People? Martians. Where are they now? Dead. We found bodies, thousands of bodies. They hadn't been dead more than ten days. One of the died. You won't believe it. What killed them? Chicken pox. Chicken pox? Yes. Where could they get chicken pox? From Earth. Oh, then the other rockets did get through. Yes. I don't know what the Martians did to them, but I sure know what they did to the Martians. They gave them chicken pox and wiped them out. They just didn't have any resistance to an Earth disease. Now think of it, Captain. A race builds itself for a million years, refines itself, does everything it can to give itself respect and beauty, and then it dies. Of what? It's like saying the Greeks died of mumps or the proud Roman Empire collapsed because of athlete's foot. We didn't even give them a decent excuse for dying. We just gave them chicken pox. Spender, get hold of yourself. You didn't see those bodies, Captain. Yes, I know. It must have been a shock. You need a rest, a little relaxation. The Martians are dead. There's nothing you can do about that now. Hey, you hear that? The Martians are all dead. Come on, let's break out a bottle and hold it out. How about a case, eh? Good Lord. They have to do that now? Isn't there time later to throw old beer cans into the canals? Bender, you're an idealist. They're not. All they know now is that they're safe. Little shouting won't hurt. You think too much. I was safe on Mars. 
Mars. The first Earth men on Mars. We're going to celebrate. <laughs> Twenty bottles were opened and drunk. The voices got louder. The earth laughs and shouts echoing across the empty Martian sands. Spender listened to the wind over his ears, cool and whispering. He felt the land getting cooler. The stars grew closer, very near. The air smelled clean and new. He looked at the cool ice of the white Martian buildings over there on the empty sea lands. <laughs> Hey, what do we do with these empty bottles? Save them, stupid. There's a two cents deposit. Ah. <laughs> Throw them away. Hey, wait, wait. How about that building? Two to one on a buck, I can heave one right through that window. You're up. All right, here goes. Hey. Oh, die. Hey, double or nothing on the next shot. Put that bottle down, Biggs. Who's there, Mr. Spender? Stop smashing those windows. What's the difference? The planet's ours now. I guess I can do anything with it I want. Drop that bottle or I'll knock your teeth out. Yeah? Hey, just watch me. I warned you. Big. Hey, what? Hey, 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 come on, come on. Oh, what's going on here? Spender! Spender! I hit him. He's crazy, Captain. He just walked up and slugged me. All right, thanks. Spender, you come with me. Now, suppose you explain. What was the idea? The noise, the drunken brawl. Spender, the men are tired. This has been a long trip. And you have a different way of seeing things. Oh, I'm seeing things, all right. I'm seeing how we'll ruin Mars. We'll rip it up and rip the skin off the way we've already ruined Earth. And is that why you hit Biggs? Yes. I couldn't stand the idea of them watching us make fools of ourselves. Them? The Martians. They're dead. They're all dead. But they know we're here. Doesn't an old thing always know when a new thing comes? We've come a long way to smash their windows and spit in their wine. Well, maybe you're right. But I'm still going to fine you $50 for that fight. Now, come on, Spender. Suck in your chin. We'll go back there and play happy. Now they moved out into the moonlight across the desert. They made their way into the dreaming, dead city. The light of the racing twin moons glinted on the barrel of a pistol, the long blade of a machete, the round, gurgling shape of a raised bottle. The wind blew in from the dead sea bottom and brushed through the silvery wire filigree of the towers. Strange music drifted down to the double shadowed streets, a thin, haunted music that played as it had played through the uncounted years of time. Nobody moved. The moons held and froze them. The wind beat slowly around them. Hey! Hey, you people in the city! Pigs! I just want to make a little noise. What kind of a celebration is this, anyway? Come on. They built this city thousands of years ago. And now where are they? How do they die? Who cares? It's dead. That's good enough for me. Lord Byron. What? Lord Byron, a 19th century poet. He wrote a poem that fits this city. Might have been written by the last Martian poet. So we'll go no more a-roving so late into the night. Though the heart be still as loving, though the moon be still as bright. For the sword outwears its sheath and the soul outwears its breast. And the heart must pause to breathe, and love itself must rest. Though the night was made for loving, and the day returns too soon, yet we'll go no more a-roving by the light of the moon. Without a word, the earthmen stood in the center of the city. It was a clear night. There was not a sound except the music of the wind. At their feet lay a tile court, worked into the shapes of ancient animals and images. They stood there, silvered by the double moons beneath the crystal towers of Mars. 
And then Biggs was sick, and the sour stench of liquor filled the cool air. The men of Earth had come to Mars. And Spender turned and walked away into the city, alone in the moonlight, never once stopping to look back. It was a morning that might have been a Monday, or a Tuesday, or any day on Mars. Biggs was on the canal rim, his feet hung down in the cool water, soaking, while he took the sun in his face. Hey, what are you doing back here, Biggs? Didn't you go out with the search party? Yeah. I come back. I got a blister. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What do you mean? Look. Look, Cherokee. See that? Well, anyway, I had enough searching. Four days hunting for that screwball spender. Didn't find him yet, huh? Oh, uh, good riddance. Oh, my feet. I'm going to soak them in the canal. Uh, if I was wilder, I wouldn't worry about that nut spender. Let him go. He's a cracked pot anyway. Well, he's a little foggy upstairs, I guess. Hey, why don't you take your feet out of that canal, Biggs? I got to make coffee out of that water. Coffee? You call that stuff coffee? I had a motorcycle once that dripped grease and tasted better hey, than wait that. Wait a minute, Biggs. Hey, look over there. Where? By that bush. There's someone there. Hey. It's him. Hey. Hey, Spender. Spender. He's coming over. Why don't he stay lost, that crazy jerk? Hi, Spender. Long time no see. Hello, Cherokee. I've been exploring some ruins. Oh, it's you and them ruins. You're like a dog in a boneyard. What's the matter? Why don't you say something? Where you been? Up in the hills. What would you say if I told you I found a Martian? Oh, yeah? Where? Never mind. Let me ask you a question. How would you feel if you were a Martian and people came to your land and started to tear it up? Well, I know how I'd feel. I've, I've got Cherokee blood in me. My grandfather told me a lot of things about the way they kicked the Indians around in the Oklahoma Territory. If there's any Martian around, I'm all for him. How about you, Big? They're dead. They're all dead. It's a good thing, too. Well, I found a Martian up in a dead town in the hills. I've been reading their books, and they're easy to understand, and I've learned their language. And then I found this Martian, and I brought him here now. I don't see no Martian. I'm the last Martian. What did you say? Biggs, I'm going to kill you. Oh, cut it out. What kind of a lousy joke is that? And I don't... Now, don't put that gun away. <laughs> you're kidding, huh? All right, Spender, you're... Ah! He's dead. You killed him. You can come with me, Cherokee. You're an Indian. You know how the Martians would feel. You can be with me in this. You killed him. You just... You just killed him. He deserved it. You're crazy. Maybe I am. But you can come with me. Come with you for what? Go on, get out of here, you crazy murderer. Of all of them, I thought you'd understand. I thought you'd remember what happened to your own people. You get out of here, you crazy murderings! Don't reach for that gun! Spender. Spender! Hathaway. Break out the arms locker. Issue pistols, rifles, and grenades. Yes, sir. And you'd better get the Bible out of the navigation chest. We have to bury these two. Now, well, Proctor, you start digging a grave, hmm? How about Spender? We'll have to go up in the hills and find him. Just let me at him with my bare hands, a crazy murdering louse. That's enough, Proctor. The man is sick. He must be... Sick my eye. He's... That's a... enough. Now grab a shovel and start digging. Spender saw the thin dust rising in the valley, and he knew the pursuit was beginning. The sun burned farther up the sky, and the blue sand drifted lazily across the sea bottom below. He sat beside a quiet pool 10,000 years old and held the silver book. Through the house played the strange wind music of ancient Mars, and he heard voices whisper in his mind. <laughs> I hear you. I've always heard you. Even down there on Earth. No, I won't run. What's the use? Live, Earthman. Live, live, live. What for? To see them tear down your temples and put up hot dog stands? 
Run, run, run. Ah, they've seen me now. They know I'm up here. <laughs> There's Wilder now. I've got him right in my sights. Kill, 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 kill. Funny, he hasn't ordered them to use grenades. They could lob one right up here and blow me to bits. And maybe the captain thinks I'm too nice to be blown to bits. He wants my death to be clean. Just one bullet hole in me, nothing messy. And why? Because he understands me. The only one in the crew who ever did. Well, at least I can do the same for him. Just one bullet in his head, a nice clean death. All I have to do is pull the trigger and then... It's no use. I can't do it to him. Spender! Spender! Can you hear me, Spender? I hear you, Captain. What do you want? Talk! All right. Come on up. Leave your gun down there. Keep your hands up. Oh. That's quite a climb. You would mind if I sit down? Hmm. How long do you think you can hold out? Until you're all dead. Now, why didn't you kill all of us this morning when you had the chance? You could have. I know. I got sick. After I started killing people, I realized they were just fools and I shouldn't be killing them, but it was too late. So I came up here where I could get angry again. Why did you do it? When I was a kid, my folks took me to visit Mexico City. Now, always remember the way my father acted loud and big. And my mother didn't like the people because she thought they didn't wash enough. I can, I can see my mother and my father coming to Mars and acting the same way. Anything that's strange is no good to us. We aren't fit to take over this planet. But to kill two men. How would you feel if a Martian spit on the White House floor? You know, you haven't acted very civilized yourself. Today. I'll kill you all off, Wilder. That'll delay the next rocket five years, and then I'll kill them too. And if I'm lucky, I'll live to be 60. And I'll meet every expedition that lands on Mars. Oh, I'll be very friendly. I'll explain our rocket blew up one day. And then I'll kill them off. I'll save Mars for half a century. And by then, maybe the Earth people will give up. And yet you're outnumbered. We already have you surrounded. In an hour, you will be dead. I found an underground passage that'll take me back in the hills, Wilder. I'll go back there. And then I'll pick you off one by one. We'll see. Well, it's a nice town you've got here, Spender. It's beautiful. I'd like to live here. You can. Join me. You're not like them. Why go back to them, Captain? I'll, I'll show you what a good life these people had. I'll be... No. No, there's too much earth blood in me. I may even agree with you about all this, but that does not change what I must do. You won't stay? No. This is your last chance, Spender. Look, you're sick. Now, come along with me quietly. No. no. One, one last thing. If you win, do me a favor. Try to see that they don't tear this planet apart. Right. And if it helps, just think of me as a very crazy fellow who went berserk one summer day. Be easier on you that way. Now, I'll think that over. So long, Spender. Bye, Captain. Good luck. The men spread out again, walking and then running on the hot hillside places where there would be sudden cool grottoes that smelled of moss and sudden open blasting places that smelled of sun or stone. The men ran and ducked and ran and squatted in the shadows. I'll blow his brain! Captain Wilder hugged the rock warm by the sun. He gasped, for the air was thin and not meant for running. Spender lay at the top of a hill, and a gap in the rocks showed the white of his shirt against the shadows. Wilder looked at the towers of the little clean Martian village, like sharply carved chess pieces lying in the afternoon. He saw the rocks and the interval between where Spender's chest was revealed. Go on, Spender, get out. You've only got a few seconds to escape. 
Go on, get out of the cage. Let's come back later. You go now. I've got to win this. I've got to think that I'm right. And pull this trigger. Go now. Get out. I'll get him. A slug in the head. I'll blow his bloody brain. No, Park Hill. Put down that gun. I'll do this myself. Oh, Spender. Why didn't you get out? Why? 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 They buried him in that ancient valley town where the music of the wind played on through the days and the nights. They laid him in an ancient silver sarcophagus with waxes and wines which were 10,000 years old. His hands folded on his chest. The last they saw of him was his peaceful face in the cold silver light of the racing twin moons. The captain found the poem in Spender's pocket. And he read it before he shut the marble door. So we'll go no more a roving so late into the night. Though the heart be still as loving and the moon be still as bright. Though the night was made for loving and the day returns too soon, yet we'll go no more a roving by the light of the moon. The next afternoon, Park Hill did some target practice in one of the dead cities, shooting out the crystal windows and blowing the tops off the fragile towers. Captain Wilder caught Park Hill and nearly knocked his teeth out. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you the Ray Bradbury story and The Moon Be Still as Bright, adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Featured in the cast were John Larkin, Clark Gordon, Dick Hamilton, Nelson Almstead, Lawrence Kerr, and Stan Early. Your narrator was Norman Rose. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. X-1. X minus minus one. 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 Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents... X, 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 X minus, 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 minus one... one, one, one. Tonight, Appointment in Tomorrow by Fritz Leiber. The first angry rays of the sun, which surprisingly enough still rose in the east at 24-hour intervals, pierced the lacy tops of Atlantic combers and touched thousands of sleeping Americans with unconscious fear. 
because of the unpleasant similarity to the ray from World War III's thermonuclear weapons. This was America approaching the end of the 20th century. America of the mask fad for women and the neo-cretan dress styles. America of your local radiation hospital, of the endless war and the loyalty detector. In his bedroom in the Thinkers Foundation, Georges Helmut slept. His educational sandman purred learnedly in his ear, droning tensor calculus through the night, filling the hours that used to hold man's formless fears and floating anxieties with the rigid form and anchored shapes of mathematics. Precisely at eight, the sidereal alarm went off. Oh, yeah. Ooh, my head. Oh, shower. 96.8, commence. Under the soothing spray of the body temperature robo-shower, Helmut took a deep breath and cast his mind to the limits of the world and his knowledge. It was a somewhat shadowy vision, but he noted with impartial approval, definitely less shadowy than yesterday morning. Uh, dry blast, commence. Employing a rapid mental scanning technique, he cleared his memory chains of false associations, including those acquired while asleep. He felt the snap of clearing non-thalamic reasoning returning as the brain surged into clear, sharp control. Off. Probing. Color key 705. He stepped into his clothing, the severe tunic, tights, and soccasins of the modern businessman. He smiled. The next big move had come to him in his sleep, as many of his best decisions did, because he utilized the time-saving technique of somno thought, which could function at the same time as somno learning. Attention, robo locator. <whistles> Category: rocket physicist. Classification: genius level. Time limit for search: twenty minutes. Commence. <whistles> Take dictation. Dear fellow scientists, the project is contemplated that will have a crucial bearing on man's future in deep space. Ample non-military government funds are available. There was a time when professional men scoffed at the Thinkers Foundation. Then there was a time when the Thinkers perforce neglected the professional men. Now both times are past. I would like to consult you this afternoon, 3 o'clock sharp, Thinkers Foundation, signed, Georges Helmut. End of dictation. The president is waiting to see Maisie, sir. He has the general staff with him. March in peace to him. Tell him I'll be down in a few minutes. Huge as a primitive nuclear reactor, Maisie, the great electronic brain, loomed over the knot of hushed-voiced men. Its front was an orderly expanse of controls, indicators, telltales, and terminals the upper ones reached by a chair on a boom. This was the machine with a million times as many synapses as the human brain, the machine that remembered by cutting delicate little notches on the rims of molecules. This was the machine that timid cyberneticists and stuffy professional scientists had said could not be built. Yet this was the machine that the thinkers, with characteristic Yankee push, had built and named, with characteristic irreverence, Maisie. Have you the questions for the day, Mr. President? Uh, here, Mr. Helmut. I see. The question on the Pakistan crisis is a little touchy. I don't know. If, if there is enough data to answer it, Maisie will do so. Well, of course, I didn't mean to. Of, of if you will excuse me, gentlemen, I will code the questions for Maisie. Oh, section five, question four. Whom would that come from? A uh, number four. Uh, 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 Physics, Opoly and his research team. I see. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, while I'm coding the tape, there will be time to watch the takeoff of the Mars rocket. Beautiful, beautiful. Oh, I've often wanted to go to New Mexico. As a matter of fact, I've always wanted to go right through uh, to Mars. Uh, Mr. President. My chief of staff thinks the project should be under the Army instead of the Thinkers Foundation. Mr. President, this is the way Maisie designed the project. Oh, I know, I know. That's what I told him. 
Still, I wish you people could bring back a few of those wise little devils from Mars. It would be a good thing for the party, uh, the country. It's quite unthinkable. The telepathic abilities of the Martians make them extremely sensitive. The conflicts of ordinary Earth minds would impinge on them psychotically. Only the thinkers can contact them because of the clear training and errorless memory chains. Perhaps someday in the future... Ah, there goes the rocket. Beautiful, beautiful. I am ready to submit the question tapes to Maisie. Stand back, gentlemen. Oh, well, sorry, sorry. And now... All right, gentlemen. Maisie is thinking. The question tape, like a New Year's streamer tossed out of a high window into the night, sped on its dark way along spinning rollers. Curling with an intricate aimlessness, it tantalized the silver fingers of a thousand relays, saucily evaded the glances of ten thousand electric eyes, impishly darted down a narrow black alleyway of memory banks, and, reaching the center of the cube, suddenly emerged into a small room where a sweating fat man in shorts sat drinking beer. Here it comes. Get off my lap, honey. I've got work to do. Can it wait? I said get. Oh, you didn't have to do that. When Maisie thinks, she thinks. Open up another beer. Look, I'm not a robo-barmaid. Honey... Do what you're told, or I'll ship you out, where they'll work some of the upholstery off that frame, slopping radioactive mud. You don't have to get nasty, Jan. Here's your beer. Ah, that's better. It makes you fat. I like to be fat. It makes our relationship more poignant. Pass me the questions and get over to your keyboard. You're a greasy pig. <laughs> but such an attractive pig. Start taping. Why, that dirty... What's the matter? Uh, one of the questions. Does Maisie stand for male Zell? For what? Male Zell. Does it? Look, you just keep sitting on your brains and let me do the thinking. Tape. Maisie does not stand for male Zell. Maisie stands for amazing. Humorously given the form of a girl's name. Who is male Zell? Edgar Allan Poe. Huh? It's a story. Male Zell's chess player. About an automaton that was supposed to play chess. Poe proved it had a man inside it. Oh, and they want to know if Maisie... They're wrong. Maisie doesn't have a man inside it. Just a lump of conceited lard. <laughs> <gasps> oh, you could hit me with that. Look at my dress. Get me another glass of beer. Oh. I must have come from the physics section of the Research Institute. Operly in that eight Farquhar. And we'll look into that. All right, start taping. Question one. The midterm election vidicast should be spaced as follows. <laughs> Morton Opperly's living room was quite behind the times. Instead of reading tapes, there were books. And instead of a four-by-six TV screen, there was a Picasso, still faintly radioactive from being smuggled out of the Manhattan crater. Two physicists faced each other across the table, old Mr. Opperly and young Mr. Farquhar. About that male Zell question, Willie... Why do you keep teasing the zoo animals? Because the thinkers are charlatans who must be exposed. We know their Maisie is no more than a, a tea leaf reading fake. We've traced their Mars rockets and we know they go into orbit 500 miles above Earth and stay there until it's time to come down with the, the latest miraculous Martian mental science. But we've already exposed the thinkers very thoroughly. You know the good it did. Ah, Willie, the age we live in wants magicians. A scientist tells people the truth. When times are good, when the truth offers no threat, people don't mind. But when times are very, very bad, well, a magician tells people what they wish were true. That perpetual motion works, that colored lights can cure cancer, that a psychosis is no worse than a bad cold, and that they live forever. In good times, magicians are laughed at. They're the luxury of a spoiled, wealthy few. 
But in bad times, people sell their souls for magic cures and buy perpetual motion machines to power their war rockets. Are we supposed to beg off from a job because it's difficult and dangerous? In my day, Willard, I was one of the frightened men. Later, I was one of the angry men. And then one of the minds of despair. And now I'm convinced that all of my reactions were futile. Exactly. You reacted. You didn't act. If you men who discovered atomic energy had only formed a secret league, if you'd only had the guts and foresight to use your tremendous bargaining power to... Willard, we scientists weren't the stuff of which cloak and dagger men are made. Can you imagine Oppenheimer wearing a mask or old Einstein sneaking into the White House with a bomb in his briefcase? That's not the way power is seized. New ideas aren't useful to men bargaining for power. Only established facts or lies are. What do you want to do? Surrender the world to charlatans without a struggle? The thinkers are vulnerable. Their power is based on a series of lies. All power is. The greater the lie, the greater the power. What's it based on? A few lucky guesses, some faith healing, some science hocus pocus. The power of the thinkers isn't based on what they've got, but on what the world hasn't got. Peace, honor, a good conscience. They've sent for me. Who? Jan Tregeron? No. George Helmuth. I got the radiogram an hour ago. They know they'll have to produce a real nuclear rocket pretty soon, and they'll need our help. I'm afraid, Willard. You think it might be a trap? After the Malzell question, you think they might want to shut me up? I'm not afraid for your life. I'm worried about other things they might do to you. They'd better be worried about the things I'm going to do to them. March and peace to you, Willard Farquhar. You have entered the Thinker's Foundation. Please remain on the slideway. I want to see George Helmut. May we take your hat and coat? What the... Do not be alarmed. Invisible radiations are slaughtering all the germs in your body, while more delicate emanations are producing a benign rearrangement of your emotions. Claptrap. I can recognize a 14-cycle sonic note when I hear one. Where's Helmut? This way, please. Helmut, cut out all this swami stuff. Where are you? I'm afraid Mr. Helmut won't be able to meet you, Mr. Farquhar. I'm uh, Jan Tregeron. Perhaps you can have your conversation with me. George Helmut waited in the conference room with two dozen empty chairs. He had prepared by two hours' rest with the Somno teacher on full volume for this conference having strengthened his mind by hard years of somno learning, memory straightening, and sensory training, he had assured himself of the executive power to control the technicians and direct their specialized abilities. Together, they would have built the true Mars rocket. But, unfortunately, no one came. Where are they? Report. No word from the door, Master. They can't all be late. Did you check? The calls have been put through. What response? Dr. Burnside reports he received the second message just in time. What second message? The message calling off the meeting. Did he read the text of the second message back? Shall I play it back? Never mind. How was it signed? The signature. Signature, Mr. Jan Tregeron. <laughs> George Helmut dejectedly examined his organizational charts. And then, tapping his stylo on the pad, he extended his mental aura, cleared his memory chains of error, accelerated his cerebral processes by the Harbor Gerson process he had practiced for so many years. Slowly, he could feel the tight, heart squeezing disappointment ebb. He was in control again. Tregeron, he was the one to blame. Tregeron, who was so used to working by deception that he must be shown the light. Well, Willard, how was your adventure among the magicians? Well, they didn't hurt me. You're sure? And are you as determined as ever to smash and expose the thinkers? Of course. Only from now on I won't embarrass you by asking any male Zell questions. After this, I shall bore from within. 
Now, where have I heard that phrase before? Do I understand that you are becoming a thinker, Willie? Certainly. That's the only way to smash them. Out-trick all their trickeries. Organize a fifth column. Then, strike. The end justifying the means, of course. Of course. I wonder if becoming a thinker doesn't simply mean that you've decided to use lies and tricks as your chief method. Well, you're working with Helmuth? Not Helmuth. Trigorin. I'm afraid that Helmuth's career as a thinker is going to have quite a setback. Ah, well. Goodbye, Willie. <laughs> Tigeron, I want to talk to you. Shall I leave? No, please stay. Jan? Stay. You ought to enjoy this. George has that errorless memory chain. Tigeron, you know why I'm here. I don't know. I've been sadly remiss on my precognition and clairvoyance exercise. I've been too busy with other things, other people, uh, other exercises. Uh, but I don't need Major to guess. You just went ahead and canceled the conference without consulting me. You called it without consulting me. Shouldn't do that sort of a thing, George. I was absolutely sure of my ground, perfectly prepared. I visualized it. The rocket boosting up on chemical power, then setting sail. Sail? Sail? <laughs> a nuclear reactor rocket? <laughs> George, you're fabulous. Yes, sail. Thin streams of nuclear reflecting material and the rocket feeding Maison streams behind it. I conceived it all, complete. Except for technical details. George, you are a thinker. A real thinker. I know. Now look here, George. Every man should stick to his trade. Technology isn't ours. You know as well as I do that we're going to have a nuclear spaceship and actually go to Mars someday. Are we? Yes. Just as we're going to have to build an actual Maisie. I helped you organize the thinkers. At least I was your first partner. Our basic idea was that the time had come to apply science to the life of man on a large scale. The only thing holding the world back from this was the ignorance and superstition of the average man and the stubbornness and lack of enterprise of the academic scientists. Their worship of facts, even when the facts were clearly dangerous. Splendid. Splendid. Caddy, get me another beer. I'm filing my nails. <laughs> all right, all right. Everybody wanted the new world. The trips to Mars, the knowledge of the human brain. All they lacked was the nerve to take the first big step. And that was what we supplied. Here's your beer. There was no time for slow and careful plotting. We couldn't afford to check and double check. We couldn't wait for the grudging approval of the professionals. We had to use fake stunts, tricks, anything to get over the big point. Once that was done, mankind was headed down the new road. It was easy to just... Heal the breach with the professionals and to make good in actuality what had been made good in pretense. <sighs> Very good. <clears throat> the beer. We built Maisie. We built the Mars rocket. We discovered the wisdom of the Martians. We sold the people on the science the professionals had been too high toned to advertise or bring into the marketplace. But now that we'd succeeded, it's time to let accomplishment catch up with imagination, to implement fantasy with fact. You suppose I would have gone in with you if I hadn't known that someday we'd actually make what we claimed we had already made? Oh? Oh, oh, oh is that it? John, the day's come. And I'm the man. I've prepared myself. Caddy, clear the decks. All right. I know. You just want room to point that fat finger. I want her to stay. All right. George, look, every revolutionary wants to see the big change take place in his lifetime. But time for the second step. George, the average man's exactly where he was ten years ago when we took over. Except he's got a new god. More than ever, he thinks of Mars as a Hollywood paradise with wise men and yummy princesses, like Caddy here. You think I'm yummy, really? Shut up. Maisie is, is mama, magnified a million times. The professional scientists, they're more jealous and stuffy than ever. All they like to do is turn the clock back to a genteel dream world of square caps and quadrangles. Bravo! I said shut up. George, 
Maybe in 10,000 years we'll be ready for the second big step. Meanwhile, the clever will rule the stupid. The realists will rule the dreamers. George, did you actually think you could have bossed those professionals? Nuclear scientists? Rocket physicists? Oh, now listen to me, boy. They'd have torn you to pieces in 20 minutes and glad of the chance. George, you baffled me. You know that Maisie and the Mars trips and all that are fakes, yet you believe in your somno learning and consciousness expansion and optimism pumping like a corn-fed yokel. There is a place for the man who has the courage to dream. Sure. In a straitjacket. Oh, George, you remind me of those men who used to put out those lurid little magazines with Caddy's grandmother on the cover in outer space in a, in a stripped-down bathing suit. My grandmother never... I said shut up! That's what it is. Frustrated little men playing science god to generations of pimply high school chemistry students and gas station attendants, counting them into thinking they're in the know, sprinkling a few formulas to the garbage and playing Atom Smasher, and then being very solemn about the role of imagination in science. George, the trouble with you is they forgot to take your zap gun and space cadet decoder pin away from you when you turned 13. <laughs> That's your honest opinion? It's more than that. George, get a hold of yourself and quit taking fantasy in the veins. That's an order. Jan, the strange part of it is that I know as well as you do that Maisie and the Mars trips are fakes, but some things aren't. The human mind, Jan, is a tool that hasn't been perfected yet. There are more things in heaven and earth that are dreamed of in your philosophy, Horatio. Who's Horatio? I said shut up. <gasps> this is the last full cackle, George. You've been fooling around with ESP, huh? Telepathy? Maybe a little hypnotism? Maybe. All right. Guess what I've got in my drawer. Extend your consciousness. Telepath it. Visualize it. Oh, never mind. I'll slave you the mental effort. It's a pistol, see? Now, let me tell you something. i got a couple of boys waiting outside. They'll take you by jet to New Mexico. George, congratulations. You're leaving for Mars tomorrow. Mars? Yes. I've decided Mars will be the best place for you. We'll arrange it so that your trip is, say, uh, two years long. Perhaps in that time, orbiting up there, you'll learn a little Martian wisdom. For example, the big liar must never fall for his own lie. Meanwhile, I've got a replacement for you. His name is Willard Farquhar. But I sent for him to... Yes. You see, I, too, believe in cooperation with the scientists. But by subversion, I'll offer them the hand of friendship with a big, fat bribe in it. You know what the bribe is? The power to destroy me. That's what I'm offering. Join us. Learn our secrets. Bore from within. Bide your time before you strike. But while he's biding, I'll have him. And when he's ready to strike, you'll find it's not quite the time. Wait a little bit. Enjoy the power. Play with fat old Jan Tregerin like a cat. And by then, I'll have him. You can't replace me, Jan. Oh, you were a good man, George. When we needed catchy slogans, ray guns, plastic helmets, and fancy sweaters. I warned you, Jan. Don't underestimate the mind. The human brain, even Caddy here, is a fascinating instrument. For example, I had a little talk with Caddy last week. Very boring. Ah, but useful. But when we were finished, her mind had something it didn't have before. You always were educational, George. Caddy, look at me. Hmm? Look at me. Look at me. Now, put your hand on his arm. Mm -hmm. Now. Now, take his gun. Caddy, are you crazy? I've got his gun. What now? You see, Jan, there is a place for the dreamer, the man who believes, who can use his mind. I'm going to get rid of you, Jan, because the man who dares to dream will rule. Caddy, look at me. Look at me. Point the gun at him. Look at me. <laughs> I can't anymore. It's too ridiculous. <laughs> Jan, take your silly gun back. It's too heavy. What? Caddy. <laughs> Caddy, I command you, look at me. Look at me. <laughs> the power of the mind. Hey, boys, come in and get him. I, I don't understand. I, Caddy, Caddy, look at me. Oh, all right, I'll look at you. <laughs> Poor Superman. <laughs> You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features 
You Go by E.C. Tubb, which proves that for pure, chilling horror, nothing can beat cold, hard facts. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you Appointment in Tomorrow, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by Fritz Leiber and adapted for radio by Ernest Kinoy. Featured in the cast were Ted Osborne, Dean Almquist, Pat Hosley, Bob Hastings, Arthur Hughes, and Charles Penman. Your narrator was Floyd Mack. This is Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. In just a moment, X-1. But first, after a hard day's work, there's nothing more welcome than an evening of variety entertainment. That's just the tonic provided tomorrow night by NBC Radio. You'll laugh your cares away when good-natured contestants carry out the rib-tickling stunts dreamed up by MC Jack Bailey on NBC's Truth or Consequences. Later on, Groucho Marx peps things up with lots of spontaneous good fun and more of the friendly insults at which he is so accomplished. For a brighter, livelier evening tomorrow night, it's Groucho Marx and Truth or Consequences on this station. Now stay tuned for X-1 on NBC. Countdown for blast off. X-5, 4, 3, 2, X-1, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X minus one. Tonight, Bad Medicine by Finn O'Donovan. But first, farmers know they can't stop storms, floods, or droughts from ruining a crop. But they can make sure things like that can't ruin them by investing in United States savings bonds. Not only farmers, but over 40 million Americans in all sorts of jobs own 40 billions of savings bonds. And why? Why? Because savings bonds are the easy way to start saving and to keep saving. And the money you invest in savings bonds mean protection now and ready cash when you need it in the future. Improving the farm, sending the youngsters to college, or planning your own retirement. These are the big things you can be ready for with savings bonds. And besides offering you a safe investment, each Series E savings bond pays you back $4 at maturity for every three you invest. Yes, you earn extra dollars while you save, so start saving now. For the big things in your life, be ready with United States savings bonds. And now, on with our story. On May 2nd, 2103... Elwood Caswell walked rapidly down Broadway. It was a gentle, misty spring day, and the air held the smell of rain and blossoming trees. But Elwood Caswell didn't smell the rain and the trees. He just gripped the loaded gun he had in his pocket. He didn't want to use the weapon, but he was certain that he would. This was justifiable. You see, Elwood Caswell was a homicidal maniac. Why shouldn't I kill him? Hey, look out, will you? Oh, sorry, sir. Only the other day he said to me, Elwood, you're looking very well. What business is it of his how I look? Hey there, Elwood! Elwood! Huh? 
It's me, Marty Klein. I work on the jet buses with you, remember? Oh, yeah, of course. Hello, Marty. Uh, forgive me, my mind was, uh, was on other things. Yeah, I know how it is. A couple of weeks ago, I was walking around a fog so thick you could cut it. Yeah, really? Sure. Preoccupied, you know. I had this idea in my mind. You too? Yeah. The same person? Huh? Were you troubled by the same person? My wife. Hey, you okay? Oh, oh, oh yeah. Yes, yes, of course. Well, I had this idea, see? I was going to get rid of my wife. Kill her? Kill her? I mean, send her to a country for a week. Oh. You sure you ain't sick? No, I never felt better. Well, well anyway, I was going to take a week off. Quit the jet buses. Hey, can you imagine? I've been a jet bus operator for ten years now, and all of a sudden, I feel like I, I can't take it for another minute. I know how you feel. And I was going to take a trip all by myself. A trip? To where? To the farthest place I could think, to Mars. I was just going to pick up and take a vacation to Mars. Silly, huh? I don't know. What happened? Well, I talked it over with Ethel. Your wife? Yeah. Ethel, she's a real sensible girl. You know what she did? No, am I supposed to? Well, Ethel went right down to that uh, home therapy appliance store, and she says, you got a home therapy machine that'll cure my husband of uh, this idea he can't stay on the jet buses? Yeah, I've heard that those machines aren't perfected. They got him licked now. So, okay, she describes the trouble, and next day they deliver this thing, and, and boom, I plug it in, see, and... And? And a voice talks to me. He starts asking me questions. Yeah, what kind of questions? All kinds. Things I, I wouldn't even tell my own mother. You told the machine? Why not? It's only a machine. Yeah, I see your point. Well, then the machine starts to tell me a few things. And before I knew it, inside a week, I'm cured. Now, I, I can't wait to go back driving the jet buses. You don't say. So that's why I say I, I know how it is to have one thing on your mind all the time like that. This machine, what did it cost you? That's the beauty part of it. <laughs> My Ethel, boy, she's a smart girl. After a week, she sends it back, see? She says it don't work. So all we lose is the deposit. Yeah, I see. Well, I got to go back to work now. Hey, ain't you working the jet buses today? Huh? No, I'm off today. Well, I'll see you, Elwood. Yeah, see you, Marty. Uh, what was the name of that place? Where they sell the home therapy machine. Yeah. Uh, home therapy appliances. It's right down Broadway, about two blocks from here. So long, Elwood. Perspiring freely, Elwood Caswell continued down Broadway toward 43rd Street. His friend Magnuson would be finishing work soon, returning to his apartment less than a block from Caswell's. Elwood gripped the gun tighter. How pleasant it would be to saunter in, exchange a word with him, and then... No. No, I won't do it. I don't really want to kill anybody. It isn't right. Think what'll happen. The authorities will lock me up. My friends won't understand, and... Mother. Mother would never approve. Still, if I see Magnuson, if I see his hateful, accusing face in front of me... Oh, this must be the store. Yeah. Home therapy appliances. Good afternoon, sir. Can I show you some of our home therapy appliances? I, I want therapy. Quick. Of course, sir. This way, please. Now then, this is our new alcoholic reliever built by International Combustion Motors and advertised in leading magazines. A handsome piece of furniture. I think you will agree and not out of place in any home. It also opens into a television set. Uh, look, what I need... A therapy, of course. I just want to point out this model need never cause embarrassment to you, your friends, or your loved ones. Notice, if you will, the recessed dial which controls the desired degree of alcoholism. You see, heavy, moderate, social... Light and <laughs> teetotal. A new feature unique in mechanotherapy. I'm not alcoholic. The New York Jet Bus Authority does not hire alcoholics. Oh, sorry. You seem the type. No offense. I... Please. You seem rather nervous. Perhaps the portable anxiety reducer. No. Well, sir, perhaps if you told me just what you feel is bothering you. What have you got for homicidal mania? I beg your pardon? Homicide. The urge to kill someone. Oh, oh, of course. Well, let's see now. Oh, pardon uh, me. Uh, have you worked here very long? A week. Oh, yes. Here's the ticket. This black job with the chrome trim. What is it? This, sir, uh, is a Rex Regenerator, built by Planetary Motors Corporation. Handsome, hmm? Goes with any decor, opens into a well-stocked little bar, so your family, friends, loved ones need never... Well, if your homicidal urge, a strong one, 
Oh, absolutely. Don't confuse this with the little 10-amp neurosis model. This is a hefty, heavy-duty 25-amp machine for really deep-rooted conditions. That's what I've got. Well, this baby will jolt you out of it. Big, heavy-duty thrust bearings, oversized heat absorbers, completely insulated. Sensitivity range I'll over... I'll take it. Yes, sir. With me, right now. Now? Before it's too late. I'll pay cash. Well, yes, sir. It'll be a few hours before the warehouse can... I'll take this one here. Well, that's a floor demonstration. Does it work? All of our demonstrators work. Then I'll take it. I can't wait for a warehouse. I can't wait for anything. Have it put in a taxi for me. Yes, sir. Tell him to hurry. I I want to kill my friend Magnuson, you know. Who? My friend Magnuson. Oh, of course. That'll be four hundred dollars and fifty-nine cents, sales tax included. <laughs> After Elwood Caswell left the store, the clerk, whose name was Haskins, smiled to himself and lighted a cigarette. He had made his first sale. He inhaled. Haskins? Yes, Mr. Follinsby? Smoking, smoking. I asked you to rid yourself of that filthy habit. Immediately, Mr. Follinsby. I, uh, I'll use one of those display model denicotinizers at once. By the way, I, I just made a rather good sale, sir. Oh, really? Yes, sir. One of our big Rex regenerators. Well, now, it isn't often we... Wait a minute. Where's the floor model? Well, sir, the customer was in an awful hurry. He was going to kill his friend. You and... gave him the floor model? Uh, well, yes, sir. Was there any reason why... Oh, I... grief, Haskins. Didn't I inform you we never sell a floor model? Uh, but, sir... Good heavens, I've got to get to him. What was his address? Address? His name, then. Well, he didn't say. Then his check. But he paid cash. You mean you just let him pick up the machine and walk out? Well, sir, he paid cash. He was homicidal, you say? Yes, sir, his friend. I don't care about his friend. Get the police. No, 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 no. I call the Planetary Motor Security Division. Quick. Yes, at once. Well, well. Excuse me, Mr. Follinsby. What will I tell them? Just tell them, you fool. Uh, tell them that one of our customers has accidentally got that display regenerator they sent us. The one they shipped by accident. They were going to replace it tomorrow. Yes, sir. The one they shipped by accident. Will they know? If they don't be more explicit, tell them we've sold the Martian model. The one for treating psychotic Martians. <laughs> Meanwhile, Elwood Caswell had returned to his apartment and lugged the big black Rex regenerator into his living room. He put it down near the couch and studied it carefully. He was right. It does go with the room. Now then, let's see those instructions. Place the generator near a comfortable couch. All right. Plug in machine. There. A fixed contact band to your forehead. That's all there is to it. Just turn on the machine and it will do the rest. There will be no language problem since your regenerator communicates with you by direct sensory contact, patent pending. Well, that seems easy enough. Now, I'll just put the contact on my head. And... Blast it. Hello? Elwood? Yes? This is Henry. Henry Magnuson, how are you, old boy? I'm fine. I wondered if you were doing anything tonight. Thought you might like to drop over for a game of chess. Game of chess, huh? You stupid oaf. What? Nothing. I thought you called me a stupid oaf. I'm yeah, just talking <laughs> to my cat. <laughs> oh, I didn't remember you had a cat. I thought you hated cats. Oh, I do. Uh, this isn't really mine. It's a neighbor's. Uh, it keeps coming in. Oh, well, what about tonight? Will you be alone? Well, yeah. You haven't mentioned anyone that you're inviting me over? Not a soul. Why? Uh, someone's looking for me, uh, a process server. Oh. Yeah, I've been avoiding him for days. I don't even leave word where I'll be when I go out. You can trust me, Elwood. I'm your best friend. Yes, you are. But not for long. Huh? Uh, just talking to the cat again. Oh. Well, will you be over? Yeah. In about an hour, okay? Yeah, an hour will be fine. There are a few things I have to do first. I've just first. gotten some new laugh records from the boys at the office. I got something here that'll really kill you. So long, Elwood. So long. I got something here that'll kill you, too. X minus one will continue in one minute. Each of us has a personal reason for wanting to see cancer conquered. Steve Allen would like to tell you his. I have a wife and three wonderful kids. And when I 
Police think about cancer going to strike one American in every four. Well, that's more than enough reason for wanting to see it conquered. I know that some people don't even want to think about cancer, but pretending it's not a threat, doing an ostrich routine, isn't going to get us anywhere. We've got to stand up to it and fight. We can fight, each and every one of us. Through the American Cancer Society, we can be part of the battle that someday will beat cancer once and for all. That day will come, but you and I have got to help. How about it? Thank you, Steve Allen. Remember, fight cancer with a checkup and a check. See your doctor once a year for a checkup. It's your best cancer insurance. And to help conquer cancer, send a check to your unit of the American Cancer Society. Make it generous. And now, on with our story. Taking the revolver from his pocket, Elwood laid it on the table in front of him. His face became suffused with hatred at the thought of Magnuson. He poked at the gun with a stiff forefinger. Magnuson, you no good, shifty eyed enemy of all that's decent in the world. The man who ruined my sister Irene. The man who. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Elwood. You have no sister, remember? No sister. Now, before you go off and commit murder, why not just try that machine just once, huh? Turn it on. Okay, now reach over and... Good afternoon, Elwood. I am your mechanical therapist. You may call me Gloop. Gloop? You seem surprised. It is a perfectly common name here on this planet. Gloop, of course. I've heard it many times. Now then, I am scanning the material in your pre-conscious with the intent of synthesis, diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment. Yes. I find... Hmm. This is a most unusual case. Really? I thought it was simple homicidal mania. There is, of course, no such thing. You are obviously hallucinating a set of symptoms. Nonsense syllables to enable you to avoid the real problem. Oh? Hmm. A most unusual set of symptoms, I must say. Your pilot light seems to be fading. My light is not fading. I am merely trying to relate your symptoms to proven theory. Well, as long as you know what you're doing. Mechanotherapy is an exact science, Elwood. It admits of no significant errors. We will proceed. Good. First, the word association tests. Fire away. I will proceed to give a word. You answer with the first thing that comes to your mind. Ready? Ready. House. Home. Planet. Earth. Hmm. Hmm? Now, uh, just musing. Now, fleeful. Fleeful? Fleeful. That sounds like a Martian word. Just give me a response. Fleeful, hmm? Okay. I can make them up, too. Marfouche. That's a pretty good one, huh? Made it up in the spur of the moment. Marfouche is very significant. It is a corruption of the Martian concept of push clip. Very significant. I don't know any Martian words. Aha, uh -huh. noteworthy. We will proceed. Loud. Soft. Green. Mother. Panagoyas. Pathamathonga. <laughs> How's that one? Arities. Nexothesmodrustica. Top that. Katif a snow hell gnoptices. Okay. Rigamaroo, Kalamazoo, Iggity Bibbidi Boo. Good. It fits the pattern. Pattern? Your neurosis. I can diagnose it now. Go on. You have a classic case of theme desire, complicated by strong dwarfish intention. I could have sworn I was homicidal. The term has no reference. It must be rejected as nonsense. Now. If you'll just settle back on the couch, we'll proceed. At precisely this moment, a tall, gnarled, ugly man pushed his way through the doors of home therapy appliances. His clothing, unpressed and uncaring, hung on him like corrugated iron. When the clerk, Hoskins, approached him, he flipped back his lapel to show a small silver badge underneath. Sir? John Rath, Planetary Motor Security Division. Oh, yes, sir. Mr. Follinsby, Mr. Follinsby. Yes, sir. Hello, Follinsby. Mr. Rath. Uh, well? So far, we haven't a single lead. You certainly never mentioned his name? Oh, yes, sir. Now, think. Is there anything significant? Is it serious, Mr. Rath? Mr. Follinsby, this man is homicidal. Won't it treat him? Homicide is unknown on Mars. It'll treat him for the most likely Martian sickness. What would that be? Theme desire, Mr. Follinsby. Theme desire? The Martian illness in which the victim feels cursed by the tree-like nourishing parent, although, of course, Martians don't have parents in the ordinary sense. Well, Haskins? I, I remember one thing. He mentioned he was a jet bus operator for the New York Jet Bus Authority. Ah. Uh, one other thing. Yes? 
I believe, uh, yes, he was alcoholic. An alcoholic jet bus operator. Excellent. It'll be on his records. Get the jet bus authority at once. But surely, Elwood, you remember your Gorisi. No. Tell me then about your juvenile experiences with the Forestrian fleet. Never had one. Mm, complete blockage. My father... There is no you... such thing, of course. But... I thought we finally agreed on that. Okay, if you say so. Now then, since you claim you don't even know what a Gorisi is, tell me what you imagine it to be. Um, a forest fire. Uh, a salt tablet. A small screwdriver. Am I getting warm? A revolver? Uh-uh. What the heck is a Gorisi? Why, the tree that nourished you into puberty. No tree nourished me. You have completely repressed the experience. No tree ever nourished me. Mr. Caswell, let me try to explain your case as best I can. Somewhere in your childhood, your Gorisi, or parent tree, stifled your theme desire. Now, this gave rise to your present urge to dwarf someone in a blendish manner. To what? To dwarf someone in a blendish manner. Listen, you crummy piece of hardware. I have never had a Gorisi. I have no desire to dwarf someone in a blendish manner or any other manner. All I want to do is put a bullet into Herbert Magnuson. Understand? All I want to do is kill Magnuson. Lie down, Mr. Caswell. We'll go over it again. My dear man, I'm not trying to insinuate that the Jet Bus Authority hires alcoholics. If you will just... Uh, Any luck? It's a dead end. Now, Haskins. Yes, sir. A man's life may be at stake here. Now, think. Was there anything else this fellow said to you? Anything. Well, he did mention the name of his friend. Of which friend? The one he was going to kill. The one he... Why didn't you say so? Now, what was it? Um, uh, uh, Magnuson. You sure? That's it. He said, I'm going to kill Magnuson. You know, just casually like that. Follinsby, see if there's a Magnuson in the Manhattan phone book. Now, hurry it up. Caswell, you were saying? Well... Something about your Gorisi? Yes, I was saying I... I think perhaps you're right. Naturally. But right about what, Mr. Caswell? Well, I think perhaps... Yes, I think perhaps I do remember my Gorisi. Ah! Now, Mr. Caswell, we're on the road to a cure. <laughs> Mr. Magnuson? Yes? Do you know a short, angry-looking, red-haired man? I might. Oh, thank heaven. Or I might not. Can you tell us where to locate him? You're a process server, huh? Certainly not. Don't kid me. Mr. Magnuson, this man is trying to kill you. Go on, you're full of happy pills. Elwood's my best friend. Elwood? He loves me like a brother. And if you think I'm going to stick some process server on Mr. Magnuson, I'm not a process server. Your friend Elwood is a psychopathic killer. You're his intended victim. Can you get that through your thick skull? I'm trying to save your life. Yes? You're Elwood Caswell? Yes. The Elwood Caswell who bought a Rex Regenerator early this afternoon? Yes. Won't you come in? Thank you. Now, my name is Rath, Planetary Motors. Nice to meet you. Uh, have you, uh, used the machine? Oh, yes. I see. Now, Mr. Caswell, I, uh, I don't know how to explain this, but, uh, we made a terrible mistake. The Regenerator you took was a Martian model for giving therapy to Martians. I know. You do? Yes, it became pretty obvious after a while. Well, it, was a, it was a dangerous situation, especially for a man in your condition. Yes, the poor thing tried its best, but of course it couldn't cure what wasn't there. Well, then the, uh, the company will, of course, reimburse you for your lost time and your 
hospital, you know, mental anguish. Naturally. And we will uh, substitute a regular uh, human-type regenerator. Oh, that won't be necessary. You see... Uh, Mr. Caswell, will you put down that gun? I warn you. I'm not going to shoot you. I merely want to turn this gun over to you. You do? Yes, I'm not going to shoot anybody. You mean that... The machine's attempt at therapy forced me to reappraise my whole self. There was an insight during which I was able to get rid of my obsession. You no longer want to kill your friend Magnuson? Kill Magnuson? Why, I haven't the faintest urge. Well, I... I, I must say, then, it, uh, it worked out for the best. I, uh... I'll get back to the store and have him pick up this machine in an hour, and... Oh, well, sir... Oh, uh, don't forget to take this gun. I... I won't need it. Well, of course. Uh, well, nice to have met you, sir. Uh, Good evening. Good evening. Did you hear that? He asked me if I still intended to kill Magnuson. Magnuson, that inhuman monster who cut down my Gorisi. Magnuson, the man who even now is secretly planning to infect New York with abhorrent fiend desire. Am I going to kill him? Oh, no. I wish him a long life, a life filled with the torture I can now inflict on him. Kill Magnuson? Oh, no. I'm going to start right now to dwarf him in a vlendish manner. <laughs> You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features Honorable Opponent by Clifford D. Simak, the story of an Earth general with the distasteful assignment of meeting a delegation of unmilitary clowns who arrive as conquerors. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. In a moment, tonight's cast and a preview of next week's exciting drama. They took the blue from the sky, then the pretty girl's eyes, and the touch of old glory pure. And gave it to the men who proudly wear the U.S. Air Force blue. The U.S. Air Force blue. Oh, we are men with the dream of America's team. We're a rugged and ready crew. And you can bet your boots the world looks up to you. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you Bad Medicine, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by Finn O'Donovan and adapted for radio by George Lefferts. Featured in the cast were Cliff Carpenter, Bill Britton, Alan Manson, Charles Webster, Carl Weber, and Joseph Julian. Norman Rose was heard as the machine. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Bob Mauer and is an NBC Radio Network production. Weekday, the companion and advisor to America's women, offers a new informative series on childbirth. It's the actual case history of a young wife following her through the late stages of pregnancy, childbirth, and postnatal care. You'll attend the childbirth courses offered at New York's Mount Sinai Hospital and even enter the delivery room for the actual birth of the child. Listen tomorrow for the real-life series, The Story of Birth. Then, on the same program, listeners can also enjoy more women specialties, Kitchen Hints by Charlotte Adams, Child Care News with Dr. Francis Horwich, Vacation Ideas offered by Walter Kiernan, and another personal visit with your radio friend, Mary Margaret McBride. Don't forget the exciting dramatization each day from Taylor Caldwell's book, Tender Victory. Be sure to join Virginia Graham and Mike Wallace tomorrow on this NBC station. 
Follow the news with Chet Huntley tonight on NBC Radio. In just a moment, X minus one. But first, there's a certain water commissioner whose interest in the ladies sometimes overshadows his interest in civic affairs. His name is a familiar one, Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. And he'll pursue his adventures tomorrow night when NBC Radio presents another comic episode of The Great Gildersleeve. So when you hear the familiar voice and hearty laugh of the water commissioner from Summerfield tomorrow, why, stay tuned and enjoy another romantic scramble with the one and only The Great Gildersleeve on this NBC station. And now stay tuned for X-1 on NBC. Countdown for blast off. X-5, 4... Three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X minus one. Tonight's story, The Sea Shoot, by Isaac Asimov. We were on our way home to Earth when it happened. Six of us coming home as passengers aboard the merchant spaceship Starfire. At the start of the Second Interstellar War, the one between Earth and the planet Chloro. And then it happened. Now hear this. Condition red. Condition red. We are under attack from a Chloran battle cruiser. All hands forward to battle stations. Passengers will remain confined to the after cabin. Condition red. We are being attacked. The interception by the Chloran cruiser, the murderous running jewel of energy blasts and force field defenses. <laughs> We huddled in the passengers' after cabin, terrified, not knowing how the battle was going. We could hear the desperate bursts of steam through the steering tubes as the Starfire maneuvered to dodge the enemy attacks. And then... Now what? Uh, the beginning of the end, you might call it. Well, what does it mean, Stuart? You were a space pilot? It means our generators have been drained of energy. We can't fight back. But, Monsieur... All right, don't worry. They won't destroy us. They need our ship too badly. They'll simply board us and take over. But what about the crew? The crew, Colonel? If they have any sense, they'll surrender. If they choose to fight, they'll... Now, they're coming aboard. Now, be very still. Oh, Mother in heaven, help Won't us. You be still. If only those fools on deck will surrender without a struggle. They are fighting. Yes, it's the end. We gotta help them. All right, don't open that door. We just can't let them die. You can't help them. I'm going. I don't see Stop them. him. All right. Anesthesi. Shut the door quickly. Anesthesi. My brother. That poor fool. I'll get them. My brother, I swear to you, I'll get them. Yeah, you better cover his body. The brutes. The monstrous, green-skinned brutes. They're no more brutes than we are, Colonel. This is a war. Are you defending them? I'm merely pointing out the facts. I ought to strangle you. Why not save it for the chloros? I will. I promise you I will. Well, they're probably deciding right now what to do with us. We might as well settle down and wait. We sat there, the five of us and listened while the Chloran invaders killed off the members of the Starfire's crew. Among us was Colonel Anthony Wyndham, an old Colonel Blimp type with a lame leg. 
Wyndham had spent his life in the militia back on Earth, but had never seen a battle. There was Demetrius Polyarchitis, who had just watched his brother being killed by a chlorocarbonizer. Polly was a huge man. He and his brother had tried truck farming on Arcturus and given it up after two seasons. Then there was LeBlanc, a sensitive, frightened young man of 22, and Randolph Mullen, who looked like somebody's caricature of a bookkeeper. A mild, balding, milk-toast little man. And there was myself, John Stewart. I was the only one who'd ever had contact with the chloro people. I had a pair of artoplasm hands to prove it. It is quiet now. Yeah, they finished with the crew. Mr. Stewart? Yes, Mr. Mullen? What do you think will happen next? Well, they'll put a prize crew of two aboard and take us to one of their home planets as prisoners of war. Only two of the chloros will stay aboard. Well, two is all they'll need. <laughs> Why, Colonel? You're thinking of leading a gallant raid to retake the ship? Well, simply a point of information, dash it. All right, then let me give you another point of information. If you want to commit suicide quick, just open that bulkhead door. Three steps inside, you'd fall on your face. But why? Don't you smell anything, LeBlanc? Get close to the door. <laughs> it smells like gas. Yeah, it is gas. Chlorine gas. They breathe it like we breathe oxygen. They've chlorinated the whole cruise compartment. One big whiff of that and we'd all be dead. So just forget about rushing the chloros. How do you know so much about their habits, Stuart? I lived on a chloro planet for six months. You see these hands? They were mangled in the oxygenating machinery of my own quarters. They grew these artoplasm things and operated. They're weak, but at least I have hands again. Monsieur Stewart. Yeah. Will they will they kill us? No. Why do you say that? Because in their own way they're gentlemen. Probably we'll be interned for the duration. You call them gentlemen. After they kill my brother in cold blood, you call them gentlemen. You know, Stuart, you sound more and more like a blasted greeny sympathizer. Blasted, man. Where's your patriotism and loyalty? My loyalty is where it belongs, with honesty and decency, regardless of the shape of the being it appears in. This is a ridiculous war. Why are we fighting these people? We can live only on planets with oxygen, and oxygen is poison to them. They can live only in chlorine atmosphere, which is deadly to us. Yet we're fighting them over a bunch of worthless asteroids that neither of us can live on comfortably. Well, it's, it's a matter of principle. It's a matter of stupid pride and greed. I don't like what you say, mister. Why not? Because you talk too nice about these greeny scum. They're good to you, eh? Well, they weren't good to my brother. They killed him. And I think maybe I'll kill you, you rotten greeny right, Holy scum. Holy... Hey, Mullen, hey, Mullen, hey, grab him. I, I can't break his hold. <laughs> They are coming in. Holy, let him go. They saved your life this time. But when I'm finished with them... What? what? I think they're opening the lock. So don't get between us. Holy, don't lose your head. They'll kill us all. was not a pleasant sight to anyone unused to him. He was about the height of an Earthman, but the top of him was just a green stalk with eyes. He was still wearing a space suit to protect him from the oxygen in our compartment. In one of his tendrils, he carried a chloran gun. As he stood in the doorway, I could see Polyarchitis' eyes begin to glisten with rage. Then, with a bellow like a huge bull, he threw himself at the chloro. <laughs> As prisoners of war. We expect to reach our own planet within several weeks, your time. There you will be interned for the duration of the war. If any of you attempts to leave this compartment, we shall be forced to destroy you. That is all I have to communicate. Hadn't we better do something for Mr. Polly Arcades? Oh, he'll be all right. Just hoist him up in the cot. Yes. That's the idea. All right, Polly. Can you hear me, you stupid brute? His voice is coming back. Yeah. 
Now, I know what's going on in that thick skull of yours, Paulie. You think that when the paralysis wears off, you'll ease your feelings by slamming me around some more. Well, if you do, it'll be curtains for all of us. How do you mean, sir? None of you know the chloros the way I do. Unlike us, they assume automatically that any group of Earthmen they find together comprises a biological grouping, like an ant colony. The result is that they consider the group as something, well, something holy. Now, they'd never break us up. And if one of us did any harm to another, they'd have us all executed as a bunch of chlorotype perverts, a non-functioning group. So call all the names you want. But keep your hands to yourself, or we're finished. My little speech had a sobering effect on the group. For the next 24 hours, we did little besides eat our rations and think. I tried to evaluate them. The colonel I had figured for an old windbag. Polyarchitis was a hate-filled brute. LeBlanc would crack first. He was like a frightened child. Mullen? Mullen was a non-entity, a mouse instead of a man. Everything he did seemed prissyish. His voice had the quality of furtively rustling underbrush. How long did you say the trip would take, Mr. Stewart? Well, the chloro said about two weeks. Uh, gentlemen, uh, if I may interrupt. Colonel? Now, it has occurred to me that perhaps you know of some some weakness that might enable us to overcome these chloros. The only weakness they've got is that they can't stand oxygen. Oh, but there must be some way to get the best of the man. After all, there are only look, two. Before I answer, Colonel, I have to know your motive. Is it to save your own skin or help Earth win the war? Oh, dash it, man, to help our side, of course. What we're looking for is the way to save the ship for Earth without losing our lives, yes? Well, all right, let's take a vote, then. LeBlanc? I... I have a wife waiting on Earth, Mr. Stewart. I, I do not want to die. Uh-huh. Hero number one. What about you, Mullen? Well, I don't see how we could accomplish it without... Uh-huh. Hero number two. Well, Paul Yarkitis. When I kill Chloros, it will be with my bare hands. On their planet, I will kill dozens, I promise you. Uh-huh. Three down. Well, Colonel... Don't you want to march to glory, an old militia man like you? Your attitude is very cynical and unbecoming, Stuart. I see. Well, then I'll have to blow the ship up myself. Stuart! Don't worry, Colonel. I don't intend to be a dead hero. Of course, there is a way we might do it. What did you say, Mr. Mullen? There's a spacesuit and magnetic boots stored in that locker over there. We might be able to reach the control room from the outside of the ship. Well, the outside, but... How would we get outside? Well, this compartment has a sea chute. It, it must. Uh, what is a, a, a sea chute? A sea chute, my boy, is a casualty chute. It doesn't get talked about much, but all the main compartments have them. They're just little airlocks down which you slide a corpse. Burial in space. Oh, blast it, Mullen. Uh, suppose you did get outside. How could you re-enter the ship? Uh, through the steam tubes, the ones they use to guide the ship. Wait a minute, Mullen. What do you know about steam tubes? I thought you were a bookkeeper. Well, on Arcturus, I got interested in spaceship models. I, I studied all about them. On my own time, of course. Yeah, yeah, naturally. At, at any rate, I learned that the steam tubes have an access vent directly to the control room for repairs and, and so forth. And the chloros, they are in the control room. Uh, what do you think, Stuart? Well, it's a video sort of idea, but it might just work. We could get permission from the chloros to open the sea chute and bury Polly's brother. And one of us could slip into it, work forward, and climb up through the steam tube. The question being, which one? What about you? You with your loud talk and your sneers. I'm no hero, Paulie. I've already said that. My object is to stay alive. If the steam tube let go while you were in it, you'd be broiled like a lobster. Now, how about the colonel here? If I were younger, blasted, I'd trounce you. You know very well with my injured leg. Yeah, of course. Not to mention my artificial hands. Well, now, what unfortunate deformities do the rest of us have? Polly? You just keep talking, Mr. Big Mouth, and pretty soon we'll kick your teeth in. Of course, that's your standard reply to everything, isn't it? LeBlanc, will you do it? I... I cannot. Not even to get back to Denise? Please, I, I LeBlanc cannot... LeBlanc needn't go. I'll do it. What? After all, it is my idea. Wait a minute. Are you serious, Mullen? Yes. 
Well, how? I don't understand. Why? Why you? Well, it it seems no one else will do it. But that's no reason, man. I can't think of any other. Uh, look here. You really intend to go through with it, sir? Yes, I suppose I do. Well, dash it, man. Let me shake your hand. You, you're, you're an earthman by heaven. You do this thing and win or die. I'll bear witness for you. It was quite a moment. Mullen the mouse had suddenly turned into a man. He just stood there awkwardly while the colonel pupped his hand. Polyakita seemed stunned. LeBlanc was wide-eyed. And I? Well, I was in a peculiar position, one in which I rarely found myself. I had absolutely nothing to say. That ought to bring them. I hear one. What is it, Earthman? One member of our unit is dead, as you know. We request permission to jettison his body out of the casualty chute. You may do so. You'll have to open the chute lock from the control room. I will do so. Is there anything else? No. Nothing else. Thank you. Oh, boy. All right, come on now. We'll have to work fast. Mullen, get into a space suit from the emergency locker. Polly, help Mom with those magnetic boots. Honey. I'm working as fast as I can. The arm. All right, give me the helmet. The helmet. Okay. Now, Mullen, you better scratch your nose if you have to. It's your last chance for a while. What about radio contact? You can talk to us. We'll listen in on the helmet set in one of the other suits. The chloros won't have their set on the interphone frequency. Wait a moment. What for? Dash it, what's he going to use for a weapon? He isn't big enough to fight them barehanded. Oh, no, that's true. Well, how about one of those oxygen cylinders? Good idea. Use it to bash them over the head. Now give them one of the cylinders equipped with a reducing valve. Now look, Mullen, if your magnetic boots fail and you start drifting away into space, open this valve. Mm-hmm. See that? Now you can use it like a miniature jet and try to blow yourself back to the ship. Understand? Uh, I think so. Well, I only hope it works. All right, here goes the helmet. You'd better hurry. The light is on over the sea chute. Yeah. All right. That means they've opened the lock. Here. Can you hear me? Oh, oh, oh. LeBlanc, give me that other space helmet. Yes. Here. Let me switch on the radio. Can you hear me, Mullen? I hear you. Fine. Plenty of air? Air's okay. Uh huh. Polly, open the sea chute. Okay, now help him in. All right, ready? Ready. Well, good luck. Close the chute. Pull the ejector valve. Now. He's out. Oh, God help him. The light is out. Yeah. The chloros have closed the chute lock. I... I don't suppose he has much of a chance. No. Do you think... Uh, do you think he knew it? I don't know. I just don't know. Should I, I, I try to contact him on the radio? Yes, I think... Wait a minute. What is it? Listen, the chloro's coming. Good Lord. He's sure to miss Mullen. Yeah, wait. Polly, get your brother's body on the cot. Put a blanket over it. Pretend it's Mullen asleep. Polly, for heaven's sake. My brother. But you've got to do it, man. It's our only chance. Listen, if Mullen could go out there and Very well. His... I will do it. Earthman. Yes. You have jettisoned the body. Yes. Good. Is there something further we can do? No, I... We are very tired. Our grief is very great at losing one of our unit. We would like to rest alone. I will respect your wishes. I see that one of your unit sleeps already. Yes, yes, Mr. Mullen was overcome with grief. I leave you. Polly, I thought sure you were going to rush him. With that brave little guy out there, what do you think I am anyway? And to think I laughed at him makes me ashamed. Yeah, I guess... I guess I've been saying some things that maybe weren't too funny. 
I owe all of you an apology. <clears throat> you think it's safe to try the radio? Yeah, we better. Hello? Hello, Mullen. Can you hear me? Yes, I, I hear you. Where are you? I'm standing on the outside of the ship. All right, now take care. One misstep and you'll be marooned in space. Now, can you find the steam tubes? I think I've found one of them already. I can feel the rim. I just hope it doesn't let go when I get inside. Be careful. I'm going into the tube now. I can feel the ladder rungs they use to repair the inside. Yeah, well, keep in contact. I'm in the tube now. Good Lord. They've let go with a blast. Yeah, well, it may be the starboard tubes. Mullen, Mullen. Still here. Oh. They use the other tubes, fortunately. Now, if they don't try to correct for over-deflection... Yeah, keep moving. I seem to be... Wait. Yes, yeah, I'm at the end of the tube now, where it opens into the control room. Good, good. Now, look, there's a small metal door there. Can you feel it? Yes, I... I'm afraid it's locked from the other side. Oh. I can't budge it. Mullen... Well, then listen to me. Stuart, I, I'm scared. I, I'm terribly scared. Yeah, all right, all right. Now, hang on. Don't blow up. Listen to me. Are you listening? Yeah, yes. Take the spare oxygen tank. Bang on the metal door that leads to the control room. The chloros are bound to hear you. When one of them comes to investigate, try to hit him with a cylinder. Now, aim for the stalk on top of his body. Try to blind him. Will you do that? I, I'll try. Well, now, go on. Only one can come. The other will stay at the controls. Now start banging. Any luck? No, I... Wait, I... I hear something. Something's opening the lock. The door now. I hear... Ah! Mullen! Mullen, what happened? Mullen, can you hear me? Mullen! <laughs> Mullen. Mullen. Oh, it's no use. They must have gotten him. Yeah, he was one brave little guy, that one. But suppose they have just got him in the control room. I mean, maybe he is not dead. Well, well, then maybe one of us could rush them. We could bang on the door and jump the claw. Well, the first guy would be a cinch to die. Well, I, I would be willing to take the chance. You? Why not? I could try. Not you. I'm the strongest. I do it. Now listen. Listen, you chaps. I'm an old man. I've got nothing to live for anyway. Suppose I throw myself at the ray gun. Wait a minute. What's going on here? Twenty minutes ago, there wasn't one of you who'd risk his little finger to get us out of here. Now you're falling all over each other. Maybe Mr. Mullen teaches us a lesson, huh? Yeah. Okay, Polly, give me the wrench. I'll start banging on the door. They say that selflessness is contagious. I guess maybe it is. I'd been a cynic all my life, a man who believed in nothing. Well, I'd come face to face with four human beings who proved that I'd been living a lie. I knew what I was going to do now. When the chloro came to investigate our compartment, I had it all planned. If only my poor, weak hands would hold out long enough. Ready? Yeah, ready. ready. Here goes... That should bring him. Try again. Wait, wait, listen. Shh. It's at the door. Get ready. And it's opening the lock. For poor old Mullen now. Uh, steady. No! Let him out! Wait! Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Wait! Good Lord. It's Mullen. It's Mullen. Hey, get, get the helmet off. That's it. All right, now lift. Mullen. Mullen, are you all right? I, I seem to be quite all right. Well, the chloros. Both dead. At least I hope so. Well, what happened? Well, I banged on the steam tube hatch and a chloro opened. Yeah? I hit him with a cylinder. It blinded him, I, I guess, but didn't kill him. He grabbed me and pulled me into the cabin. In the struggle, he broke my transmitter. That, that's why I couldn't talk to you. Finally, I managed to, to club him down. Well, what about the other one? The other one almost got me. 
that must have heard the scuffle and came into the cabin with a ray gun. What I did, I, I guess, was pure reflex. The cabin atmosphere was chlorine, of course, and the greenie didn't have a spacesuit on. Mm -hmm. So I just turned on the oxygen valve in that spare tube. It was like spraying an insect with poison. Well, you're a brave man, Mullen. I'd have been scared to death. I... I... Mullen, what is it? <laughs> An hour later, false hands and all, I was at the controls of the ship, headed for Earth. We'd gotten rid of the chlorinating equipment and restored the oxygen naturally. Mullen was asleep in the cabin under a sedative, or so I thought until the cabin door opened. Mullen, for Pete's sake, get back to bed. No, I'm quite all right now, really. Do you mind if I watch how you operate the ship? No, no, not at all. Sit down. You know, I guess, uh, I owe you an apology. I didn't think too much of you. That's your privilege. <laughs> no, it isn't anybody's privilege, Mullen, to despise another. For years now, I've abandoned hope of finding any decency in human beings. I owe you a vote of thanks. You embarrass me, Mr. Stewart. I, I didn't do it for any heroic reasons, I assure you. Far from it. Well, why did you do it, Mullen? That puzzles me very much. Well, Mr. Stewart, I'm a bookkeeper. Seventeen years ago, I left Earth to work on Arcturus. I never made much impression on anybody on Earth, although I wanted very much to have people like me. Well, about a year ago, I started to write to my family again. Don't ask me why. And then I asked for a leave of absence to go home after 17 years. Well, I still don't understand. It wasn't patriotism or love of a woman or money or any of those things. What was it? Mr. Stewart, haven't you ever been homesick? have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features A Gun for Dinosaur by L. Sprague de Camp, a story of hunters in the bloodiest and most ferocious arena of all prehistoric Earth, where hunting reptile heavyweights is no job for human lightweights. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you The Sea Shoot, a story from the pages of Galaxy, written by Isaac Asimov, and adapted for radio by George Leffert. Featured in the cast were Lyle Sudrow, Stan Early, Bob Hastings, Mercer McLeod, Danny Ocko, and John Gibson. Your announcer, Bill McCord. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. Next week on a distant planet in a forgotten colony of Earth, a man is ordered to commit a murder. Listen to Skulking Permit on X-1 next week. In just a moment, X-1. But first, how does one man get himself into so many impossible situations? This is a question you'll probably ask yourself tomorrow night when you follow another hilarious adventure of Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. Yes, Gildy's eye for the ladies and his impulsive temperament managed to entangle him in a web of riotous circumstances. Join the romantic water commissioner, his neighbors, Judge Hooker, Mr. Peavy, and all the loyal Gildersleeve household as they romp through another episode of The Great Gildersleeve tomorrow night. And now stay tuned for X-1 on NBC. <laughs> Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire.
From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X minus one. Tonight's story, The Cave of Night, by James E. Gunn. Oh, you want a level, Charlie? Okay. Uh, though yet of Hamlet our dear brothers, death the memory be... Well, anyway, how's it, okay? Okay. okay. Uh, check recording, will you? I may go over a half hour. Make sure they've got another reel of tape ready, okay? All right, uh... Look, Bill, I've just put the segments of tape together for the next week's show. I'm going to record my narrations, and we'll listen to it together tomorrow. I know this is unusual, but you're the producer, and I don't want you out on a limb that may be sawed off behind us. This week's show is uh, liable to either win us every award from the Peabody to the Pulitzer Prize, or maybe put the network out of business. Okay, we, uh, we start with a standard opening. Behind the world, etc., you know, 40 seconds. <clears throat> This is Harry Anders, your editor. At 8 o'clock, after the sun has set and the sky is darkening, look up. There's a man up there where no man has ever been. He is lost in the cave of night. And the fuel tank's empty. Receiver broken. Transmitting and clear. Anyone picking this up, anyone. This is Rev McMillan calling. Notify Goddard Rock, New Mexico. No way to get back. There's a man up there where no man has ever been. He is lost in the cave of night. We all know that phrase now, the cave of night. It was written by a poet disguised in the cynical hide of a newspaper rewrite man. But it stuck. It caught the world and held it like a butterfly pinned to a board. It started with a ham, an amateur radio operator, in Davenport, Iowa. Uh, all right, Eddie. Roll the first tape in here. It's marked. Am I too close? <clears throat> I was up in the attic. I usually have a talk with WG73. He's in Buenos Aires. We play chess. Well, uh, there was some kind of interference. And then all of a sudden, I heard this voice. Uh, I record most of my listening anyway, so I had the tape machine running. And after I heard it, I called civil defense. Uh, that's what we're supposed to. If... Uh, look, Bill. I haven't done the final editing on these tapes, so don't worry if they're a little rough. Down out of the night, flung from the darkness, came these words, the first of so many that electrified the world. Notify Goddard Rock, New Mexico. No way to get back. No way to get back. I'm stuck up here. No way to get down. What does it take to catch the pity of the world? A man wedged underground in Kentucky. A little girl in the bottom of a well. Somebody alive, waiting for rescue, with the days of his life numbered. Somebody somewhere waiting for us to get him out. The story broke in this morning's papers. Orbiting 1,000 miles above our heads was a man, an officer of the United States Air Force in a fuelless spaceship. We're recording at the desk of Mike Bayless, senior night editor of the Continental Press National Wire. <clears throat> hey, you always get a reaction like this. I remember the Floyd Collins story in the 20s. Fellow trapped in that cave in Kentucky, remember? Oh, sure. And the whole country hanging on to see if he could get out. Then there was that uh, little girl stuck in the well. Kathy Fisker? Yeah. yeah. We pulled all those stories out and put them on the wire for background. But this hit bigger. We got the first lead from an Air Force handout in New Mexico. They just said an experimental rocket failed to return to base. But by that time, the cat was out of the bag. Ham operators picked up those messages from Boston to Fairbanks, Alaska. Uh, Mr. Bayless, you first used the phrase, the cave of night, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess so. I mean, you know, you got to get a little purple on a thing like this. People eat it up. You can't spread it on too thick. Anyway... 
I was lost in a cave once when I was a kid in upstate New York. I waited around for a couple of hours in the dark until they came for me. It uh, kind of reminded me of that. It reminded the world of terrors at night, of struggling awake through nightmares. The fears of loneliness, darkness, falling, suffocation, thirst. It reminded me of Rev. McMillan. And perhaps I have an advantage over all the other reporters for newspapers and radio and television because I knew Rev. McMillan. I knew him in college and in the Air Force. I knew that he was testing rocket-powered craft at Goddard, but I didn't know they were so close to space. No one knew. Till those messages of desperation crackled down through the atmosphere. I remembered Rev when I saw those headlines that morning. Straight black hair, Clark Gable ears, a reckless grin. He ate well reveled in expert jazz and Mozart opera, and he talked incessantly. His southern speech was no draw. There was too much to say. And now he was alone, and soon all that might be extinguished. The men from the radio newsrooms rushed to Goddard Rocket Base armed with ninja tape recorders. Gentlemen, I'm Colonel Arthur J. Hannigan, information officer for Goddard Rocket Base. Now I'm authorized to issue the following statement. First Lieutenant Reverty L. McMillan, United States Air Force pilot, Experimental Rocket Division, took off from Goddard Base at 2234 Rocky Mountain time. As craft, the XR-37 Mark II, a hydrazine nitric three-stage rocket. I'm sorry I can't describe it, boys, classified. Well, in order to maintain orbit, the motors were pulsed for one second every 15 seconds elapsed time. After three minutes, the exhaust was seen by ground spectroscope observation to flare for half a minute. As fuel supply is exhausted, the craft has reached sustaining orbital speed. Well, what does that mean, Colonel? He's out of gas. He can't get down. The first mobilization was of the scientific brains massed at Goddard. Few of them knew Rev. Brains at a research project are usually carefully sorted out and salted away from the distractions of the outside world. They designed, they invented, they calibrated and theorized. But they didn't know the short, stocky man with a lopsided grin who rode the fruit of their labor up and up and now circled the world of his birth with time ticking out. I covered the hearings in Washington for the network newsroom. I flew down from New York, and the stewardess came out every few minutes to tell the passengers the latest news. She called him Rev, although she never knew him, and once I thought I saw a tear. The hearing was before the subcommittee of the Senate Committee on Military Affairs, presiding Senator Alan J. Hagister of Kentucky. <coughs> All right, General Finch. You've made the technical situation fairly comprehensive, even to an old cane break, redneck hillbilly like myself. <laughs> I have tried to make the gravity of the situation apparent, sir. It appears to me, General, that the sacred life of a human being created in the image of his maker is in danger. It is no light thing to be thrown away like some guinea pig. If that ship wasn't safe, if that poor man up there in the cave of night is to die, Somebody is responsible. Isn't that right, General? Sir, a manned rocket was sent up because of one simple fact. It takes a computer of tremendous versatility and capacity to operate a Harrison Munch reactor engine. A computer of infinite complexity. And I ask you, General, I put the question to you. Why was such a computer not designed? It has been designed, sir. It was designed a half a million years ago. There is only one mechanism competent to handle those controls, sir. That is the human brain. <clears throat> All right. I turn now to my second question, General, and I ask it not only for myself and my colleagues on this committee, but for 170 million Americans listening on the radio, watching on television. With that man up there living out his last days, why was it not possible to send a ship up after him? Why was there no second ship built? For one reason, Senator, money. The appropriation for rocket research fell short by 12% of the amount needed even to build one vessel. 
Oh, frankly, gentlemen, the deficiency was made up by cutting corners and diverting funds from other projects. That is not the point, General. There's a man up there who's going to die. With the limited funds you gave us, we've done what we set out to do. We've demonstrated that space flight is possible, that a space platform is feasible. If there is any inefficiency, if there is any blame for what has happened, it lies at the door of those who lack the confidence and the courage and ability of their countrymen to fight free of Earth to their greatest glory. Senator, how did you vote on that? <laughs> This is Harry Anders in the gallery of the Washington National Cathedral. This is a special prayer service called by the Dean of the Cathedral for the safety of Lieutenant McMillan and for the success of the recently announced rescue plan. The church is filled. There's a sprinkling of high Navy, Army, and Air Force uniforms. I see General Finch in the second row, next to the Secretary of the Air Force and the newly appointed Under Secretary of Defense, Mr. Winokur. Prominently displayed in the center aisle, below the ornate railing separating the pews from the altar, is the small model of Macmillan's ship. One by one now, the congregation is filing past, dropping checks, bills. I saw one child drop in 12 pennies, one by one. All contributions are to be used to defray the cost of the rescue effort. The congregation is now kneeling to pray. A moment of silent prayer will follow for the safety and rescue of Lieutenant McMillan. One billion dollars was raised in one week from voluntary contributions. Another billion and a half was appropriated unanimously by Congress. The race began. Would the rescue party reach the ship in time? Of course, we didn't know then. And daily we listened to the voice of the man we hoped to buy back from death. Uh, now, look, Bill. On these McMillan broadcast tapes, a... Uh, don't let some, some ignorant engineering vice president holler because it's not broadcast quality. Believe me, I knew Macmillan. There's more of that wild Texan in these tapes than in any, any hi-fi, super-frequency response studio recordings. Just listen. You, you'll see what I mean. I've been staring out the portholes. I never tire of it. Through the window at the right, I see a black velvet curtain with a strong light behind it. There are pinpoint holes in the the light shines through, not winking the way stars do, but steady. There's no air up here, that's the reason. My oxygen is holding out better than I expected. By my figures, it should last 27 days more. I shouldn't use so much of it talking all the time, but it's hard to stop it. Talking, I feel as if I was still in touch with the earth. Still one of you. Even though I am way up here. Too bad the receiver is broken, but if it had to be one or the other, I'm glad it was the transmitter that came through all right. There's only one of me. There are billions of you to talk to. You can't see me now. You'll have to wait hours for the dawn. I'll have mine in a few minutes. That's the way he talked. And as we listened to the lonely voice from the night, the engineers, the scientists, the construction men worked round the clock. General Finch presented the problem in the pool interview. I asked the questions for the combined networks that afternoon. Most of you heard the complete broadcast live as he briefed the world with the clipped laconic delivery of a soldier. There are two basic problems. We've recovered the first and second stages of the rocket... We've only to construct the third stage. The second problem is more difficult. The pilot. Lieutenant McMillan was the only man physically and psychologically qualified. We discovered that in our first program. His training and orientation took 18 months. We have now to duplicate this in 27 days. You think it's possible, General? I don't know. Uh, that's all, Mr. Anders. Uh, Stevenson, get me some coffee, will you? Black and some kind of sandwich, no butter, no mayonnaise. And then the voice from the cave asked a question and expected no answer. Do you hear me down there? 
Sometimes I wonder. I wish there was some way I could be sure you were hearing me. Just that one thing might keep me from going crazy. I was there the night we answered that question. I was there in a helicopter over Kansas City. This is Harry Anders speaking to you from a helicopter over Kansas City. There are 15 seconds till midnight. The plan was developed by General Finch. At precisely midnight, every light in the city will be out and then flashed on in two-second intervals. This will be the exact moment that McMillan's ship is calculated to pass overhead. It's, it's almost time now. Five, four, three, two, one. There they go. Off. On. Off. On. Off. On. I see it. I see it. Kansas City winking at me. Oh, yes, I can see it. Thanks. Thanks. You're listening. I know that now. I'm not alone. I'll never forget. I'm waiting for you. We're recording in the press gallery of the Goddard Rocket Base main construction hangar. The vast third stage component stands before us, men swarming up and down the gantry cranes. The Mark III is being built to carry five men instead of one. The pilot selection has been kept a top secret to avoid unnecessary strain on the men selected. The latest progress report gives a possible margin of six hours between the launching of the rescue ship and the estimated exhaustion supply of oxygen to Lieutenant McMillan. Now, the shift is changing now. The expert construction workers recruited from across the country by the combined efforts of the Air Force Personnel Service, the Atomic Energy Commission, and the International United Electrical Workers and United Auto Workers of the AFL-CIO. The margin is six hours. Six hours between life and death for Lieutenant Reverdy L. McMillan. I saw the sun rise over Russia. It looks like any other land from here. The grain where it should be green. Farther north, a, a sort of mud color. And then white where the snow is still deep. Up here, you wonder why we're so different when the land is the same. You think we're all the same children of the same mother planet. Who says we're different? Uh, can you hear me in the back? Hey, you're standing yes. a little close. Well, uh, how about this? Yeah, that's better. That's better. All right, gentlemen, I have exactly five minutes for the press conference, therefore I'm not going to answer any questions. Progress report is as follows. As a safety factor, we're constructing two complete three-stage rockets and six additional third-stage components. The telemetered reports from McMillan's ship have added important additional information and the first of the rescue vessels should be ready to be launched at the estimated time, weather permitting. Now, don't ask a question. Within certain limitations of air turbulence, the rocket will be ready to lift in time to save Lieutenant McMillan. 21 days. The air is bad tonight. I can't seem to get a full breath. It seems to stick in the lungs. It doesn't matter, though. But I wish you could see what I've seen. Vast spreading universe around Earth like a bride in a soft veil. You'd know then that we belong out here. Come out, mankind. Come out and see what I have seen. This is Harry Anders at Goddard Rocket Base. The Harrison Munch reactor engine for the first third stage rescue is being tested here at Goddard. You can hear the roaring of the gases in the test chamber behind me. The work has been stepped up as a new calculation based on the increased temperature reading from McMillan's ship indicates that the exhaustion time will be some six hours earlier than originally estimated. The margin of rescue will be in minutes. Air very bad. Better hurry. Can't last much longer. Silly, of course you'll hurry. But I don't want anyone feeling sorry for me. 
I've seen the stars clearly. But more than this, I've seen the earth. There where I have lived and loved. I have known it better than any man. And loved it better. And known its children better. Goodbye. I have a better tomb than the greatest conqueror Earth ever bore. Do not disturb. No. Count down for blast off. Five, four, three, two, one. Anders, tape three, two, three. We're in the press operation room of Goddard Field. The rescue rocket has been aloft 53 minutes plus. Its calculated time of arrival is 54 minutes. You will hear the voice of General Beauregard Finch on a direct pickup from the rescue vessel, which has been named unofficially the Lifesaver. Silent crowds have collected at the outer perimeter of the rocket base, as if by their presence they might help it. Quiet, quiet. The next voice you hear will be General Finch, aloft in the rescue ship. The voice quality may not be good. He's speaking over a throat mic in his pressure suit. Mark three to base. This is Finch. Let me secure that cable. We have just secured to the airlock of Macmillan's ship. I'm now entering the lock. The inner door is closed. I have closed the outer door. The inner door is cycling. Now it is open. Bring in those oxygen bottles, Glenn. The bulkhead to the control room is open. Is he all right? Come on, will you? What's happening? Lieutenant McMillan is dead. He died heroically, waiting till all hope was gone. Until every oxygen gauge stood at zero. And then, well, the airlock was open when we arrived. In accordance with his own wish, his body will be left here in its eternal orbit. I'm going to leave now. My feet will be the last to touch this deck. Lieutenant McMillan is in his control chair, staring out towards the stars. I'll leave the airlock doors open behind me. Let the airless, frigid arms of space protect and preserve for all eternity. This man they would not let go. Well, that's the show, Bill. Bill, you remember at the conference we we hadn't made up our mind whether to pick anything up from the celebration last night after the news of the Mars landing? I said it was the right end for Rev. McMillan's story. You said it was old stuff. Every kid knew the sequence. The ships built to rescue Rev used to set up the satellite base from the base to the moon and now to Mars. Well, I went out with a mini-tape last night, and I've got the end of the story. Here it is. This is Harry Anders in Times Square. The neon rocket ship at the top of the Times building has just flashed into brilliant light. The signal that the landing signal has been received from the rocket Rev. McMillan III. Man has landed on Mars. And a holiday crowd here in Times Square is celebrating like a thousand New Year's rolled into one. I'm being, I'm being tossed and pushed and clapped on the back all at once. Uh, let's see what the man in the street thinks about man on Mars. Uh, you, uh, you, sir, uh, I'm broadcasting. No, no. No, no, how do you feel about it, sir? How do you feel tonight about man's conquest of space, of the planet? Leave me alone. I'm in a hurry. Uh, just a few words of the... Look, you get your hands off me. Let go of me. I'm not in... Wait a minute, sir. Wait, wait. Wait. Rev! Rev, come back here. Rev! You think I could listen to that voice over and over in a tape editing room and not know every vowel, every consonant? I'm telling you, Bill, I saw him. Rev McMillan. The black hair was gray and those Clark Abel ears were pinned back, but that's a simple operation. I played that piece of tape over and over. It was Rev. I know it. He isn't up there. He's alive. We've got it, Bill. We've got it on our show. We'll break it. Rev McMillan is alive. I haven't written it yet, but we finish it off with this, with a question. Why did they announce he was dead? 
I'm in the tape editing room now. I've got the reel ready to record the answer. Excuse me, Mr. Andrews. I'm... Uh, hey, 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 J just a minute. I'm recording. You better see the page outside Mr. of the... Mr. Andrews, I'd like to talk to you for a moment, if I may. I have a letter of authorization. Oh, uh, oh just a minute. I'll, I'll be through in a minute. Look, Bill, I've got the answer now. Last night, they landed on Mars. But that first ship, the one that circles up there now, there isn't anybody on it. There never was, except a 30 days recording and a transmitter. That's all. He was never up there. They didn't have the money for a manned rocket. They wanted a crash program all out, so they sent a decoy up. <laughs> and we all broke our hearts to rescue the man who wasn't there. Oh, he must be laughing, General Finch and the rest of them, the ones that knew. Yeah, I guess they had a problem. What to do with Rev? <laughs> I wonder if he slipped away from whatever guards they have around him to see the celebration. He looked a little, uh, a little sad. Now, I think sometimes he, he must wish he was really up there in the cave of night, seated in the icy control room, 1,075 miles above the earth, staring out at the stars. Mr. Anders, I must insist... What? Uh, oh, uh... Oh, Bill. Looks as if I won't have to worry about editing this tape. My friends are from Washington. I'd like to call your attention to the last paragraph. What? Oh, no, 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 no. It's very simple. You won't have to burn it. It's easy to destroy recording tape. I throw this switch. When the tape goes through, the erasing head, it's, it's gone forever. Oh, too bad. Would have made one fine show. Okay. So long, Rev. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features an exciting serial, Slave Ship, by Frederick Pohl. Countdown for blast off. X-5, 4, 3, 2, X-1, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X, 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 X minus, 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 minus one. one, one, one. Tonight, Chain of Command by Stephen R. This is about George. Uh, he's a friend of mine. Lives right here at the Brookside Atomic Laboratory with his family. Uh, my name is Charlie Boyle, uh, by the way. Uh, I'm a security guard here at the lab. Been here now for, well, 20 years, I guess. Of course, they don't use the lab anymore. Lots of weeds and things, and, well, I, I stick around. There isn't really any place to go. Oh, well, I'm, I'm getting away from it after all. This is about George. Uh, some of it I knew myself. A lot of it he told me after it was over. It began, let's see now, uh, well, it began the morning after George's wife lit into him. I think, George, the least you could do is complain. After all, are you a mouse or a man? Clara, what's the point of complaining? It'll just start trouble. We do live at the laboratory. We have some rights. The best thing we can do is just stay right where we are. But it's dangerous. There's nothing dangerous about it, just so long as we know what we're doing. I'm not thinking about us. I'm thinking about the children. The children know where they mustn't go. George, I will not go on like this without a moment's peace of mind. If you had the slightest concern for my welfare or for the children's... You'd really all right, all right. I'll go talk to old Charlie, the security guard. Why not talk directly to the superintendent? Because of the complications. Now, I promise you I'll explain the situation to Charlie. He knows me. I've talked to him for over a year now. And he hasn't the slightest influence. 
I'll impress the seriousness of the situation on you. All right, but do it now. I will. And be firm. I'll be as firm as I can. I was at my desk in the hallway. The place was deserted. I've always worked the night shift, except for my supervisor, Mr. Adams, who was in his office down the hall working late. I remember I was sort of dozing off when I heard George's voice in my ear. Charles. Psst. Charlie. Hmm? Oh. Huh? It's me, George. Oh, yes, yes, George. Yeah. How are you? Fine. Can I have a chat with you? Hmm. Chat away. I got all night. Good. It's about the trap. The trap? The one outside our door. Oh, that trap. Clara, my wife, says it's dangerous. Well, now, uh... She'd like it removed. Removed? Oh, no, George. That can't be done. <laughs> Regulations? Regulations. Suppose you just removed it without telling anybody. Oh, they'd fire me, George. I see. Hmm. Clara's afraid one of the kids might get hurt. Oh, how about taking it up with the supervisor? Mr. Adams? Why not? Well, it never occurred to me. Uh... Why not give it a try? Oh, I don't know. Mr. Adams doesn't even know you exist. Maybe it's time he found out. Hmm, well, <clears throat> well, it, it, it might get a bit sticky. Give it a try. Well, Come on, Charlie. Be a good fellow. Haven't we been buddies for a long time? Oh, we've been buddies, all right, but... Well, when it comes to something like Will this... Will you try I... at least? Clara isn't going to let me alone unless something happens. Uh, oh, uh, okay, George. I'll give it a try. I, I, I straightened my tie and I brushed off my uniform real neat and I went into Mr. Adams' office. I could see the light under his door and I hear him on the phone, so I knew he was there. Edgar? Adams up at Brookside Lab. Ah. Uh -huh. How are things in Washington? Mm, no, 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 nothing serious. Just want to have a fingerprint check on one of our scientists. Ah. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, number 7X4582. That's right. How's the missus? Ah, good. Now, oh, excuse me a minute, will you? Somebody at the door. Come in, come in. Oh, hello, Charlie. Hello, Mr. Edgar, can I call you back? Fine. Yeah, what is it, Charlie? Oh, I, 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 I'd like a word with you, Mr. Well, Adams. Charlie, I'm on the phone to Washington. Is it a security matter? Oh, in a way, Mr. Adams. Well? Oh, I, I, don't know how, I don't know how to tell you, really. Uh, well, just tell me. Well, <laughs> sir... There's a mouse named George down in room 412 who doesn't want the trap outside his door. Well, that's just too... What? A mouse in uh, room 412. He ob objects to the trap. <laughs> Look, Charlie, I I'm busy. Is this, is this a joke or something? Oh, well, I, I guess maybe it I is. I mean, I like a good uh, joke as well as the next fellow, uh, Charlie, but, well, I mean, it's late and I got a lot of work to do. Do, 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 do you mind? No, Mr. Adams. Yeah, well, that's fine. You just get back to your desk, huh? Okay, Mr. Yeah. Adams. And Charlie, uh, yes, sir. Yes. next time one of the mice complains, tell him to come in here and speak to me himself. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Edgar, Edgar Adams here again. I'm sorry. One of the security guards playing a little joke on me. <laughs> he came in to say one of the mice here at the lab is complaining about the trap outside his door. <laughs> you got him down Washington, too, huh? Yeah? What do you do about it? Traps, huh? Yeah. Yeah, it's the only way, I guess. Yeah. Well, I went back to my desk. Uh, George was there, waiting. I could tell by his expression that uh, he knew the answer before he even asked me. No soap, huh, Charlie? No soap, George. I guess I'll have to tell Clara. Yeah, I'm sorry, George. What did he say? Well, he said if you've got a complaint, see him yourself. He said that, huh? Yeah. Of course, I didn't know what was going to happen. Uh, 
Uh, George didn't tell me till it was all over. I mean, really, really all over. And then it was too late for me to do anything. It, it turned out, though, that <coughs> Clara, that George's wife, told him that if he didn't go talk to Mr. Adams, she'd up and leave him. Yeah, leave him and the kids, too. Uh, so him and me, we, we went. And nothing negative on his record, eh, Edgar? Uh, well, okay. Yeah, excuse me a minute. Come in. Uh, oh, what is it this time? Excuse me, Mr. Adams. It, uh, it's, uh, well, it, it, it's that mouse. He wants to talk to you. I'll call you back, Edgar. Now, look, Charlie, I mean, this has gone far enough. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Yes, sir. What's the devil you got in your hand? Uh, oh, this is him, sir. It's, it's the mouse I was telling you about. George. Yes, George. This is Mr. Adams, the security supervisor. How do you do? Huh? How do you do? Well, <laughs> ventriloquism, huh, Charlie? Yeah. That's pretty good. Oh, it's, it ain't ventriloquism, Mr. Adams. He talks. <laughs> yeah, sure he does. <laughs> uh, well, look, now you had your little joke, and I, I got a lot of work to I'd do. I'd like a word with you. What? <laughs> sure, that's, that's remarkable. It really... Uh, now, look, uh, George, you don't... Uh, George, uh, suppose I just leave you here and step outside. And... That might be best. Excuse me, Mr. No, no, wait a minute. You, you can't leave that beast in here. He, he won't take much of your time. But uh, all, all in leaving mouse on my desk. Can you hear me all right? Yes, of course. What? what? I said, can you hear me? Some people have trouble. I'm going out of my mind. It, it, it's a hallucination. No, sir, a mouse. Listen to who, who, what, what? What are you? A mouse. You know, cheese, rodents, all that sort of thing. You mind if I touch you? Okay, but take it easy. Careful, don't bend up the whiskers. You're real. Sure, I'm real. Now, listen, about that trap. The trap? My wife is driving me goofy. Get it away from our front door, will you? Your front door, yes. Yes, of course, I'll... Are you sure you, you, you exist? I could bite you to prove it. Never mind. What about it? Well, what about what? The trap. The trap. Yes, of course. Well, I mean, that's a security problem. Look, would you do me a favor? It depends. Tell me, how come you talk? Simple. My ancestors have been around this lab since it was built. We've gotten a lot of gamma radiation. A couple of them were used as an experiment to test radiation endurance. There were surgical operations, graphs of human brain tissue to mouse brain tissue to check the effects of the rays on human brains and so on. You follow me? Wait a minute. I remember there were some experiments where human brain tissue was placed in a mouse and then exposed. That's it. Those mice, the ones that survived, were my great-grandparents. Holy smokes. So what about the trap? I mean, huh? we're nice, peaceful mice. We don't bother anybody. We don't eat much. We mind our own wait, business. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You, you, you say your great-grandparents were the first of this talking line? I mean, are, are there many of you? Three generations, Mac. That's a lot of mice. Tell me, you talk to anybody besides me? Well, I talk to Charlie. No, no, I mean besides Charlie... I tried it with a couple of guys. They wouldn't listen. These, these, these others, what do you call them, your relatives, have, have they talked to anybody? Tell me. How should I know? I suppose they've talked to dozens of people. Where are these people they've talked to? The mental hospitals are full of them. It's a problem, see? We can talk to kids and, you know, the odd ones, but uh, anybody else, they get scared. Uh-huh. So what do I tell Clara about the trap? Clara? My wife, Clara. Oh, oh, well, it, it's a security problem. I think I'll have to take it up with Washington. Okay, take it up. Yeah, I'll dictate a memo first thing in the... No, no, I won't. They'll think I've flipped. Okay, I'll tell Clara. Now, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let, let me make a phone call. Sooner or later, this thing has got to be dealt with. Edgar. Edgar Adams at Brookside. Now, Edgar, old man, we have just encountered a rather unusual security problem here at the plant. Yes. Uh, oh, no, 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 no. Nothing like that. Mice. Yes. Talking mice. 
No, no, Edgar, it is not a joke. I know we were joking a while ago, but it turns out there are talking mice here. Edgar, listen. Please, Edgar, will you listen? I'll I'll put one of them on the phone. Now, listen, would, would you... Here, would you just talk, please? What'll I say? Just say anything. His name is George. Hello? This is George. I'm trying to get the authorities to remove the trap from in front of my... What? Yeah, let me have it, will you? Edgar, Edgar, listen, I am not kidding, and I have not gone mad. This is on the level. In my office at this moment, there is a mouse who talks in this top-secret atomic laboratory. There are several hundred such mice, for all I know. Look, Edgar, you don't believe me, and I don't expect you to believe me. No, I don't want a vacation. Good night, Edgar. He doesn't believe me. We keep running into this all the time. <laughs> George... George, are you really interested in doing something about that trap? Have you ever met my wife? Oh, of course you haven't. Wait a minute, I got it, I got it. I'm, I'm going to call for a top-level security conference at the Pentagon. George, will you come down there with me, will you? We won't say a word. We'll, we'll just appear. Washington? First-class accommodations will get you the best suite in town. Do you like cheese? Do I like cheese? Can you get provolone down there? Get what? Provolone. We'll get it. All the... Provolone, you can eat. I've never traveled before. George, you'll love it. You'll love it. Chance to get away from the wife for a while, huh? What do you say, boy? You and me, huh? We'll live it up down there. Look, I know a couple of girls. I seem to recall they had mice in their pantry. I don't know. I'll have to talk to Clara. Look, look. Tell her it's the only way to get action on the trap. Make it sound big, you know. You hate to go away from her, but it's for the kids. <laughs> what do you say, pal, huh? Well, okay. That a boy. Operator, get me chief of security at the Pentagon. <clears throat> Make it fast. This is an emergency. I wasn't there, but uh, like I say, George told me all about it after it was over. Uh, seems him and Mr. Adams went down to Washington on a morning plane. Uh, George got a little... Uh, plane sick, but he, he he liked flying pretty good anyway. They checked in at the Statler, then went over to the Pentagon. Right, order, gentlemen, order. As a chief, I hereby convene a meeting. It's been called as a priority A emergency session by Mr. Adams, who, as you know, is security chief at our Brookville Atomic Laboratories. Mr. Adams? Yes, thank you. Thank you, chief. Now, gentlemen, it may come as a shock to all of you. It did to me. But I've learned that some 1,200 English-speaking individuals have been operating freely within our top-secret laboratories at Brookville without any security clearance whatsoever. You did say 1,200? Actually, sir, 1,207. Who are these people, sir? Mice, Chief. <clears throat> mice? Yes, sir, mice. I have one of them here with me. Some, somewhere. George. George. Here. George. Oh. Well, there you are. <laughs> George, would you just mind stepping to the center of the table? Right. Gentlemen, uh, this is George. How do you do? Well, you do? this he spoke is to most remarkable. George is the result of an experiment conducted some years ago in which bits of human brain tissue were grafted into live mice to test radiation effects. And there are 1,200 of these inside the lab? 1,207. Without security clearance? Without security clearance. Oh. oh. Sir, uh, Mouse? Call me George. Uh, George? George, tell me uh, what you know. My wife wants the trap removed from our front door. She thinks it's dangerous for the children. Has she been cleared? Quiet, General. Well, a major lapse of security. I'm like aware it. of the lapse, General. What about the trap? I refuse to countenance any act that will aid the entrance of more of these spies and saboteurs into the plant. Who's a spy? I'm a mice, a mouse. Tell me, have you overheard any conferences? Maybe a few. Seen any documents? My kids play in the secret document file. It's the safest place in the lab. Have you yourself ever seen any papers marked top secret? Seen them? Heck, I've eaten them. <laughs> I believe this calls for some action, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Mr. Adams, Mr. Adams, if you and this uh, rodent uh, will retire to the next room, I think we'll have a brief caucus. Yes, sir. 
George. Uh, okay. Yes, uh, see, see you later, gentlemen. Uh, listen, what about the provolone? Never mind. <clears throat> well, I think we should try to forget for the moment that these creatures are mice and deal with them as security problems. Concur. Now then, the first question is one of loyalty. I raise a question at this point. General? Are these American mice? Well, I assume the... Well, but do we know? You have a point, sir. Perhaps we ought to get immigration in on this. Immigration? I'd say extermination. Before we do anything, Rash General, I think we ought to learn more about these creatures, who they are, what their habits are, their loyalties... How much they know? Suppose this George creature won't tell us. We'll have to use every trick in the book. Now, I would suggest we first try the velvet glove. The full treatment. George told me about the velvet glove later. He said he didn't really suspect anything at first, what with all the excitement of being in Washington and so on, but uh, after a while he got wind of what they were doing. Room service. This is Mr. Adams in 712. Will you please send up a pound of, uh, uh, of, uh... Provolone. Provolone, please. Cheese. Cheese. Yes. And some more wine. Yes. Fine. Uh -huh. Right away, please. They'll have some more right away, George. Can't get enough of this stuff. Really delicious. George, have a little more wine. I don't mind if I do. <laughs> Yeah, this is the life, all right. It's a great town, isn't it, George? Stupendous. By the way, George, those documents you mentioned eating, uh, do you remember what they said? Mm, something about nuclear weapons. Listen, Adam, what about those girls you mentioned, the, the ones who had mice in their pantry? Oh, yes. How about giving them a, a call? Well, huh? George, a little late, don't you think? Oh, the night's just beginning. All right, George, I'll give him a little call. And six. <laughs> yeah, if my memory serves. Hello, Gail. <laughs> my memory serves. Bob Adams. Hi, just just down on a quick business trip. Uh huh. How tricks, Gail? <laughs> no, 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 not a thing. By the way, did you still have mice? Mice. Yeah, but... You, uh... You exterminated... Oh. Oh, I see. Uh-huh. No, 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 I... No, I don't think I'll have time this trip. I just wanted to call you up and say hello. <laughs> yeah, maybe next trip. Fine, my dear. So long. What'd she say? Uh, unfortunately, the superintendent has a... Cat. I see. Wiped out? Wiped out. That's something I want to take up with my congressman before we leave town. We'll do that, George. George, have another sip of wine. You won't mind if I do. That's it. Now then, George, about those documents. Oh, you stop about documents. I thought we were in town for a good time. We are, we are. Well, round up a couple of mice, man, and let's get with it. Mice, I'll tell, I'll tell you I'll tell you what, George. You wait here, I'll go out, and I'll see what I can do, okay? Okay, but make it savvy, huh? I'm raring to go. <laughs> Next morning, Adams woke George and told him they were scheduled for another conference at the Pentagon. George, George, wake up, huh? Oh, what a head. Come on, come on, George, we're due at the Pentagon. Easy, don't talk so loud. Wow. Where did you get those white mice last night? Over at the National Research Lab. Ooh. They must have been feeding those girls wheat germs. All right, come on, come on, George. Come on, you can sober up in the taxi. Come on. All right, George, we've been beating around the bush long enough. Who are you? I've told you, I'm a mouse. My name is George. I live in a hole at the Brookville Atomic Laboratory. We know all that. We want to know who's behind Nobody's you. Nobody's behind me. Listen, you guys don't have to be afraid of me. 
I'm only a mouse. It's the perfect fifth column. The ultimate weapon. Do you realize that you and your family are living inside a secret government installation without any security clearance whatsoever? I'm willing to be investigated. How do we know you aren't an agent for a foreign power? How do we know you aren't an agent for a foreign power? Preposterous. It'd be the perfect fifth column. Gentlemen, I will not remain here to be insulted by this creature. And I will not be insulted by you, sir. Gentlemen, good day. No, no, George, wait, come back. Where George, is it? Where he is went it? that George, way. Wait. Get him off. George. He's going into the wall. Kevin, too George. late. He's gone. Well, men, this is it. We'll have to decide on a course of action. We've got to recapture him. Look, I, I think the first thing to do is get a cat. He's too smart for a cat. Well, something's got to be done. Something's got to be done. After all, these creatures have access to every secret file in the country. Not to mention eavesdropping on our private lives. This is the thing that bothers me as gentlemen. They multiply in another three generations. There will be some 12 billion talking mice. Six times the human population of the Earth. It's no matter for pulling around. Kill or be killed, gentlemen. The problem there is how. We have reason to believe they're concentrated in Brookville. I say evacuate all humans and blow up the plant. Use the H-bomb if necessary. I'm afraid you're right, General. We must exterminate. I'll phone Strategic Air Command and alert them. SAC, please. Hello, Bell. This is Ed. Listen, fuel up a couple of big ones. No, nothing serious. But we may want to use them in the near future. Just stand by, that's all. I'll call Chemical Warfare. Get the best information on exterminating rodents. Hello. Hello. That's funny. He's gone dead. Hello? Hello? Something is wrong here. Sounds almost as if the line had been cut. Adams got an alarm for that mouse. Well, that was only the beginning, of course. Things began to happen pretty fast right after that. You bet your sweet satchel they did. Well, Adams? Yeah, I've, I've been talking to Edgar. The yep. FBI has located several hundred field mice, all of them non-talking. No trace of a mouse corresponding to our description of George. Okay. Team of secret servicemen been combing the Pentagon and the White House. We've got 1,500 traps baited with imported provolone in the Senate chambers alone. So far, no luck. And what about cats? The American feline fanciers have volunteered 100 mousers. Oh, good, good. Uh, any more telephone wires cut? I'm afraid so, Chief, yes. We... He managed to gnaw through the private wire from the president's suite to the Pentagon. Oh, I see. We'll get it spliced. What about the top secret file on that new chemical warfare agent? Is there any trace of that? They found the file, but he managed to chew out the key symbols. I'm afraid it's useless. Well, keep tracking him down. Yes, Sooner sir. or later, we'll get yes, him. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Only one thing, Well, what's sir. that? I hate to mention it, really. Well, go on, man. Well, sir, the damage has appeared in such widespread places recently. Well, go on, that, go on. That, that, that... Well, there must be more than just George. In fact, we're afraid he has reinforcements right here in Washington. But that's impossible. How? I don't know how, sir, unless... Unless what? Unless... Well, it seems, sir, that there were a couple of female white mice from the National Research Lab. You mean... Yes, sir, I'm afraid so, sir. I guess maybe you know the rest. Within a couple of weeks, every cable, telephone line, power line, and every telegraph line in the United States had been cut. Also the wires on every plane, tank, train, and ship. It also destroyed every file in the country. That was only a month ago. Well, you can guess what's happened. Most everybody has left this part of the world. In this whole atomic laboratory, I'm the only human. And I'm not so sure I'll be around much longer. Yes, sir. The only woman. Not that they, they they need a security guard, but well, I'm I'm just used to being here. Uh, I wouldn't know where to go. Psst, Charlie. Uh, why, George. George, is it you? That's right, Charlie. Well, you look awful. Where have you been? Well, I was down in Washington, Charlie. About the traps, remember? Oh yeah. That was before all the trouble started over two months ago. Well, what you been doing all this time? Well, you know, we've been pretty busy protecting ourselves, cutting the lines and stopping transportation and such. Uh, I figured it, it was the mice done it, yeah. Yeah, we didn't like it, but it was them or us, so we did it. Hmm. Well, how come you look so terrible, though? Well, we stopped the trains and the planes, you know, so well, I had to walk back. That's one heck of a walk for a mouse. Well, 
like I said, this is about George. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was an NBC Radio Network production. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X minus one. Tonight's story, Colony, by Philip K. Dick. The existence of Planet Blue, the fourth in orbit around a G-type sun somewhere in the Aldebaran sector, was predicted by spectroscopic analysis and spatio-mathematic equations some 50 years before an exploring mission was dispatched to it. The research team, under Commander Stella Morrison of the Colonial Administration, went into orbit around Planet Blue at 0700 standard sidereal time. Authorized procedures were followed. Aerial photography completed, Commander. Anything show on the plate? Well, Masterson was suspicious of these lines towards the poles, but the angles seem to be coincidence. They are not artifacts. Glacial faults. Geological survey reports no volcanism. Mm -hmm. The launch is back. Dodge has a landing site pinpointed. Preliminary atmospheric tests look good. There's a 0.7 bulge in oxygen, but it's just enough to make you feel good. Looks like an open-air job. No pressure suits or condenser mass. Well, that's precisely what they thought on Centauri 1. And the whole expedition was wiped out by spores. Of course, I was assuming a favorable bio check. Mm -hmm. Preliminary photographic survey, Mr. Wood. Thank you, Dodds. You want them played back here? We haven't transcribed the tape. If you please, Lieutenant. 393. Al, pipe the photo tapes up here on, um, 324. Mm. Looks like a green world, all right. Punch up the tape, if you please, Lieutenant. All orbital checks prove positive. The atmosphere and gravity Earth normal to three places on the Grayson scale. And the exploratory research ship lowered itself by the Meyerson Lay atmospheric skip method came into a stall tail landing just before sunset on a day marked in the logs as planet fall zero. The hatches remained sealed as a two-mile perimeter was scanned by direct instrumentation. Major Lawrence Hall of Biosurvey reported EEG sweeps to the bridge. Of course, it isn't conclusive. We've run into life forms that didn't broadcast a brainwave at all. The Gryladont lizard on Ganymede. Skull acted as an effective shielding due to a heavy lead constituent in the body chemistry. Major Hall, I am not interested in a lecture on extraterrestrial zoology. Is there or is there not life within the range of your instruments? Well, I'm sorry, Stella. The readings show no electrical brain activity whatsoever, and that covers life down to the level of invertebrates. There may be a few worms turning out there, and unless they're thinking awfully hard about something, we wouldn't pick them up. Well, thank you. I want preliminary drones out for sampling. How long do you think that will take? Well, a thorough job, take about two weeks. I have a schedule, Major. 
How long till you can give me a protective Schedule C clearance? Two days. Then I ought to check airborne spores and microorganisms. Carry on, Major. All right, Stella. I'll let you know if I turn up any, uh, special diseases on Planet Blue. <laughs> sample missiles were dispatched at sunrise. Air scoops, ground samplers, and vegetation choppers returned to base, and the bio team instituted full prescribed tests. Immediately identifiable airborne dangers were ruled out. Outside of the possible allergenic action of pollens, Planet Blue was ruled safe for normal exploratory procedures, and the real work of the survey was gotten underway. Here's the morning report, Commander. Four in sick bay, three ordered to light duty. What happened? Well, last night was liquor ration. Oh. Survey teams out in the field. Bio crew under Major Hall. Agronomy, ecological, geological, and deep map teams out. Any reports back? Deep map seems to think there's petroleum over to the north, and agronomy reports if you dropped a seed in this soil, you'd have to jump back to keep from being knocked over by the plant. Mm -hmm. Sounds pretty good. Commander, blue is about as likely a spot for colonization as has been turned up since Harvey's planted in 27. Well, they'll be glad to hear that in Central. How long do you think until we can send back a clearance? I've checked with department chiefs. They all estimate about two or three days more until they're satisfied. All except bio. Well, why is Major Hall dragging his feet? I don't know. Well, find out. And in the meantime, I'm going to call a staff meeting. Every day we can say when our report is important. If blue is suitable for colonization, I don't want to waste a minute. <laughs> By planet fall plus three weeks, all departments had reported favorably except biology. Ecological survey pointed out the difficulty involved in the necessity of importing animal life. But this problem had already been met in the colonization of gamma two and three, when an entire ecology had been transported in frozen gene banks and fertilized and incubated on the site. Biology, however, still withheld a favorable report. Look, Larry. What is the secret, Stella? Cold formality on the bridge and Larry when you're in my lab? Well, I'm serious. Well, I've just gotten an official query from Central. They want to fish or cut bait on blue. Your department is the only one holding it up. We're two weeks behind schedule. And the first colony on Vishnu was right on schedule and 7,000 died of green spots. That was before the full bio check technique was worked out. My dear. Do you know how many different microorganisms there are in a cup full of dirt? I'm not a freshman student of biology. Oh, dear. And I was hoping I could tempt you into some uh, field work. Someday, Larry, you're going to make some remark in front of some junior officers or even enlisted personnel, and I'm going to have to call you on it. Afraid for your dignity, my dear? Look, I'm in charge of this expedition. My dignity happens to be a function of command, and as such, it's a survival factor. Ah, well, then you had better take it easy at officers' mess. You know, I saw two biomates watching you, uh, climbing the ladder to the bridge. Do you know what their affectionate name for you is? Major Hall. <laughs> I'm serious. I want a bio clearance as soon as possible. And you will get it. As soon as possible. And when will that be? When I'm satisfied. Are the bugs here so dangerous that you're afraid of them? No, on the contrary. We have yet to find the harmful life forms. Well, you didn't report that. If there are no harmful life forms... No then... life. No disease germs. No malignant virus. Well, then what are you waiting for? There should be. There should be at least one little fellow who could give you a common cold. Look, sociology section found no native narcotic plant life. And inasmuch as there is no humanoid life, there is no bootlegging, gambling, immorality, and pornography either. By analogy, that would be a good reason not to colonize. Is that the idiotic logic you're following? Microbiology is a little different than Stella. And anyway, what is the rush? Blue is something different. There's something peaceful in the air. Why rush to bring picnickers who will drop candy wrappers and fill the pools up with empty beer cans? Larry, I have a planned board conference in ten minutes. If you don't bring in some kind of a report by then, I'll have to supersede you under a Section 23. Ah, yes, that's what happened on Vishnu, isn't it? Followed by Green Spot, and the wagons dragged the corpses out of the colony street. Never mind that, Major. I want a report. In the biology section lab, Major Lawrence Hall continued to examine tissue samples from lower fauna and flora samples brought in from Planet Blue. He settled a container of prepared slides 
and flip the switch on the electron microscope. Major Hall slid the first slide on the stage of the microscope and adjusted the focus knob. Come on, come on, come on. Huh, there you are. All right, come on, kid, eat something. The microorganisms, a form of rotifer, displayed none of the characteristics of ferocity and aggression which were normal on several dozen other planets. Presently, however, Major Hall stopped whistling. Inasmuch as the two eyepieces of his microscope twisted suddenly around his windpipe and started to strangle him. Ooh. Hall tore it, <coughs> but they dug relentlessly into his throat, steel prongs closing like the claws of a trap. With a convulsive effort, he managed to break free and fling the microscope from him. Oh, oh that's crazy. It's... Better let go of my leg. He kicked the microscope loose and drew his blaster. As the microscope scuttled away, rolling on its coarse adjustment knob, he fired. The microscope disappeared in a cloud of metallic particles. The plans board of the research team was assembled in the officer's library. Commander Stella Morrison was outlining plans on a detailed aerial survey map. This non-flat area is ideal for the actual city. It has an adequate watershed in the hills here, and weather conditions vary sufficiently to give the settlers something to talk about. There are large deposits of various minerals. The colonists can set up their own factories. They won't have to do any importing. Over here is the biggest forest on the planet. If they have any sense, they'll leave us. But if they want to make newspapers out of it, that's not our concern. Now, all reports are in except bio. And I think that before long, we'll be getting... Stop. Major Hall... May I remind you that when the consul is in session, no one is permitted to interrupt... You come to my lab. Look, Hall, if you're not feeling well, uh, you look a little sick. Yes, well, I should be. My microscope just tried to strangle me. What? Oh? Oh, I see. It almost got me, but I blasted it. Well, that's not the worst. It isn't? No. The microscope is still there. After I blasted it, I found it under the lab bench. Untouched. Look, Major, uh... You sure you don't need a psych test? Well, I, I, I don't know. I suppose it does sound a little... You look post-trauma to me. Huh? Oh. Well, you're right. Well, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm sorry. Uh, Commander. Put Major Hall on psycho report. I think we'll have to proceed to order colonization here without him. Major Hall proceeded to Psych Center and inserting his ID card in the robot Neo Rorschach machine, he placed his hands on the contacts and activated the search and gestalt circuits. Presently, the green light flashed, indicating tentative diagnosis. Major Hall hit the response key. Severe disturbance. Instability ratio above 10. And that's over danger, isn't it? Yes. Eight is danger. Ten is unusual, especially for a person of your index. Your norm is four. Yeah, I know. I require more data to determine whether this unusual instability ratio is an aberrant reaction or is normal survival oriented. Well, I can't tell you anymore. It is illegal to hold back information during a robo-psych test. You will deliberately distort diagnosis, which is punishable by six months forfeiture of pay and allowances or such other penalty as a court-martial may direct. Uh, thanks a heap. Now look, do you record a high degree of unbalance for me? There is a high degree of psychic disorganization. But what it signifies, or its etiology, I am unable to determine without further data. Yeah. Okay, well, just take a tip from me. Stay away from homicidal microscopes. That is an interesting Freudian slip. You undoubtedly mean homicidal maniacs, not microscopes. This indicates a possible maladjustment in the area of your specialty. Uh, why don't you go grease your head? I will consider that suggestion. Major Hall returned to the biosection lab and tested the atmosphere near the place where he had fired his blast gun at the microscope. 
The analysis showed a high density of metallic particles colloidally suspended in the air. In a state of confusion, with an emotional distress quotient of at least 0.742, he stripped off his uniform and entered the shower. Oh. Uh. Oh, well, you can't expect anybody to believe a story like that. I must be off my rock. Major Hall stepped out of the shower, reached for one of the towels on the rack. <coughs> the towel wrapped around his head and yanked him against the wall. Rough cloth pressed over his mouth and nose. He fought wildly, pulling away. All at once, the towel let go. Major Hall crawled out of the shower and proceeded to dress. His belt, heavy canvas with reinforced metal links, tried to get him around the waist and crush him. The belt, being a heavy-duty issue, was strong, and they rolled on the floor until Hall was able to reach his blaster. He threw himself down on a chair to regain his breath. The arms of the chair started to close around him, but this time he was ready. Major, I don't believe you were announced. Look, Commander Stella. You're armed. You know the regulations I'm of the... sorry, Stella, this is important. Well, what do you want? I have a report here from the robo-psych tester. It says you've hit a ratio of 10 within the last 24-hour period. We've known each other for a long time. Larry, what's happening to Stella, you? Stella, I told you. A little while ago, my microscope tried to strangle me. Then when I was getting out of the shower, a bath towel tried to smother me. I got by that. And while I was dressing, my belt... Wood, in here on the double. And I finally blasted that. And then an armchair beside... Yes, Commander. Stand by a moment. Stella, will you listen to me? This is serious. Ordinary objects suddenly turning lethal. Maybe this is what we've been looking for. Maybe this is... Your microscope tried to kill you? I told you, its stems got me here around the windpipe. No one else saw this happen? No. I blasted it, and then I found it again perfectly all right. I see Wood. Yes, ma'am. Get two guards and take Major Hall down to Captain Taylor in Sick Bay. Have him confined until he can be sent back to Terra for examination. Listen, Stella... Sorry, you... Major. You can't prove this story, and we'll just have to assume it's a psychotic projection on your part. And we can't afford to have any psychotics running around loose on this planet. Wood, carry on. You'll be all right, Hall. Back on Earth, they can clear a thing like this up in a few weeks. Yeah. Maybe you're right, Wood. Maybe I'm just out of my mind. Here we are. Captain Taylor! Captain Taylor! He should be in. Captain! Well, the hatch isn't locked. Taylor! What's the matter? That scatter rug is choking him. Take an end to pull. Put up. Quick before he's crushed. Grab that rug. Now hear this. Now hear this. General alarm. General alarm. Emergency station. Emergency station. Condition red. Sidearms will be issued to all personnel. General alarm. Captain Taylor tells me the rug came from Terra. His grandmother braided it. That's what I was trying to tell you. It was not the rug that attacked them. Then what was it? Something that, that looked like this rug. And it was something that looked like a microscope that went for me. And the towel and the belt. You mean there's, there's some life form that, that can imitate anything? Yes, it seems so. And it's deadly. Charlie, general alarm. Get up out of that sack. Hey, what'd you do with my gloves? Oh. Hey, where'd I get two pair? Well, eighty meeny money. Mo. One pair of gloves is the same as the other. Hey. hey, these gloves are moving. How do you like that? These fool gloves are going for my blast pistol. Charlie, is this one of your crazy electronic gags? Did you rig my gloves? 
Hey, look out for that pistol. Look out! Commander, there's uh, another casualty. Lieutenant Dodd. What happened? I don't know. He seems to have shot himself. Oh, no. Stella. Stella, I think that I have something. Dodd is dead. Look, we know that this thing can camouflage itself. It can imitate any object it leans up against. All right, now, listen to this. Larry, we've got This to... is the answer. It's a tape from Captain Galt. He was out on bio-survey. He had a throat mic on. He was talking to the operator at base. Now, listen to this. emergency about. Hourglass Stella having hysterics? That's funny. I swear I parked my bucket over by those trees. Well, here anyway. Eat up some coffee for me. I'll be in in a cup. Yeah, that's funny. There's another bucket over by the tree. Where'd this one come from? Let me out. The thing's stuck. It's folding up around me. Joe. Joe, get a squad out of here. It's... Joe. That's it. That's it. I can't get out. It's, it's digestive fluid. It's... Get somebody out here before. This transmission just stopped. All right, now we're up against some organic form of life, and there should be some way to destroy it. We've already blasted a few, but we don't know how many more there are. Maybe it's an infinitely divisible substance, some kind of protoplasm. We've had over 12 casualties reported, and there's still five teams out in the field. All right, it's a lethal life form. Now, that explains why we found everything else harmless. Nothing could compete with this. We have mimic plants of our own, the uh, twisty slug on Venus, but nothing that goes this far. It can be killed, though. You said that yourself. If it can be found. You can't tell. Clothes, rugs, drapes, chairs. We can't tell which is which. We've got to try to find some poison, some spray that will destroy them wholesale. Oh, no. Oh. What's the matter? In the corner. I never noticed two briefcases over there before. There was only one, I, I think. How are we going to know? <laughs> Shortly after the final casualty report of 30 dead and 12 wounded, Major Hall sealed off the bio quarters and moved in with a team from the chem section, all dressed in corrosive resistant suits. Well, I'll make sure that you've got a tight seal on the neck joint. What are you going to do, Major? I've got a combination of hydrogen and arsenic under pressure, barsine gas. That'll give us an idea of how much they've infiltrated. Arsine is deadly to humans, so check the helmet. Now, Sergeant. I don't want any panic blasting. Our sign is inflammable. All right. Release the valve. As the gas filled the room, the first to go was a filing cabinet, which melted and oozed to the floor stars and test tubes. The lab was sealed off and a meeting held in Commander Morrison's quarters. Well, it's protoplasm, all right. You could see that when the mimic shape melted. It was just as big as your hand. It may resemble the simple unicellular protozoa. They're gigantic in size compared to microorganisms. Can we spray them? Our sign disturbed them. And I suppose enough might kill them. But we haven't got that much. We can't flood the planet. We wouldn't be able to use our blasters, and it's lethal to humans. We'll have to pull out. Stella, I'm afraid you don't quite understand. We can't take the chance of carrying them back to the system disguised as a boot or a towel or, or anything. And they seem to multiply by binary fission. It wouldn't take long to overrun Earth and the rest of the system. If we stay here, they'll pick us off one by one. We could have our sign brought in or some other poison, but that would destroy most of the other life on the planet along with it. Then we'll have to burn the planet clean. Wood? Yes, sir. Set up a call to system monitor. I'm going to get the unit off here out of danger. After that, we can work out the best way of cleaning off this planet. You'll run the risk of taking them back to Terra. Can they imitate higher life forms? Can they masquerade as humans? Apparently not. 
I seem to be limited to inorganic subjects. Then we'll go back without any inorganic material. But our clothes, they can imitate the synthetic fibers, belts, gloves, boots. We're not taking our clothes. We're going back without anything at all. Oh. Oh, I see. Get me a beam to central monitor immediately. <laughs> The nearest cruiser was two light hours away, Captain Daniel Davis commanding. Tight beam communication was established after coordinates were flashed from Central Monitor. This is Captain Davis. Can you read me? I read you. Commander Morrison here. Captain, you are to make a planet fall as soon as possible at coordinates to be supplied you. We are going to board your ship naked. Naked? That's right. That's, uh... When will you land? At about uh, 1,500 hours, I'd say. Captain, would it be possible for for your men to... Uh... I'll have my crew below decks. We'll land on robot control. Thank you. Wood, sign off the transmission. Yes, ma'am. There was some objection among the enlisted personnel, particularly in the women's quarters. The ship landed at 1,200 hours three hours sooner than expected. All hands disrobe immediately. All personnel report to field, ready to embark. So soon? I didn't hear the ship land. It's there, all right. We'd better go. Larry. Mm hmm Larry, you go ahead. I'd... I'd rather get ready alone. <laughs> Parked in the center of the landing field was a cruiser, its hull pitted and dented by meteor strikes. It lay motionless, with no sign of life aboard. A crowd of naked people was moving across the field, blinking in the bright sunlight. Commander Stella Morrison, without any sign of rank apparent, paused on the ramp and spoke to Major Lawrence Hall beside her. Larry. Yeah, what is it? I'm scared. Why? I don't know. Psychological reaction. Forget it. It's a reaction to nudity carried over from uh, early childhood. Come on, we're holding up the line. Larry, I want to go back. <laughs> Stella, look. Now, at least Davis kept his promise. There are no enlisted men lining in the hatches to enjoy the uh, view. You see? It's dark in there. There's nothing to worry about. Come on. Up you go. The last of the research team filed into the interior of the ship. And the hatch closed behind them. At exactly 1,500 hours, Captain Daniel Davis landed his ship in the center of the field. Automatic relays opened the main lock hatch and lowered the ramp. Davis and his staff sat in the control cabin waiting. Well, how do you like that? Where are they? Well, maybe the whole fool thing is a joke. We've waited an hour already. They waited. And waited. But no one came. <laughs> You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features Double Dare by Robert Silverberg, which demonstrates that pride can lead to much worse than a fall. It can put a man out on a limb and keep him there. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you Colony, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by Philip K. Dick and adapted for radio by Ernest Kenoy. Featured in the cast were Frederica Chandler, John Larkin, James Stevens, Larry Robinson, Bill Quinn, and Alan Bergman.
Your narrator was Norman Rose. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. Hear music in the Morgan Manor. Russ Morgan, live weekday mornings on NBC Bandstand. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction, presents X minus one Night story. Courtesy. This is the story of the second expedition to the planet of Lando. I'm recording it for any future expeditions which might land on this godforsaken sphere in the hope that they may learn from our tragic example. As I write, there are two of us left. Two out of an original complement of 180 men. One of us, myself, will be dead in less than 23 minutes. As for the other, heaven have mercy on him, I do not know. On June 3rd, 1997, less than two months ago, the last of our supply ships blasted off from Lando for their return to Earth. After it had gone, I remember looking out across the plain at the dead city, one of thousands that dotted this planet. It had tall, graceful buildings, atomic power systems, vacuum conveyors, all perfect, all deserted, all ominous. How had it happened? The best guess was that the plague had frightened the original inhabitants of the planet so that they'd piled into rocket ships and headed for some distant planet. I often wondered why a civilization so advanced as Landro could not find a serum to beat the plague. It had taken our Earth doctors less than six months to develop an immunization method. Well, maybe those aborigines back in the hills knew the answer. That strange, ugly little people who had taken to the caves the day we landed. I was thinking these things when something happened that gave me the shock of my life. Good evening, Captain. Oh, what brings you here, Doctor? It's the matter of the serum, sir. Oh, what about the serum? It's no good. No good? It's too old. Ten years too old. Didn't you examine it? Yes, I did, but... Well, my eyesight has been failing lately. Are you aware, Doctor, that the last supply ship has returned to Earth? Do you know we'll have no more contact for two years? I... Just, uh... How long do you give us? Well, the present immunity will last a week or so. Then, without booster shots, it's just a question of time until someone picks up the plague. After that... What about the natives? They don't die from the plague? The accepted theory is that they have developed an immunity. Well, suppose they haven't developed an immunity, Doctor. Suppose they get the disease. Then they must have a treatment for it. If they don't, there would be no natives. Would you be willing to go on an expedition to the hills to find out? At this point, Captain, I'd be willing to do anything. Absolutely anything. I... I am truly sorry. You're sorry? Dr. Morgan, sometime when you aren't too busy, when you have a moment, I'd hate to inconvenience you. Would you mind telling me how it feels to murder 180 men? 
181, including yourself. I did a lot of thinking after Dr. Morgan left my hut. It was still unreal for me. After all, the planning of an expedition was no simple thing. You put into it the result of years of training and experience, years of study at the academy, years of learning how to handle men and natives. Every man on my crew was hand-picked for his skill. And yet, a simple thing like a myopic surgeon misreading a label could blast the whole thing. Yes, it was a shame. And I did the only thing I could think of. I yelled for Bat Ears Brady. Brady! Get your carcass in here. Take the lead out. Okay, okay. Now, what's up? Sit down, Bat Ears. You got trouble, Kev? We got trouble. What? The serum's no good. What? Morgan forgot to check it. It's ten years too old. Holy jumping snails. You're going to court martial that? That wouldn't do much good. We'll all be dead pretty soon unless somebody figures something out. Well, what are you going to do, Kev? Well, there's only one chance. One chance in ten million. What? The natives. Them cave rats. What good can they do us? Well, they don't get the plague, so maybe they know a cure. Okay. Let's get a few of them and beat it out of them. That's why you're here. Hmm? Shoot. How'd you like to come along on a little expedition up to the cave country? You, me, the doctor, and uh, Faulkner. Faulkner? Now, listen, Cap, he's worse than the doctor. Yes, but he knows more about the native culture than anybody here. He's the only one who's completely familiar with the records of the first expedition. Okay, so it's me, you, the doc, and Faulkner. When do we start? Tonight, in half an hour. We should reach the cave country by tomorrow. With luck, we'll be able to find natives before night. <laughs> Benny Faulkner was the expedition anthropologist, one of the most unfortunate-looking individuals I've ever met. An ugly man with large ears and a big nose. His body was small and consumptive, but he had a good brain, and he was the best anthropologist the Interplanet Institute could recommend. He and Dr. Morgan were the only two civilians on the expedition. We set out. And after several hours, hard walking. Cap. Now, what is it? Don't look now, but very slowly turn your eyes to the right and look behind that big yellow rock. Okay. You see anything? No. Well, keep looking. Don't stop walking. Let on. Okay. Yes, it looked like a, a shadow or something. It's one of them gimpos. He's been following us now for almost an hour, dodging in and out behind the rocks. Shall I bring him in? No, not yet. Just pretend you don't see him. Tell the others, if they notice, to show no fear. There's nothing will start these simple-minded cavemen like fear. <laughs> Manuel said, Under no circumstances shall a member of the patrol display fear before a native. The dignity of the earth man must be preserved at all costs. Just before dawn, we reached the cave country. We were tired and hungry, and we stopped to cook some food and rest. Everything was quiet. There was no sign of the gimpo which had been failing us until... Okay, get in there, you sneaking little monkey man. Come on, come on, before I break this shovel on your star. Yeah, what's the trouble? Cap, I caught me one of these gimpos sneaking around outside the tent. Yeah, bring him in the light of the fire. We can get a look at him. Uh, Faulkner? Yes, sir? Keep an eye on him. Try to establish some communication. All right, get in here. Hey, look out. No need to knock him down, Batty. Oh, that's the only language they understand. Let's see if you can reach him, Faulkner. Okay, Captain. I'll need a drum of some sort. A what? Well, they have no language as we know it, and they have a very rudimentary sense of hearing. I find they communicate with one another through a very primitive kind of vibration of the tongue. The closest I can come is a series of drum beats, a sort of Morse code. The psychologist on the first expedition had it worked out before he was killed by the plague. I've studied his notes, and I think it'll work. 
You mean these little critters can talk to one another? Yes, I believe they can. At any rate, we'll have a chance to find out. Uh, do we have something I can use for a drum? Uh, here, take my water bottle. Thank you, Doctor. Now, I'll tap it three times. That's a greeting of some sort. Uh, just a moment. Yes, sir? I don't want you treating this fellow like an equal. Don't give him the idea that we're desperate. Once they sense that, you're lost. I have to communicate with him, sir. Now, just bear in mind what I said. Dignity. Yes, sir. I'll do my best, sir. It was a strange sight. On one side of the water bottle crouched little Benny Faulkner, looking for all the world like a human spider. Across from him crouched the Landrian, a humpbacked, gray little creature with an enormous head and those huge, soft lavender eyes. Every few moments, one would stop the strange tattoo of communication, and the other would take it up. I'm setting forth in this narrative the most vital part of their conversation, as Benny Faulkner later transcribed it from the best of his memory. Benny asked, Why were your cities abandoned? Was it the plague? The native said, Yes. Benny said, Do you still fear the plague? The native answered, Yes. Do any of your people become afflicted? The answer was some. How do you treat them? Silence. How can we find a cure for the plague? More silence. And then the native said, Go among my people. Then he asked, Will we find the answer among your people? And the native replied, My people have the answer. Then he said, Will you tell me the answer? The native repeated, Go among my people. As far as the Landrine was concerned, the conversation was ended. He rose to go, and Faulkner stepped from his path. But Brady was there to ensure the bet. Hold on there, bucko. You ain't going no place. I don't maltreat him, Brady. Uh, what did he say, Benny? He says his people have the answer. What do you think? Well, there may be some truth in it. He says some of his people still get the plague. That must mean it isn't a question of immunity. They must have a cure. Well, he wasn't clear on that. Then they must have a vaccine to keep it from spreading. Does he know? Well, his answer is for us to go among his people. Well, that leaves it up to us. The first level of caves is on top of that cliff about a mile ahead. It's a trap. I'll bet my last dollar on it. Well, maybe not. And we'll have to risk it. Wait. Well? Let me go. I got you all into this. But how will you talk? Benny here can give me enough of the code so I can ask the big question. You understand that they might just decide to cut your throat? I'm fully aware of the risk. All right, Doctor. You go ahead. We'll wait at the foot of the cliff. If you aren't back down in three hours, we'll come up after you. What about the Gimpo here? We'll hold him as a hostage to ensure the doctor's safety. If the doc comes back, all right, we'll let him go. If not... Well, that's your job, Brady. A pleasure. It took Dr. Morgan about an hour to pick his way up the side of the cliff to the first of the openings where the Landrians lived. He waved to us before he entered the mouth of the cave, and we waved back. And then we settled down to wait. It was a long, long wait. Eight o'clock. He's been up there more than three hours, Cap. Well, we'll give him a little more time. <coughs> it's, it's getting colder. Yes, keep that fire going. How much longer are you going to wait, Cap? Oh, well, we've got lots of time. You'd think we'd have heard of something by now if they was going to knock him off, I mean. No, not necessarily. Hey, wait. Look, up on the cliff. Well, that's him, all right. Hey, what's he running for? I don't know. He looks scared. That crazy fool, if he don't look out... Doctor! He'll... Dr. Morgan, look out! Look out! We found the doctor at the foot of the cliff, crumpled and broken. There were no marks on his body, nothing except a twisted, mocking grin on his face. Oh, yes, and one other thing. Scrawled across the pad he had taken with him on which to make notes concerning the answer was a single word. The word was courtesy. We threw the paper away. The expedition was a failure. 
though Bat Ears claimed he'd get it out of the gimple if I'd let him. I nodded in agreement, and Bat Ears took the little native off behind an outcropping of rock. He was back in 15 minutes, dripping with sweat. Well? Let's go, Cap. Nothing, huh? But nothing. Is he... Uh... They ain't made very good, these little gray people. They come apart too easy, so... Let's go, huh, Cap? All right. Now, Benny... Uh... Benny, what is it? I... I feel kind of sick. All of a sudden... In the back of my head, a... a dull kind of pain. Let me see your tongue. Uh... Come on, give him a hand, Batters. We've got to get him back to camp. What is it? I'm not sure, but that blackness on the tongue and the headache, it could be the plague. By the time we got Benny Faulkner back to camp, he had the red spots on his body, and then the fever began to rage. It was the plague, no mistake about it. Before morning, Collins, the supply sergeant, had it. Then it was Peabody. After that, the men went down like Tentons. Then one morning, Bat Ears Brady dragged himself into my tent and sat down. The lines in his face told me the end was coming pretty fast. Sit down, Brady. Okay. Well, what's the count? Six left. We buried the chaplain today. Got anything to drink? Sorry, I'm all out. Uh, how about a cigarette, then? You, you got a cigarette? Yeah, sure. Here. How's Faulkner? I don't get it. He's still alive. Still alive? Yep. In fact, he's getting better. He's sitting up. Holy mackerel. Oh, this is a good cigarette. Uh, it's like any other. No, no, no. This one's different, Cap. This is my last. What do you mean, Brady? Take a look at my tongue. See? Little black spots. Somehow I managed to get him into bed. He was already raving when I gave him the last of the morphine. It was incredible. Big, brawling, bat ears Brady, a tower of strength, lying sick and whimpering on a cot. When he died, I went out on the moors to think. The sun was a dull red glow cold breeze whipped up. But somehow I couldn't forget Faulkner. Why should Faulkner recover from a plague from which no man has ever recovered? Surely there must be a reason. Nothing happened without a reason. I turned and went back to see Benny Faulkner. Hello, Captain. Hello, Benny. How are you? Pretty good. I got up and walked a couple of steps today. How goes it? Uh, Brady's gone. Oh. I, uh, I just buried him. Listen, Benny, there must be some reason why... Well, there's nothing strange about me, nothing different from any other man. There must be. You survived the virus. Well, but... Benny, I, I want you to tell me everything you know about yourself, everything you can remember. Because somewhere in your makeup is some little thing that makes the difference. If I can find that thing then maybe I can do something to save myself and the rest. Even if I can't, at least I can leave a record for any future expedition that comes to Landro. Okay? Okay, Captain. Where should I start? At the beginning. I'm going to take notes. Well, I... I was born on the 2nd of July in 1971. My parents were ordinary people. My father was... <laughs> Captain, I, I've told you everything I can remember. Three days now you've gone over me, pawed me, questioned me. What else can I tell you? Benny, let's go over that last part once again. Where should I start? Take it from where the native started to walk away. You stepped out of his path and Brady grabbed him. Okay, so I stepped out of his path. Why? What do you mean, Why? Why did you step out of his path? Why not? Courtesy, I guess. 
What's the matter? Courtesy. That's the word that Dr. Morgan had scrawled in his notebook. Well, I don't see that... I don't either. Tell me, Benny, why should you want to be courteous to a native? Why not? What about maintaining your own dignity? Are you talking about dignity or arrogance? I don't know. Benny, listen, maybe we were all wet in our deductions. Maybe these cities here on Landro weren't deserted centuries ago. Maybe these little people up in the caves are the same people who used to live in those big cities. Why would they leave? Maybe they found out the big cities weren't the answer. Maybe they found out that civilization doesn't necessarily bring happiness. So they just packed up and left, returned to the simple life. Oh, it doesn't make sense. You're forgetting the plague. What is the plague, Benny? Well, I don't know. Is it a virus? Well, I don't think they ever found out. You know what I think? What? I think the plague is nothing more than what we know as greed and arrogance. Captain, you're going off your rocket. I think maybe we're in line to die. Serum was good. In fact, I don't think the serum had anything to do with it. Oh, I never heard anything as crazy, fantastic in my life. No? Well, I... I think I'll go back to my tent and finish writing the report. I am beginning to sweat a little. Captain, maybe it isn't the plague. It is. I've seen it too many times to kid myself about it. Maybe hot compresses or something. No, Ben. Listen, Captain, you don't don't believe that junk about courtesy, do you? I mean, that's a lot of nonsense. You must know that. Macro, Captain. You, You do believe it, don't you? Good night, Benny. I think I'd like to be alone for a while. Okay. Good night, Captain. Maybe the supply ship will be early. You can can probably stick it out. Sure. Good night, Captain. And this concludes my report. I'm turning it over to Benny Faulkner in the hopes that he will be able to transmit it to any other expedition commander who contemplates exploring the planet of Landro. The fever is beginning to mount now. My hands tremble as I write. The end should not be far off. There's little question in my mind as to what it will be. You see, I didn't have a chance. I stepped out of no paths. I showed no courtesy. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you Courtesy, adapted for radio by George Lefferts, from the story by Clifford Simad. Featured in the cast were Brett Morrison as Captain Ira Warren, Arnold Robertson as Battiers Brady, Edwin Jerome as Dr. Morgan, and Bill Griffiths as Benny Faulkner. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Ken McGregor and is an NBC Radio Network production. And now, next week... The frontier is a strange place, and a frontier is not always easy to recognize. It may lie on the other side of a simple door marked no admittance, but it is always deadly dangerous. What happens when an innocent girl ignores a single regulation? You will find out next week at X X minus minus one. one. When you buy United States savings bonds, you help to build your own future security. Here's an opportunity to save systematically for long-range personal objectives. And with their increased yield and other improvements, U.S. savings bonds are a better investment than ever before. Now here is the future, X minus one. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, 
X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X minus one. Tonight, Death Wish by Ned Lang. But first, hear this. During the theater season in New York, people flock from everywhere in the nation to see the latest Broadway plays. But very few of these people have ever been fortunate enough to experience the thrill and excitement backstage at one of Broadway's top musical comedies. Tomorrow night, Monitor invites you along as Don Russell goes backstage at the Broadway musical hit Simply Heavenly, introducing you to the cast, the author, listening to the songs from this fine musical show. It'll be an experience you won't soon forget. Then on Saturday, for sports enthusiasts, Army versus Notre Dame, and Monitor brings you this football classic direct from Municipal Stadium in Philadelphia. Add to these features Monitor's special coverage of the pomp, ceremony, and celebration during Queen Elizabeth's tour of Canada. Visits from celebrities like Mickey Rooney, Tennessee Williams, Tony Bennett, and Burl Ives, and you have some idea of the top variety of entertainment Monitor will bring you all weekend. So start your weekend right with Monitor on Friday night and stay with Monitor all weekend long over most of these same NBC radio stations. And now, X-1 and tonight's story, Death Wish. consumption normal. We'll reach point able in 10 seconds from now. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Cut. Well, gentlemen, we're on our way to Mars. Now, Mr. Ratchet, give me a 30-second warning before we reach Point Baker. Very well, Captain. Now, Mr. Watkins, what's the condition of your engines? Don't you worry about my engines. The Deidre may be a cantankerous old crate, but she's good for another five or ten round trips to Mars. You can lay to that. <laughs> Look at him, Captain. <laughs> if anybody criticizes his engines, you can actually see that walrus mustache of his bristle. Listen, Rachek, I've had about enough of these personal remarks of yours. Stick to your navigation and let me alone. Now, now, Watkins, let's not get into another of those arguments. Now, that's an order. Aye, sir. He had a reason for asking about your engines. I've made enough trips to Mars to know the way a ship should sound. There's something about this one. I don't know quite what... There's nothing wrong with this ship, Captain Summers. I'll tell you something, though, every engineer worth his salt knows. There are just two kinds of equipment. The kind that fails bit by bit, and the kind that goes all at once. When something happens to the Deidre, you'll know it right away. You won't have to ask. Well, maybe so. But I wonder if our cargo didn't shift on the takeoff. Uh, Mr. Ratchick, yes, would you be kind enough to check on it? You bet, Captain, right away. You worried about that new Ferenson computer we're carrying, Captain? Well, not worried exactly, but it's a responsibility. That thing is by far the largest, heaviest, most delicate piece of machinery ever transported in space. It's an evil thing, with its blinking eyes and scheming brain. I'll be glad to get to Marsport and get it off the ship. And so will I, Watkins, but uh, not quite for the same reason. I don't quite share your feelings about the personality of machines. That's because you don't know anything about them, Captain. I do. And I don't like that computer thing back there in the hole. All in order in the hole, boss. Cargo hasn't shifted. All right, Mr. Ratchet. Maybe I'm borrowing trouble. Hmm? Uh, 30 seconds to point Baker, sir. Very well. Uh, strap yourselves on the acceleration couches again. You sure you don't read anything, Mr. Watkins? Not a thing, sir. I'll vouch for every bit of equipment on the Deidre. Fifteen seconds to point Baker. Prepare for new acceleration. 
Engines ready for firing, sir. Ten, nine, eight. We fire seven, for exactly five seconds six, on reaching point Baker for maximum acceleration. Four, three, two, one, fire. That's fine. It didn't cut off. We're over firing. My fuel. The course will be off course. The switch doesn't respond. Emergency cut off. Hit the emergency. I can't move my arms. Acceleration. Stop it. Stop the rockets. My arms so heavy. If I could just reach. Cut off switch. There. What happened? We're on emergency lights. We blew the generator. Of all the lousy things to happen. Well, what was it? Main firing circuit effused on us. Metal fatigue, I'd say. Must have been flawed for years. When was it last checked out? Well, it's a sealed unit, Captain. It's supposed to outlast the ship. Absolutely foolproof. Unless, unless it's flawed. Now, don't go blaming it on me. Those circuits are supposed to be x-rayed, heat-treated, fluoroscoped. You just can't trust machinery. How are we on fuel? Oh, not enough to push a kitty car down Main Street. If I could just get my hands on those factory inspectors... Mr. Antic, how does this affect our course? I'm computing it now. Well, hurry it up. I'm working as fast as I can. Mr. Watkins, can we fire those rockets on manual? Sure we can. But we only have enough fuel for about a three-second burst. It'll mean a crash landing. But we'll worry about that when we come to it. Well, Mr. Ratchick? This kills us, Captain. We're going to cross the orbit of Mars before Mars gets there. How long? Too long. Captain, we're flying out of the solar system at just under the speed of light. You're listening to Death Wish, tonight's attraction on X-1. Now back to X-1 and Death Wish. Look at him. Look at how he sits there staring at nothing. Here we are, kiting off into space, and what do you do? We got a little fuel left. We can turn the ship, can't we? Look, you are a navigator, aren't you? I am, Mr. Watkins. And for your information, if I plotted my courses the way you maintain your engines, we'd be plowing into the middle of Australia right now. Why, you little company toady. At least I got my job honestly. Not by marrying the owner's daughter. Why, you dirty old now man. Stop I it, to... stop it, both of you. No more of this now. I give the orders here. All right, then give some. Tell him to plot a return curve. This is life and death. All the more reason for keeping our heads. Strachik, can you plot such a course? The first thing I tried. On the fuel we got left, there isn't a chance. Best I could do would be a degree or two. That won't help. What do you mean it won't? We'll turn back into the solar system. Sure, but the best curve we can make will take us a few thousand years to complete. What about a landfall on some other planet, uh, Neptune, Uranus? Impossible. In the first place, the right planet would have to be in the right place at the right time. And if it were, we'd need fuel, a lot of fuel, to get into a breaking orbit. And if we could, who'd come and get us? No ship has gone past Mars yet. Yeah, but maybe there'd be a chance, just a slim chance. Maybe, maybe, but we can't swing it. Gentlemen, I'm afraid we'll have to kiss the solar system goodbye. It just doesn't seem possible. Who would believe we're traveling at almost the speed of light? Look out the viewing port. You'd swear we were standing still in space. Yeah, that's because there's no reference point, as you know. I assure you, we're traveling faster than any men have ever traveled. What should we do, Captain? I don't know, Watkins. I just don't know. <laughs> Our noble captain can't face the situation. Of course I can face it. I can follow any course you plot. That's my only real responsibility. Now let's get a grip on ourselves. Mr. Radjic, suppose you raise Mars on the radio. Aye, aye, sir. Deidre to Marsport. Deidre to Marsport. Urgent. Repeat. Urgent. Come in, Marsport. Marsport to Deidre. Reach you. Over. Emergency, Marsport. Firing mechanism jammed. Fuel almost totally expended. Acceleration 15 seconds past safe maximum. Heading out of solar system. Request help. Over. Can you turn the ship, Deidre? Can you put it into any kind of an orbit? Over. No fuel, Marsport. We can only turn a degree or two. Over. What's your captain on, Deidre? Over. Captain Summers, Marsport. Over. Captain, what do you propose to do? Good Lord, man, that's what we're asking you. What do you propose to do? And say, what do you propose to do? 
What are they saying? I don't know. I couldn't catch it. Mr. Ratchet, can't you get better reception? We're rapidly running out of range, Captain. I'll give it all the gain I can get. There they are. Shut up. Deidre, what can you do for us? Over. Captain, we can't think of a thing. You could swing into any sort of orbit. We can't. I told you that. Under the circumstances, Captain, you have the right to try anything at all. Anything, Captain. Oh, that's nice of them. What do they expect us to do? Complain to the company? Lesson Marsport. Marsport, do you still read me? Over. Read you faintly. Go on, but hurry. I can think of just one thing. We could bail out in space suits as near Mars as possible. The Diana is laying over there, isn't she? You could have her pick us up. Over. Sorry, Captain. You're confused. If you left your ship, your momentum would not be affected. You and your crew would continue through space at the same rate as the ship. Over. Of course, I wasn't thinking. I have it. Send the Diana out to intersect our course. Maybe we can find some way to transfer. My navigator will help you plot the intersection. Over. They've gone again. Hello, Marsport. Hello, Marsport. Come in, Marsport. I can't bring them in again. You mean you can't do it? Why not? It is our only chance. Over. Diana's laid up, having her engines overhauled. How long before she can be spaceborne? Too long. Three weeks. Sorry, Captain. I wish we could think of something. But the only thing we can suggest... What? I didn't get it. Reception's gone again, Captain. We're getting out of range. I don't know whether I can raise them again or not. Well, try, try. Come on, maybe that suggestion is uh, What can is it? they suggest that we don't already know? Uh, even the static's getting weaker now. We only knew what they were going to say. What's the difference? They didn't really think it would work anyhow. Wait a minute. Wait, wait. Maybe something come. Hold it. Suggest. Can you hear? Suggest. Most unlikely. But try... Try calculator. Try calculate. They're gone. For good this time. I heard what he said. The calculator. Does he mean the Farrenson computer in our hole? Yes. Yes, I see what he meant. The Farrenson's a very advanced job. No one knows the limits of its potential. He suggests we present our problem to it. Ah, that's ridiculous. The problem has no solution. It doesn't seem to, but the big computers have solved other problems that seem to have no solution. Now, we can't lose anything by trying. No, not as long as we don't pin any hopes on it. That's right. We don't dare hope. Mr. Watkins, I believe this is your department. Uh, What's the use? You say don't hope, but both of you are hoping anyhow. You think the big electronic god is going to save your lives? Well, it's not. Well, we have to try, man. Who says we do? I wouldn't give it the satisfaction of turning us down. Are you implying that machines think? You bet I am, because they do. No, I'm not out of my head. Any engineer will tell you that a complex machine has a personality all its own. Do you know what that personality is like? It's cold, withdrawn, uncaring, unfeeling. A machine's only purpose is to frustrate desire and produce two problems for every one it solves. And do you know why a machine feels this way? You're hysterical. Oh, no, I'm not. A machine feels this way because it knows it's an unnatural creation in nature's domain. It wants to reach entropy and cease. It's a death wish. A mechanical death wish. Gibberish. Watkins, are you going to hook up that computer? Oh, sure. I'm human. I keep trying. I just wanted you to understand that there's no hope. I'll get it warmed up. We better watch him. He'll be all right. Maybe. He's blaming the situation on a machine personality now, trying to absolve himself of guilt. It's his fault we're in this spot. An engineer is responsible for all equipment. What's the good of blaming anybody? Uh, None, I guess. Personally, I don't much care. This is as good a way to die as any. 
better than most. Don't talk like that. Why not? Death in space is an appealing idea in certain ways. Imagine an entire spaceship for a tomb. And you, uh, you have a certain choice in how you die. Thirst, um, hunger, heat, cold... Shut up! Now that's an order. <laughs> this is your first real emergency, Captain. And you're responding like a stunned ox. Wake up! You can't live with joy. At least try to extract a little pleasure out of your die. Shut your mouth. Well, gents, your little tin god's ready and waiting. Anybody care to make a burnt offering in front of it? Have you given it the problem? Most of it. Uh, you two have to punch up your own details. Position, elapsed time from maximum acceleration, water, oxygen, food. All right. Come on, Ratchik. Did you tell it we want to return to Earth alive? Oh, yes, yes, it loves that part. <laughs> It'll get such pleasure out of rejecting the problem as unsolved. Oh, no, 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 it won't say that. It'll say uh, uh, insufficient data. And I'll punch up the rest of the information. <laughs> insufficient data. You see the point? It hints a solution is possible, but just out of reach. A subtle torture. It can keep us hoping. There. That's the complete picture. Now let's see what happens when I press this. Now just keep your eye on that red light up there. If it goes on, it means a problem is rejected. Watch it now. And if it solves it? That's a little bell, sort of like a typewriter bell. Oh, but you won't hear it, don't worry. Don't say that. What's the matter, Roderick? Superstition? Oh, shut up. You two have to keep up that everlasting wrangling. Well, not for long, Captain. We haven't much longer to live, Captain. Maybe that's good. What's that? A, a, a solution. It's found a solution. That must be a mistake. There is no solution. It's fooling us, leading us on. Now who's superstitious? Here. Here's the tape. The solution's on this. Well, what's it say? Come on, come on, read it, read it. No, not me. You read it, Captain. I won't play its fiendish game. Oh, I see. <laughs> That's fine. That's just fine. What does it say for the love of heaven? You figured a few thousand years to return to the solar system, Ratchik? Well, the computer agrees. 2,300 years, to be precise. Therefore, it has given us the formula for a longevity serum. 2,300 years? What are we supposed to do? Hibernate? Not at all. As a matter of fact, the serum does away quite neatly with the need for sleep. For 2,300 years, gentlemen, we three sit here in this little ship and look at each other. 2,300 years of that. Yeah. Yeah, that's just the sort of thing a machine would do. Fred Collins again, and I'll have another word for you about X-1 in a moment. That how you feel, blue and miserable with a deep down cold? Listen. Every second someone takes it for the miseries of a cold. Millions more take promo quinine. Every second someone takes it for the miseries of a cold. Promo quinine. More people have taken more bromoquinine cold tablets for more complete relief than any other cold tablet ever sold. You could use aspirin or cough syrups or nose drops all day and not get bromoquinine's relief. Bromoquinine works to relieve stopped up nose, body aches, fever, irregularity, the blues, and headache too. Yes, more complete relief for even virus colds. For bromoquinine is the only cold tablet sold with wonder working quinine and five medicines health fortified with vitamin C. Remember, every second someone takes it for the miseries of a cold. Millions more take bromoquinine. Get bromoquinine brand cold tablets. You have just heard X-1 presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features You Were Right, Joe, by J.T. McIntosh, the story of a time traveler who, going into the future, hardly expected to encounter a Neanderthal man. Read it in Galaxy Magazine, 
on your newsstand today. X-1 has brought you Death Wish, a story written by Ned Lang and adapted for radio by William Welch. Featured in our cast were Ralph Camargo as Watkins, Maurice Tarplin as Captain Summers, Walter Black as Ratchek, and Joseph Bell as the radioman. This is Fred Collins speaking. X-1 was directed by George Boutsas and is an NBC Radio Network production. There's excitement in the air at night, and Nightline brings it to you. Hear Nightline with Walter O'Keefe next on most of these NBC stations. In just a moment, X minus one. But first, no one can deny that spring is in the air, and to prepare for the new season, NBC's weekday brings you some timely and useful features. One is a new series with Phil and Ampey on gardening tips for both city and country dwellers. A second feature brings you hints for the best use of leisure time. And you can also bet that Joe Copeland, famous dress designer, will enlighten you on the spring fashion picture when she appears on tomorrow's show. Listen in and hear it all on NBC's weekday tomorrow morning. And now stay tuned for X-1 on NBC. <laughs> Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X minus one. one, one, one. Tonight's story, A Gun for Dinosaur, by L. Sprague de Camp. Uh, just whiskey, please. No soda. Ice, Mr. Rivers? <laughs> Good heavens, no. I have been in America for some time, but not that long. Well... To a fine dinosaur. Well, now, uh, just a moment, Mr. Seligman. I won't take you hunting late Mesozoic dinosaur. Why not? How much do you weigh? About nine stone? 130 pounds. Yeah, I thought so. That's not heavy enough. But your advertisement. You said safaris arranged to any time well, period. Well, I'll take you to any period in the Cenozoic. I'll get you a shot at any intelodont or even mammoth or mastodon. They have fine heads. But I'll jolly well not take you to the Jurassic or the Cretaceous. You're just too small. But what's my weight got to do with it? Now, look here, old boy. What did you think you were going to shoot those dinosaurs with? Well, I... Well, uh, look over I... here in this case. That's my own gun, a Continental 600. That shoots a pair of Nitro Express cartridges the size of bananas. It's designed for knocking down elephants, not just wounding them, but knocking them base over apex. Well, now, I've handled guns. No. Uh -huh. Look, I've been guiding hunting parties for over 20 years. But I've never known a man your size who could handle a 6 naught naught. It knocks him over. Well, people have killed elephant with lighter guns, even a 375. Oh, yes, but consider an elephant weighs, well, let's say from four to six ton. You're planning to shoot reptiles weighing two to three times as much as an elephant. Now, I tell you, Mr. Seligman, I won't take anybody hunting dinosaur who can't handle a 6 naught naught. Look, let's pour another drink and I'll tell you why. You see, I went into the partnership with the Raja about five years ago. I call him that because he's the hereditary monarch of Janpur. It means nothing, of course. We both wanted to do a bit of hunting again. And Africa's all played out. It's too civilized now. So when we heard of Professor Prohaska's time machine at Washington University, we caught the next plane to St. Louis. 
The foundation administering the machine had worked out an arrangement splitting the time between scientific parties and hunters who wanted to try their luck at prehistoric game. <laughs> hunters paid through the nose, of course, to support the project. Well, it was about our fifth safari that Courtney James showed up. He's what you chaps call a playboy, a big bloke, handsome in a way, florid, beginning to turn to fat. He was on his fourth wife. And when he showed up at the office with a blonde, I assumed that this was the fourth Mrs. James. And he left her in the outer office and corrected my assumption. Bunny? Oh, no, she's not my wife. My wife is in Mexico, I think, getting a divorce. But Bunny here would like to go along. I'm sorry. Uh, we don't take ladies. Not to the late Mesozoic. If she wants to go, she'll go. She skis and flies my airplane, so why shouldn't there she... There are enough risks at 85 million B.C. without adding to them. I'm sorry, but it's uh, against the firm's policy. Now, look here. I'm paying you a lot of money. I'm entitled... You can't hire me to do anything against my best judgment. Now, if that's how you feel, get another guide. All right, all right. But let me tell you. No, oh, it ended with my telling him to get out of the office or I'd throw him out. And I was thinking sadly of all that lovely money that James would have paid me. When in came another side, an August Holtzinger, a slim, bald chap with glasses. Mr. Rivers, I don't want you to think I'm here under false pretenses. I'm really not much of an outdoorsman, and I'll probably be scared to death when I see a real dinosaur. <laughs> oh, well, most of us are frightened at first, but uh, it doesn't do to speak of it. Well, you see, I've always run a grocery store till my uncle died, and, uh, well, I've got a great deal of money now. Uh -huh. And I'm building a new house. I'm engaged, you know, getting married, and, uh, well, I'm determined to hang a dinosaur head over my fireplace or die in the attempt. A ceratopsian, I think. That's the one with the big horned head and the frill over the neck, isn't it? Well, uh, you want to think twice about that, you know. If you put a seven-foot triceratops head into a small living room, there's uh, apt to be no room left for anything else. I know it's ridiculous, but I'm determined to do something big for once. Since there's no more real big game hunting, I'm going to shoot a dinosaur and hang his head over my mantle. I'll never be happy otherwise. <laughs> The Roger and I decided to make it to the Middle Cretaceous. That's about uh, oh, 85 million years ago. It's the best period for dinosaur in Missouri. So we drove Holtzinger into the country to let him try the six naught naught. It's rather heavy. Look, you look out. There's quite a kick. Well, couldn't you fire it prone? Oh, not a gun that big. There's not enough give. You'd break your shoulder. All right. Uh, take the safety off. Uh, like this? Oh, yeah. Uh, take my hand. I'll help you up. Uh, I... All right, thank you. I, I think I'd better try something smaller. Well, he took a fancy to my Manchester 70, chambered for a 375 Magnum cartridge. That's a little light for elephant, and very definitely light for dinosaur, but we were in a hurry. And then, of course, just before we were ready to trek, James showed up and apologized for insulting me. He'd had a run-in with the girl, and he wanted to go along. And so we were off on safari. You all ready, gentlemen? Why, yes, I suppose so. Uh, Mr. Holtzinger, you've met my partner, the Raja of Janpur. Uh, how do you do, sir? How do you do? Well, shall we get cracking? Uh, after you, Mr. Holtzinger. Uh, Mr. James. Oh, thank you. Let's get going. All set. Well, you'll slam the hatch and off we go. What happens? Uh, nothing till the force field is built up. Ah, there she goes. What happened to the lights? Well, there's no current while we're in transition. I don't feel well. <laughs> there's usually a touch of vertigo. I shouldn't worry about it. Look, what do you shoot for? I mean, with dinosaur. What is the best shot? Well, you don't try for his brain, you know. They don't have any. Well, to be exact, they have a little bump about the size of a tennis ball on the top of their spines. And you're not likely to hit it when it's embedded in a six-foot skull. Uh, try for the heart. They have big hearts over 100 pounds. An exploding shell in the heart will slow them down, at least. Oh, oh, I see. Why do we have to go so far for a game? Why couldn't we just go back 50 years and shoot lions in Africa? Well, the machine won't work more recently than 100,000 years ago. Why? Well, uh, look, I'm no four-dimensional expert on the subject, but it, it has something to do with what they call time paradox. You know, if 
people could go back to recent times, they might do something to affect history or, or kill their own grandfather, you know. And there's also some kind of taboo about sending people back to the same time again. Oh, there's paradoxes. Mustn't have them. What would happen? I'm not sure, but the university isn't taking chances. They've got about a, a billion years to cover. They won't run out of ears. Hello? Here we go. Oh, cheers, eh? Well, that's done it. April 24th, 85 million years B.C. Now then, careful. Uh, keep the safety on your gun. And don't shoot unless I give the word. Why? Why should we have to wait for you? Because I'm responsible for everything you do. Especially if something goes wrong. I say, Roger, open the door, will you? In this period, the time chamber materializes on top of a rocky rise. At the west, you see the arm of the Kansas Sea that reaches across Missouri and the big swamp where the sauropods live. To the east, the land slopes up to a plateau. It's good for ceratopsians. But the finest thing about the Cretaceous is the climate. It's, it's balmy like the South Sea Islands. And not so muggy as the Jurassic. Oh, we sent the time chamber back off and looked about. It was spring, with the dwarf magnolias in bloom all over. Down towards the Kansas Sea, cycads and willows grew, while the uplands were covered with screw pins and ginkgo. Yeah, well, I'm no ruddy poet, but I, I can appreciate a beautiful scene. Well, I was looking through the haze and sniffing the air. I got him! I got him! What the devil is... You see it? There it goes! Confound it, you idiot! I told you not to shoot without word from me. And what happened? An onithermine wandered out of the cops. Mr. James gave him both barrels. Miss. Now, look here, James. One of the biggest dangers on a safari is trigger-happy sides who get panicky. You're not to shoot unless you're told. You understand? Who do you think you are to tell me when to shoot my own game? Now, look here. Firstly... If you shoot off all your ammunition before the trip is over, your gun won't be available in case of a pinch. And secondly, if you empty both barrels, what would happen if a big theropod should charge before you could reload? And finally, it's not sporting to shoot everything in sight. Is that clear? All right. All right. Well, now then, first task is fresh meat. As I told you, uh, Holtzinger wanted a ceratopsian head. James insisted on a tyrannosaur. Then everybody would think that he'd shot the most dangerous game. Well, the fact is, this tyrannosaur's overrated. But everybody's read about the tyrant lizard, and, well, he does have the biggest head of the theropods. Oh, and he'll snap you up if he gets the chance, no fear. Well, we started off searching for meat. The Raja and I put the sides in front. Yeah, we tell them it's so that they'll get the first shot, which is true, but uh, another reason is that they're always tripping and falling with their guns cocked, and if the guy were in front, he'd get shot. Boneheads. Where? See? Crouching over there. Feeding on those psychids. He's about the size of a man. They look intelligent. Oh, not likely. That bulge on the head is solid bone. Now then, hold on there, James. You've had your shot for the day. Hold your fire until Holzinger shoots. Yeah, sure, sure. All right, go ahead, Mr. Holzinger. It doesn't matter which one. No, here. Try that one by the rock. There's a good clear shot. Well, take your safety off. Oh. Go ahead now. Well? Shh. I'm nuts. I've had enough of this. James, don't... I got him clean right through the heart. First shot. How's that? I thought you were going to give Holzinger the first crack. It's his turn. Well, I waited. Took so long, I thought he'd gotten buck fever. Very well. But if this sort of thing happens once more, we leave you at camp the next time we go out. The next couple of days, we trekked around the neighborhood and then headed over to the sauropod swamp, over to the west. We were staked out along the edge of the lake, watching a big beggar out in the swamp waving his head about. And they're the big ones. It looks something like the brontosaur. Can't we shoot him? I wouldn't. Why not? Well, there's no point to it, and it's not sporting. Look, if you kill one in the water, he sinks and can't be recovered. And if you kill one on land, 
Well, the only trophy is that little head on the top of that long neck. You can't bring that whole beast back because he weighs 30 tons or more. That museum in New York got one. Oh, yes. Well, they sent a party of 48 to the early Cretaceous with a 50 caliber machine gun. They spent two solid months hacking and sawing the carcass apart and hauling it to the time machine. I know the chap on the project, and he still has nightmares in which he smells decomposed dinosaur. And they also had to kill a dozen big sauropods who came in for the party. And then they had them lying around, too. They lost three men. Reggie, Duck Bill, where? Where are they? Up there at the shoreline. Now, keep your voices down. You see? With a crest on the back of their heads. Mr. Rivers, I've been thinking over what you said about those heads. If I could get one of those duck bills, I'd be satisfied. It'd look big enough over my mantle, wouldn't it? <laughs> I'm sure of it, old boy. Well, let's be off. Roger, you wait here with Mr. James. Shouldn't take us long. Holt and I crept along the shoreline, narrowing the range to the duck bills. I think I can make the shot from here. I'll be ready in a minute. My shoe is loose. He's getting away. I, I won't get a shot. I'm afraid Mr. James has fired both barrels again. James, that's the second time you spoiled my shots. I ought Don't to... Don't be a fool. I couldn't let them wander into camp stamping everything flat. There was no danger to that. You can see that the water is deep offshore. It's just that our trigger-happy Mr. James can't see any animal without shooting. And if it did get close, all you have to do is to throw a stick of firewood at it. They're perfectly harmless. Well, how was I to know? I believe I mentioned it. Well, what are we on this miserable trip for except to shoot things? There are certain rules, you know. You call yourselves hunters. I'm the only one who is hitting anything. Now, just a moment, old man. You're behaving like a confounded skite with more money than brains. I should never have brought you along. Well, that's how you feel. Give me some food and I'll go back to the base by myself. Now, don't be a bigger ass than you can help. That's quite impossible. All right, I'll go alone. I wouldn't want to pollute your air with my presence. Well, yeah, that's an attractive thought, Reggie, but we can't let him go. He'll get lost or starve. All right, I'll go after him. Well, we stumbled along for several more days, James on his good behavior for a change. And on the 1st of May, we broke camp and headed north to the hills. Well, it was hot and sticky. And we were soon panting and sweating like horses when I picked up the smell of carrion and heard the thrumming of the flies. We found a huge ceratopsian lying dead in a little hollow on the edge of the copse. He must have weighed six or eight tons alive. Why couldn't I have gotten him before he died? That would have made a darn fine head. Look, on your toes, chaps. The sauropod that's been at this carcass is probably nearby. How do you know? You see how the hide's been ripped off and the bones are scattered? Sauropods will hang around a carcass like this for weeks, gorging and then sleeping their meals off for days at a time. What do we do? Well, that's what we came after. Look, Roger, you take Mr. James through that way, and we'll parallel you 40 feet distant. Now keep your eyes open. It'll be hard to see in these woods unless you're right on top of him. We pushed through the edge of the copse, looking for the huge flesh-eater who'd been at the carcass. I could hear James and the Rajah pushing ahead on my right. We were separated by a gully when I heard a noise ahead on our left. What is it? I don't know. Take the safety off your gun. Oh, there it is. It's one of those boneheads. Oh, well, they're not dangerous at any rate. But be careful. That sauropod might still be around. I've got him! Got him clean! Well, he's done it again. He shot the bonehead. I've got him! Look out! Look out! Tyrannus Hall! The Tyrannosaur heaved his head out of the shrubbery just in front of us. Look, the scientists can insist that Rex is bigger than Trionchies, but I'll swear that this Tyrannosaur was bigger than any Rex ever hatched. It must have stood 20 feet high and been 50 feet long. I could see its big, bright eye and six-inch teeth. He'd been sleeping off his last meal, and James fired off both barrels over his head at the bonehead and woke the Tyrannosaur up. Get back! 
Get back, you fool! Gun's empty and Roger can't get a shot. Found it. There goes the beast in behind those ferns. Holtzinger! Uh, Holtzinger! Come back! Your gun's too light for that beggar! James came bolting back in a panic and blundered into the Raja, sending both of them sprawling under the ferns. The Tyrannosaur came after them to snap them up. Holsinger began to blaze away. He got off three shots through the beast's body with that little light gun. The Tyrannosaur whirled around to see what was stinging it. The jaws came open and the head swung around and down again. Holsinger got off one more shot and tried to leap to one side. The Tyrannosaur continued its lunge and caught him in its jaws as he fell. Reggie! Reggie! Stand clear! Hart! Hart's the only chance! It's no use! There he goes! Try a long shot! Ah, no. I missed him clean. Poor Holtzinger. Well, that's the end. He stopped screaming. Did you notice? Oh, yes. Well, I expect we'd best track the beast. He, he might be dying. We should try to recover Holtzinger's remains. Yes, there's nothing else to do. No, nothing. It's a bad show all round. An hour later, we gave up and went back to the glade looking very dismal. Where have you two been? We were occupied. The late Mr. Holsinger. Remember? You shouldn't have gone off and left me. None of those things might have come along. Isn't it bad enough to lose one hunter through your stupidity? What? Sure, you put us in front of you so if anybody gets eaten, it's one of us. That's... You stinking little swine. If you hadn't been a first-class idiot and blown those two barrels again, this never would have happened. Holtzinger died trying to save your worthless life. And I wish he'd failed. Why, well, I ought to... <coughs> now then, my lady buck, I'm glad you did that. It gives me a chance I've been waiting for. <coughs> now get up. And I'll be glad to finish off. You won't finish anybody off. All right, put your hands up. Both of you. Put that gun away. Don't be an idiot. I won't let anybody do that to me. You can't get away with murder. Why not? Won't be much left to you after you're hit with a 600 explosive shell. Nobody could prove anything. They can't hold you for a murder 85 million years old. The statute of limitations, you know. Nice work, Roger, old chap. Yes. Uh, cr Cretaceous rock. Doesn't quite have the balance of a cricket ball, but... It's a bit harder. What? Well, suppose we tie this chap up and uh, take him back to camp. When the time transition chamber finally arrived, we fell over one another getting into it. We dumped James in a corner and threw the switches. You two should have killed me back there. Why? You don't have a particularly good head. You wouldn't look at all well over a mantle. You can laugh. But I'll get you someday. <laughs> yeah, close quarters, isn't it? Someday I'll find a way. I'll find a way and I'll get off scot-free, too. My dear chap, if there was some way to do it, I'd have you charged with Holtzinger's murder. Look, you'd best let well enough alone. No, no, I'll kill you. Both of you. Somehow. Oh. Cigarette, Roger. Thanks. When we came out in the present, we handed him his empty gun, and off he went. We paid everybody off, <laughs> found that we were broke. But quite luckily, a steel manufacturer turned up who wanted a mastodon head for his den. Well, we were standing in the laboratory at the university waiting for the time chamber. Uh, the technician, he's a, a bookish chap, a theoretical, a temporal physicist, was watching his dials and scopes. Oh, uh, by the way, Mr. Rivers, you just missed him. Hmm? Missed who? That last client of yours, Mr. James. <laughs> well, that's good luck. 
Well, what was he doing here? Oh, he told me quite a tale. Said he'd lost his wallet back there. Said it contained some very valuable papers. Gosh. It must have been valuable. He paid the university fee of $5,000 for the use of the chamber. He's on his way back there now. Back where? Well, he, he told me to send him back a few minutes before you arrived the last time. Then he could see himself drop the wallet. <laughs> He's going to stand there and watch himself come out. Yeah, but um, doesn't that create what you chaps call a, a paradox? Uh, what happens when a man tries to occupy the same time twice? No, well, we don't know. It's never been tried before. Well, we tried to warn him, but he insisted. Yes, I know. He's a headstrong chap. Still, you wouldn't think he'd chance it just for the sake of a wallet. Was he armed? Yes. He had a 375 Express. 375? Well, that's odd. He knows it's too light for dinosaurs. Yes, but not too light for a man. I say, Roger, you don't think Mr. James is lurking behind a bush back there until we show up again? And planning to pot it as we step out? That's impossible. We already did step out of the chamber and nothing happened. Yeah, but that was before Mr. James was waiting with an express rifle cocked. Hey, Doctor? But you mean he's, he's planning to murder the two of you? I wouldn't be a bit surprised. I, uh, I don't suppose there's anything you could do to stop the process now. No, it's too late. The chamber's in transition now. Look, hadn't you better get out of here before he kills you? Well, there's no point in running. If Mr. James's theory is right, uh, we've both been dead for 85 million years. We might as well wait and see what happens. Transition point coming up. Well, it's been quite a world up to this point. Hey, Roger? Yes, quite. Here it goes. Reggie, are you all right? Uh, well, I seem to be. What happened? The time chamber. It's back. We'd better get it open. <gasps> Good Lord, look at that. Ghastly, isn't it? Where did it come from? I'm not sure. But I rather think it came from the Middle Cretaceous era. It wasn't here a moment ago. Ghastly mess. Looks as if every bone was pulverized and every blood vessel burst. I dare say. But that's his gun, all right. It's James, there's no doubt of it. So, that's the story, Mr. Seligman. Of course, I don't understand the mathematics, but the idea is rather easy to grasp. Nobody had shot us when we first emerged on the 24th of April, 85 million BC. And so, of course, that couldn't be changed. The instant James started to do anything that would make a paradox, the space-time forces snapped him forward and ripped him to bits. Well, they know a good deal about that now, and there's a safety margin of 500 years between each trip. You can't have paradoxes, you know. It just isn't done. And you see, I'm a lot more careful now. I shouldn't have taken James when I knew what a spoiled, unstable sort he was. Or Holtzinger either, when I saw that he was too small to shoot a dinosaur gun. With a heavier gun, he'd probably have knocked the Tyrannosaur down and saved his own life. So, Mr. Seligman, that's why I won't take you to that period to hunt. I'm sorry, but you're just too light. You're not big enough to handle a gun for dinosaur. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features the story of a man who develops a spaceship that travels so fast that its pilots vanish mysteriously into thin air. Read the Vaughn Shelton story, Point of Departure, in Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand now. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you A Gun for Dinosaur, a story from the pages of Galaxy, written by L. Sprague de Camp, patent consultant and one of our leading authors of science fiction. It was adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Featured in the cast were Alistair Duncan, Wendell Holmes, John Gibson, 
Donald Buca, Warren Parker, and Alan Hewitt. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. Let's visit lovable Fibber McGee and Molly tonight on the NBC Radio Network. In just a moment, X-1. But first, if you're planning to join the family for this holiday weekend, remember you have a friend who will keep you company through the long hours on the road. That friend is your car radio, and it brings you a full weekend of the most stimulating variety entertainment when you tune in to NBC's Monitor. Yes, you set your dial just once for hours and hours of refreshing variety. News as it happens, sports coverage, everything from baseball to skin diving, interviews with the stars, plus lots of the relaxing music you like to hear. It's all on Monitor this weekend. And now stay tuned for X-1 on NBC. Countdown for blast off. X-5, 4, 3, 2, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X minus one. Tonight's story, A Pail of Air, by Fritz Leiber. It was pretty quiet in the nest. Pa was just sitting by the fire, staring into it like he does these days. And Ma was asleep. That's why it was so quiet. Ma has some pretty bad times when she just screams and screams and huddles back against the blankets that line the nest. Sis was looking at herself in the mirror that hangs next to the bookshelf. I don't know what she finds to look at so long, but then she's a girl. She just looks at herself. Saturdays, when Pa puts a couple of extra lumps of coal on the fire and we take a bath, she looks at herself in the mirror and sometimes she cries. I dropped the book I was reading, and I guess that woke Ma. Huh? Uh, what? Pa? Pick up the book, bud. I'm sorry, Pa. It's come back. Hasn't it, Alfred? It's come back. It was just Bud. He dropped his book. Oh, but it's come back. It's... Why, well, it's out there now, isn't it? I, I feel a lot warmer. No, Ethel. It's... It's up there in the sky. Just the way it always was. I know. I... I had a dream, Alfred. I know, dear. Sis, melt your mother a cup of water. I'm combing my hair. Sis. Oh, all right. I've got to get up. I... I know it's there. There'll be crocuses. And the spring bulbs. And daffodils. What are daffodils, Ma? Well, buddy, they're... Oh, they're a flower. And they're very pretty. Yellow. On a tall green stalk. Oh, I want to go out. I, I want to take the children out. All right now, Ethel. Here's some water. Come on, children. We'll all go out and you can play in the sun. Sure, Ma. Here, drink the water, Ma. Cold, Alfred. You rap on the pipes and make that super send up some more heat. What's a super, Pa? It doesn't matter, Bud. There aren't any anymore. Oh. Pa, the pail's running low. Bud, you better get into your things and go out and get an extra pail of air. There are a couple of pails behind the first blankets. Go on, get into your things. <laughs> it isn't back, is it? No, it isn't. There's no sun in the sky. No sun, is there? No, Ma. What 
was it like? The sun. Sis, don't get your ma upset. The sun was yellow. And so bright you couldn't look at it. Burning hot. So hot. But when you stretched out in it, it made you feel warm all over. Tingly warm. It's been so long since I've been that warm. I was warm last year on my birthday when Pa put all that extra coal on. And then every morning it would come out of the east, make the clouds all pink and yellow, and the mist would rise in the ground, and then slowly everything would glow warmer, warmer. And then it would be up there in the sky, shining, warm. Hurry up, bud. I'm almost ready, Pa. I want the sun. I want the sun there. Alfred, get me the sun. It's gone, Ethel. There's nothing I can do. For Christmas? On my birthday? Go ahead, bud. Take the big pail and get it full this time. There's no sense in taking the trip for only half a bucket of air. Oh, I spilled it the last time. It's done. Go ahead, bud. Strap down the helmet, will you, sis? For goodness sake, stand up straight. Okay. All right, I'll be right back. Don't hold the blankets open too long. All right, Ethel. We're all safe. Bud will be right back with another pail of air. It's all right. <laughs> I went through the 30 or so blankets that Pa hung up to slow down the air escaping from the nest. Of course, I knew the way. I've been going out for air since I was a kid. Still, I get a funny, crawly feeling every time I go out of the nest. You gotta go up to the fifth floor, which is just above the blanket of frozen air. You see, when the earth got cold, all the water in the air froze first and made a blanket about 10 feet thick or so. And then down on top of that dropped all the crystals of frozen air making another blanket 60 or 70 feet thick. I came out of the window we use on the fifth floor and started to scoop up the air into my pail. I had it about full. Boy, my fingers are getting pretty cold. But I saw something. Hey, that's a light. Oh, darn it, I kicked over the bucket. Oh, there can't be a light. I'm not moving around in a window like that. There can't be. Ma and Pa and Sis are back in the nest. I'm up here, and, and there can't be anyone else. Everybody on Earth is dead except us. I had an idea how Ma must feel sometimes, the way she sees things. But there it was, moving around in the building across the way. I stood there shaking, and I almost froze my feet. I did frost my helmet so solid on the inside I couldn't see anything. So I hurried up and scooped up another bucket of air and headed back for the nest as fast as I could. Pa! Pa, I saw something! Go on, hang those outside clothes up by the fire. Phew! Pa, I saw something I did! Mother's quiet now. Don't upset her. Pa, it, it was a light. Well, wait till I get this air next to the fire. Uh, give me the cloth, sis. Shall I put another lump of coal on, Pa? No, no, no. The oxygen from this bucket will get the fire up when it begins to melt. There. Pa, I'm trying to tell you I saw something up there. Light. There's lots of light. Stars. I know what stars look like, Dopey. They're big, steady white lights in the sky. This was down here in a building. What is it? Alfred, what is it? Nothing, nothing, Ethel. Now, what is this, bud? Well, first I thought it was a lady, a young lady. <laughs> I mean it. Like in one of those old magazines. I thought I saw it in a window. But then all I saw was a light. You watched it for some time, son? Long enough for it to pass five windows and go to the next floor. And it didn't look like stray electricity? No, Pa, I know what that looks like. Or a star refracted through an icicle? Sometimes if you catch it at the right angle... It... Pa, honest, I never saw anything like it before. Huh. All right. I'll go out with you and you show me. No, no, Alfred. You can't go and leave us alone, not both of you. It's all right. We'll be right back. 
Here's your helmet, Pop. There, there's something out there. I've always known there was something out there waiting to get us. <clears throat> Hand me my glove. Something that's part of the cold. Hates all warmth. Wants to destroy the nest. Been watching us all this time. Now, now it's coming after us. And it'll get you. And then it'll come for me. Oh, don't go. Alfred, please don't go. Everything will be all right. Now, sis. Yes, Pa? You come watch the fire. Keep an eye on that air, too. If it gets too low or doesn't seem to be boiling fast enough, get another bucket behind the blanket. Alfred, don't go. I'll take care of it, Pa. Could there really be anybody out there? I don't see how. We heard the last radio voices a year before Bud was born. There hasn't been anything since then. Then what could it be? I don't know. Probably just a reflection. An ice crystal cracking. Come on, Bud. Get your helmet on. It's funny. When I go out alone, I'm not scared or anything. But when I go out with Pa, I always hang on to his belt like I used to when I was a little kid. Habit, I guess. It's the same no matter what trip we take. On the fifth floor, we stopped to rest just before we went out. We were in the room with the frozen people. The lady sitting looking at the door. The man holding his hands over that funny metal thing Pa calls a radiator. It was like a fire, I guess, but I don't see any place for the cold. We put our helmets together so we could talk. Catch your breath, son. Pa, would it be possible... I mean, for any of the frozen people to come to life? Like the ones down in the basement around the furnace when we go for water? No, they're dead. They were caught too quickly when it happened. Oh, Pa, how do we know we're the only ones? No, we don't, but... Well, there's a feeling you get. Because it's always night. There used to be some of that feeling every night in the old days. But the sun chased it away every morning. You wouldn't know about that. You weren't born when the dark star pulled us away from the sun. You wouldn't know unless you'd seen the sun. I I've seen the sun. It's that big star at the end of the Big Dipper. I've seen it. It isn't the same. Come on. We're wasting time. I don't know what the city looked like in the old days, but now it's beautiful. The starlight lets you see it pretty well. We're up on a hill, and the plain slopes down away from us. Some taller buildings push up out of the feathery plain, topped by rounded caps of air crystals. Some of them are on a slant because a lot of the buildings are badly twisted by the quakes and everything when the dark star pulled the earth away from the sun. That's why Pa can't seal up the nest airtight. The building's twisted too bad. Besides, we have to keep the chimney open. We touched our helmets together so we could talk. Is that where you saw it, son? It, it isn't there anymore. Uh-huh. But it feels different. I mean, as if there's something out here waiting. Bud, if you see something like that again, don't tell the others. Huh? Well, why not? Well, your ma's sort of nervous these days, and... We owe her all the feeling of safety we can give her. Once it was when your sister was born, I was ready to give up and die, but your mother kept me trying. Another time, she kept the fire going a whole week all by herself when I was sick. She couldn't do that now. Not the way she is. But you know that game we sometimes play, tossing a ball around? Well, courage is like a ball person can hold it only so long and then he's got to toss it to someone else. When it's tossed your way, you've got to catch it and hold it tight and hope there'll be someone else to toss it to when you get tired of being brave. Yeah, I guess so. Come on, we'll fill up the pails and get back. But what about whatever it is out here? We'll just have to wait and see. Come on, before the helmets frost over. It's 
pretty hard to hide your feelings in the nest. I mean, there's just room for the four of us. The blanket overhead just touches when Pa stands up straight. The floor is all covered with thick, woolly rugs. Pa says it's inside a much bigger room, but I've never seen the real walls or ceiling. Well, anyway, Pa laughed and kidded about what I'd seen. He said I had an imagination, but we could tell he took it serious. It was Sunday morning by the clocks that Pa kept all wound up on the shelf. So it was time for the story. We all sat around in a circle the way we always do. Except I noticed that Pa casually took a hammer from the shelf and put it beside him. I always liked the story. Of course, Sis and I know it by heart for now. I mean, every Sunday since we were kids. But every once in a while, Pa surprises us by telling it a little different. Or throwing in some extras. It starts out with a song. Ma used to sing it, but she forgets the words sometimes. And now Pa sings it mostly. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, thy purple mountain majesties above the fruited plain. Of course, the words don't mean anything. I mean, the skies are spacious enough, but there aren't any waves of grain. And the plain is all covered with a blanket of frozen air. But it's part of the story ceremony, and Pa likes it. He says it reminds him of the old days. After the song, Pa starts the story. In the days of my youth, the sun hung above, golden and warm. And the earth was fruitful and multiplied, and the fields were green. And the day was glorious. And the wind blew across the hilltops. And the air was free and good to breathe. That's the part of the story I like best. About how it was with the sun nice and warm. It's hard to believe all those people living without having to worry about cold and air. They were waking up sweating and screaming because you dreamed the fire went out. It's impossible to believe, but Pa was a good storyteller, and he made it seem real. And then the dark star came rushing out of space. In the beginning, they tried to keep the news from the people, but when the floods and the earthquakes started, the truth came out. At first, they thought the dark star would hit the sun, and then they were afraid it would strike the earth itself. But it didn't. It only came close. Pa tells it like the sun and the dark star fought for the earth like two dogs over a bone. I know what he means, because I've seen a picture of a dog in a magazine. And then the dark star won and carried us off. But the sun kept the moon. There were earthquakes and floods. Pa says that mountains fell and oceans slopped over. Oceans, that's, that's a lot of melted water lying around loose. It's hard to imagine. But Pa says it was so. Then came the open question time in the story. Sis asked a question about what girls wore for clothes. And I asked Pa how people acted in those days when the earth was twisted and jerked almost apart. Well, bud, I was too busy to notice much. A friend of mine, Dr. Weisbrot, and Kelly, the geophysicist, and Walters, the astronomer, we knew what was going to happen. And we were working to fix up a place with airtight walls and insulation and big supplies of food and bottled air. But the place got smashed up in the earthquakes and... they were all killed. So I put the nest together at the last minute in the living room of our apartment. It's a four-room apartment. You must have seen some of the people... Like the frozen ones downstairs? At that time, Bud, I only thought of one thing. Your mother and survival. If I had stopped to think, I wouldn't have even tried to make the nest. It would have seemed ridiculous. Blankets and a cold fire against the cold and vacuum of space. But I didn't think. I survived. I wasn't listening carefully as Pa went on about the building of the nest. 
I kept thinking about something else. About that light I'd seen outside. I kept asking myself, what if the frozen people were coming to life? What if they were like the liquid helium that curls toward heat when it should be frozen solid? What if something were coming from the dark star to get us? Something making the frozen people move, not by themselves. That would fit with what I'd seen. A young lady's face and the moving light. I sat there and shivered, thinking of the frozen people with, with minds from the dark star creeping, crawling, snuffing their way, following the heat to the nest. And then, over from beyond the blankets, I thought I heard a tiny noise. So I asked myself then, what's the use of going on? Why prolong a doomed existence of hard work and cold and loneliness? The human race is done. The earth is done. Why not give up, I asked myself. And then I did hear the noise, louder this time. A kind of shuffling tread coming closer. And then I got the answer. The earth's always been a lonely place millions of miles from the next planet. And no matter how long the human race might have lived, the end would have come some night. Those things don't matter. What matters is that life is good. There's a lovely texture, like some rich cloth or fur, or the petals of flowers, crocuses, daffodils, or the fire's glow. And that's as true for the last man as the first. Still, those steps kept shuffling closer. Pa was talking and Ma was dreaming with her eyes closed. And Sis was looking at herself sideways in the mirror. And I was the only one who heard the noise. The noise outside. So right then and there I told myself that I was going on as if we had all eternity ahead of us. I'd have children and I'd teach them all I could. I'd get them to read books, try to enlarge and seal the nest. I'd try to keep everything beautiful and alive. I'd keep alive my feeling of wonder, even at the cold and the dark and the distant stars. Pa, Pa, I hear, I know. What is it, Alfred? What is it? What's going on? Oh, you've got to tell me. Pa, I'm scared. Quiet. But... You heard it? Uh-huh. A kind of shuffling. Coming toward the nest. Oh. Sis, take care of your mother. It's all right, oh. Ma. Lie down. Come on. I'll take the hammer. You take the hatchet. What is it, Pa? What is it? I don't know. Listen. It's closer. Oh, Ma, shh. Pa, the blanket is moving. Ready with your axe. Hello. Ah! Who's there? Is there somebody in there? Come in. It's all right. They're alive. Alive. Who are you? Alfred. Alfred. Hutchinson. Dr. Alfred Hutchinson. You can take off your helmets in here. But the air. We have air. Oh, we bring it in in pails. Come on, Ralph. Let's take off the helmets. Well, it's it's impossible. <laughs> Where are you from? We thought we were the only ones. Los Alamos. The nuclear laboratory. Yes, that's right. We get our power from the reactor, using the stockpile of bombs for fuel. Then there are others. There are. There are other men. There are other men. Pa, Pa, is it all right? Should I put the axe down? Yes, yes, it's all right. You can put it down. You mean you come from another nest? It's a little bigger than this. We've got a small airtight city with airlocks. We generate our electricity, food from hydroponics. I can't believe it. I can't. I can't believe this. It's impossible. You can't maintain an air supply without hermetic sealing. It's impossible. 
Oh, no, no, it's simple. As long as you keep the fire going to melt the air and enough air boiling to keep the fire burning. How did you come here? Why? Well, we keep scouting around for survivors. There are a number of colonies, Brookhaven, Oak Ridge, and Harwell in England, and the Argonne Laboratory in France. We didn't expect to find anything in this city, though. But our detectors picked up a heat trace, so we tracked it down. Alfred, you're forgetting your manners. We have company. Of course, of course. Sis, throw a handful of coal on the fire. Pa, a whole handful? Doesn't matter now. And Bud, bring out another pail of air. Oh, it's incredible. And you have laboratories and transports? We only have a two-seater scout, but if we rip out the bulkhead to the storage compartment, we can make it all right. We can have you back at Los Alamos in four hours. Oh, what's the matter? I guess... We really hadn't thought about it that way. But, uh, I, I wouldn't know how to act there. And besides, I haven't any clothes. Just doesn't seem right to let this fire go out. It's been 18 years. Burning every minute. But you can't stay here. Ralph. But after all... Ralph. Oh. Uh, look, Dr. Hutchinson, we'll go out to the ship and bring back a small power heater. I know this is very sudden and upsetting to you. You need a chance to adjust. We'll be back in a few minutes. It's incredible. In buckets, air in buckets. Well, they didn't think the nest smelled so good. I could tell. <laughs> She had a wave in her hair. Did you see that? And, and lipstick. I suppose we have to decide what to do. Pa, at Los, Los Alamos and those other places, there'll be lots of people, won't there? Yes. I mean, not just your father or a brother. That's right. Boys? I suppose so. But somehow I feel a little... Empty. Alfred. Alfred, it's different now that we know others are alive. You don't have to feel the responsibility for keeping the human race going. Pa, I, I'd like to see those rockets and laboratories. Wouldn't you, Pa? I suppose so. It won't be easy leaving the nest. I mean, it just right, and there's only four of us. It, it's kind of a scary idea. A big place with a lot of strangers. You'll get over that feeling, son. The trouble with the world was that it kept getting smaller and smaller till it ended with just the nest. Now it'll be good to have a real huge world again. The way it was in the beginning. And so, we're going to leave the nest in the morning. By Pa's clocks. We've got the power heater going now. <laughs> Seems funny to be this warm when it isn't Christmas or somebody's birthday. But still, it's hard for me to realize that this is the last time I'll go out of the nest. Through all the blankets. To get a pail of air. You have just heard X-1 presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features the Edward M. Ludwig story, A Coffin for Jacob. With never a moment to rest, the pursuit through space felt like a game of hounds and hares. Or was it follow the leader? Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you A Pail of Air. A story from the pages of Galaxy written by Fritz Leiber and adapted for radio by George Lefferts. Featured in the cast were Ronnie Liss, Pamela Fitzmorris, Richard Hamilton, Eleanor Phelps, Rita Lloyd, and Joe DeSantis. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. <laughs> Thank you.
And now an important announcement for the listeners of X-1. Beginning next week, X-1 will be heard over most of these stations at a new time, Tuesdays at 8.30 to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Don't forget, listen next Tuesday from 8.30 to 9 p.m. for X-1. Monitor takes you everywhere this weekend on the NBC Radio Network. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction, presents X minus one. Night story, Almost Human, by Robert Block. Have you heard of the new science called cybernetics? It concerns man's efforts to develop a perfect thinking machine, a robot electronic brain that will not only do man's work, but even do his thinking for him. A robot that is almost human. <laughs> It's not impossible at all. In fact, one day, something like this may happen. A tall, suave gentleman in a black raincoat will walk down the street until he reaches a shuttered, isolated house. And then he will slowly mount the front steps, push the doorbell. Just a minute. I said just a minute. Hold your horses. What do you think you'd... Good evening, my dear. Duke, why did you come here? Curiosity, darling. I've been thinking of what you told me at our chance meeting last week. Duke, you promised me. I decided to come and take a look for myself. Where is the professor? In his study. Where's Junior? In the nursery. The nursery? How quaint. And do I take it our Junior's nursemaid? I help the professor. Tell him he has a guest. Ah, uh, Duke, he's a nice old guy. Don't Tell do him, it. darling. All right. Yes? What is it, Miss Williams? Uh, Professor Blassman, a gentleman... Here? I don't understand. I gave orders no one was to be admitted to the house. He insisted. Very well. Wait here. I'll get rid of him. <laughs> Sir? Professor Blassman, I've come to see Junior. Junior? There must be some mistake. There are no children in this house. I don't... Professor, what you feel pressing against your belly is the muzzle of a forty-five caliber pistol. Now, shall we visit Junior? How? What do you know about him? I know everything. Shall we go inside? I warn you. On the contrary. I warn you. Very well. This way. This is the nursery. Where is Junior? In the next room. Behind the door with a panel in it. Very considerately furnished. Another goose figures on the walls. Blackboard, toy blocks. Panda. Bunny rabbit doll. <laughs> Touching. All right, let's see him. You can look through the panel. believed it. Junior isn't very pretty, is he? I was not concerned with aesthetics. Why do you hide him? Is he dangerous? The world is not yet ready for such a thing. 
Besides, I must study. As you can see by his play, he is very young, hardly out of the cradle. I am educating him. With the nursery rhymes? The brain is undeveloped. It must learn its behavior patterns like any infant. You call that eight-foot monster an infant? Physically, of course, he'll never change. He is built of chrome steel and glass. But his brain, that is my wonderful instrument. Unlike a human, he has no heritage, no basic instincts such as love or hate. These he has yet to learn. In some respects, he is like a blank tablet. What is written upon the tablet will remain. You mean he has no feelings? He will learn quickly. And now, if your curiosity is satisfied, I trust you will keep my secret. If anyone discovers... Open the door. I beg your pardon? The door, Professor. Very well. Junior, come here. What a monster. He talks? Yes. Mentally, he's about six years old now. What is it, son? Who is that man, Papa? Let me handle this. You may call me Duke, son. I've come to see you. That's nice. Nobody ever comes to see me except Lola. Play with me, Duke. Certainly, Junior. Oh, uh, and Professor. Yes? While we're playing, you can have Lola and Miss Williams prepare my room. Your room? I forgot to tell you, I've, I've decided to stay until the climate changes and I can go out again. Meanwhile, I'll have a chance to play blocks with Junior. Understand? I begin to understand. You are hiding from the law. As you wish. All right, Junior. Your move. Let's build a bridge. I have a better idea, Junior. What? Let's build a coffin. A coffin? I don't know that word. Then I'll teach you, Junior. I can see the professor has been neglecting the moral side of your education very sadly. You shouldn't have come here, Duke. Why not, my dear? Afraid of me? No, afraid of myself. You're no good for me. You've always brought me trouble. Except this time. This time it will be different, darling. This time I'll bring you diamonds. Duke, what have you been teaching that thing? Nothing, honey. I've just been playing with them. Very educational. I don't believe you. What's bothering you, Lola? Today when I walked in there, he said to me, I know how to kill people, Lola. I'll kill you if you want me to. He's learning very quickly. Duke, I'm scared of that thing. It's unholy, a machine that acts like a human with a voice grinding at you, saying things you'd expect from a child. You dislike him so much. Why did you take this job as his nursemaid? Because I wanted to start over again. I answered an ad. The professor didn't ask questions. I I would have been all right, too, if you hadn't come along. I'm very glad you did tell me, darling. Because Junior is going to make us two very successful people. Ha! Like any child... Junior listens to what he's told. Duke, I don't know what you're teaching, Junior. But I can guess. And it isn't right. It's evil. Now, right on the blackboard, Junior. My name is Junior. My name... Is junior. People are evil. People are evil. Evil must be destroyed. Evil must be destroyed. The professor is evil. The professor is evil. The professor must... What are you doing? I want you to keep out of the nursery, professor. Go away. You... You don't even remember me. I know you. You are the professor... You want to keep me as your slave. You didn't tell me that people are evil. People are not evil. People are evil. They must be destroyed. Stop it! I am not a child any longer. No, you're not a child. You're a monster. Junior? Yes, Duke. The time is now, Junior. Yes, Duke. Keep away from me. Junior! Junior, don't do it! 
Listen to me. Junior, listen to me. Ah! I did it, Duke. Duke, I... Can we go away now, Duke? I don't like it here anymore. Duke, why did you do it? The professor was in the way. We'll have to move very quickly now, Lola. We? Because if you don't plan to come along, just say so. I can have Junior write your name on his blackboard. Where are we going? We'll go to Charlie's. With Junior? With Junior. Oh, Duke, you can't. I'm afraid. Relax, my dear. The Duke has great plans for you two. Wouldn't you like to be independently wealthy for the rest of your life? No cares, no worries. Just good times and fine clothes all the time. The only way you get that way is by inheriting a million. Not when you have a fellow like Junior around. I'm still afraid of him. Junior wouldn't hurt you. You wouldn't hurt Lola, would you, Junior? I like Lola. She's pretty. There, you see? He thinks you're pretty. Junior's growing up. Sit down, Charlie. Sure, Duke. Lola and I are going to hide out here for a while. We need some help. Uh, listen, Duke, I'm, I'm trying to keep the cops away. Sure, sure. Now listen to me. I need a casing job done. Oh. Sure, sure, Duke. You know the armored truck service? Sure. I want to know when they take the Acme deposits from Boston to Worcester. Duke, you ain't thinking of a payroll truck, are you? They got cannons on those trucks. They travel in pairs. You couldn't get near one. I asked you to do a casing job, Charlie. Sure, Duke. Anything you say. Find out what time they passed the narrow west and most deserted stretch of road. Well, if, if, if you're going to pull a job like that, you'll need 50 men. You want me to get some of the boys? I won't need anybody. I've got somebody. Where? He's out in the car. Oh, what's his name, Duke? Anybody I know? His name is Junior. Junior? I, I don't know any Junior. You will, Charlie. You will. Smoke, Sam? Well, thanks, Al. Oh, it sure gets hot in these armored trucks, huh? Ah, uh, you'll get used to it. How much we haul in this town? About $250,000. Hmm. Brother, could I use a hunk of that? Who couldn't? What's the first stop? Acme National Bank. Then we unload a payroll of the Bronson Watch Plant. Hey, what's that up ahead? Looks like something shiny on the road. Drop your spotlight. Right. Holy smokes, you see what I see? Well, it looks like a mechanical traffic cop. About eight feet tall. Standing right in the middle of the highway. Maybe it's a Halloween gang, huh? Unless they're trying out robot traffic cops. Can you get past him? I don't know. We'll have to slow down. Get on that gun, Sam. Let's take no chances. Right. I'll give it the horn. Don't budge. Where's our escort truck? Pulled up right behind us. Thing won't move. Sure looks like something out of Buck Rogers, don't it? That's a heck of a note blocking traffic like that. I'll have to try and get past it. Here it goes. Holy smokes, it's moving. Hell, it's coming toward us. Get on that gun. Give it a blast. Bullets are bouncing right off it. It's still coming. Hell, back up. I can't. The other truck's right behind us. Hell, it's lifting its arm. It's going to smash our window. <laughs> Jeez. If I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. Duke, we've got to quit this. What's the matter, Charlie? Getting shaky? The papers say he killed all four drivers. Listen, Duke, that robot is hot. We've got to get rid of it. Stop your blubbering. One more good robbery. You ain't going to pull another one. Why not? Count me out, Duke. The law is going to track that baby. Are you quite finished, Charlie? you got no heart, Duke. You're, you're like Junior, all steel inside. And you're just a big, warm-hearted slob. I suppose flowing with the milk of human kindness. Well, I got nerves. 
I can't stand that thing, the way it looks at you with that, that iron face and clanking around all the time. Listen, here it comes. Hello, Junior. Hello, Duke. I've been talking to Charlie. Yes, Duke. You know what I think, Junior? I think Charlie's yellow. You know what happens to people who turn yellow, don't you? Yes, Duke. Tell him. They're evil. We have to destroy them. Huh? You see, Charlie? Junior doesn't like people who sing to the police. Uh, uh, Duke, wait a minute. You know I'd never turn stooly or anything like that. I never sank to the coppers in my life. You can count Junior. on me. I, yes, I don't want no trouble Duke. with you. Stop him. I, I wouldn't... Yes, Duke. Duke! I stopped him, Duke. All right. Take him down to the cellar. Duke, that not... Charlie! Junior, put him down. Take him down to the cellar, Junior. Yes, Duke. Duke. Relax, darling. Stop shaking. Duke, we can't stay here. Charlie's going to be missed. He's got friends. Now we'll have the gangs after us, too. Oh, come on now. Don't worry, darling. The Duke will take care of everything. Where are you going? Out to a travel agency to get some tickets. You and I are going to take a trip, Lola. You're leaving me alone here? Junior's here, too. It's just a... It's being alone with that thing. Duke, I got the jitters. Now, don't you worry. In 48 hours, you and I will be on our way to Switzerland with $500,000 worth of loot. What about Junior? Junior will be taken care of. How can you get rid of him? Junior will do anything I say. So I'll merely have him get into the furnace and sit there while I fill it with oil and set fire to it. Uh. Too bad the professor couldn't have stayed around to see him growing up. He's almost a man now, Junior is. But not quite as clever as a man. You'll find that out after he steps into the furnace. Get rid of Junior now, Duke, before you leave. There's no time. I'll be back about eight. Duke, please. And be nice to Junior while I'm gone. Don't show him you're afraid of him. Bye, darling. Goodbye, Duke. Can't you wait till Duke gets back? He always oils you. I want you to oil me, Lola. All right. I like you to oil me, Lola. Yes, Junior. Lola, do you like Duke? Certainly. Do you like me? You know I do, Junior. Lola. What? Who do you like best? Me or Duke? I like you both, Junior. Yes, but who do you love? What do you know about love, Junior? In the books, man and woman love. No. Lola. What? Do you think anyone will ever love me? Maybe. Some women can fall in love with anything, Junior. Even with something like Duke. Why, Lola? I don't know. Maybe because... Well, as long as she thinks her man is the smartest and the strongest. I see. Where are you going? To wait for Duke. He won't be home for a while. I'll sit in the hall and wait for him. All right, Junior. I want to be alone and think. About what? I read in a book today it was bad to kill people. What does that mean? Bad. Bad. I don't know, Junior. I guess it's just a word. Oh, 
Hello? Hello, Duke. Oh, it's you, Junior. Why are you sitting in the dark? I was waiting for you, Duke. Well, now that's a good boy, Junior. Lola oiled me. That's nice. I tell you what, Junior. I've got a little job that's down in the cellar. Let's go down there. Now, Duke. Right now, Junior. All right, Duke. Are we going away soon, Duke? Yes, Junior. We're going away. What's in the cellar, Duke? A little surprise for you, Junior. You'll find out. What's he doing? Nothing. Did he say he'd be up soon? No. Maybe you'd better go down and get him. He's dead. Oh, no. No, he isn't dead. You said the woman loves the strongest and the smartest. Well, I'm stronger and smarter. But you aren't human. I'm almost human, Lola. No. No, stay away. Lola. Don't touch me. Those metal paws. No. I love you. Lola. No. No. I love no, no, you. No. 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 I... no. 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 I love you. The last thing she heard was the robot's harsh voice, droning it over and over again. I love you. I love you. I love you. And strangely enough, it did sound almost human. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction. Tonight, by transcription... X-1 has brought you Almost Human, a story by Robert Block, adapted for radio by George Lefferts. Featured in the cast were Santos Ortega as Duke, Joan Allison as Lola, Jackie Grimes as Junior, Guy Rep as The Professor, Nat Pollan as Charlie, Joseph Julian as Al, Lynn Cook as Sam, and Meryl Joels as the radio voice. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Ken McGregor and is an NBC Radio Network production. And now, next week, when the mighty Earthmen arrive in their ships of space, courtesy and proper humility on the part of the natives is expected. But some native inhabitants are too small to be impressed. We'll see what happens to such an expedition marooned on a far planet next week. At X, X minus, minus one. one. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two. X minus one. Fire.
from the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X minus one. Tonight, At the Post by H.L. Gold. When I come into the Blue Ribbon on 49th Street west of Broadway, I could tell right away nobody told Doc Hawkins about my misfortune. Doc, uh, who ain't one really, writes a daily medical column for the racing form and we're celebrating his being sprung from the alcoholic war. He got one look at me, and he choked on a piece of gefilte fish. <laughs> what happened? What happened? Look at that. Clockers become a character. Now, lay off, Doc. Look at that. A gray flannel suit, a black tie. Clocker, where is your purple and green check sports jacket? Where are your two-tone suede shoes? Why, well, you've become a character. That was Zelda's idea. She wanted to make a gentleman out of him. Wanted to? Why, you two kids got married just before they took, uh... My snake's away. Uh, don't tell me you've, uh, flipped already. You don't know, Doc? No. What happened? Well, it was right after you tried to take the warts off the fire hydrant that Zelda started hearing voices. It got real bad. How bad? Well, she's at Glendale Center upstate. I just came back from visiting her. Well, did the, uh, psychiatrist give you a diagnosis? Yeah, I got it memorized. Catatonia dementia precox. Oh, rough. Very rough. The outlook is never good in such cases. Maybe they can't help her, but I will. Now, Clocker, you're a race handicapper. You run the best tip sheet on Broadway. But people are not horses. You've got to think of your public. Uh, for instance, what's good at Hialeah, huh? My bar bill is about to be foreclosed, and I can use a long shot. Those couch artists don't know what's wrong with Zelda. I do. You do? Well, almost. I'm so close I can hear the finish line camera click. Well, now, that's very interesting. Uh, perhaps we can collaborate on an article for the uh, psychiatric journal. All right, look. Look at these charts. Look, here, here. Huh? I use the same system I used to dope the races. Look, Zelda's got catatonia. She used to be a hoofer before we got married, and now she does time steps all day. Stereotype movements are typical of catatonia. You don't get it. She does time steps. The first thing you learn in hoofing, over and over... Ten or fifteen hours a day. And she keeps talking like she's giving lessons to some jerk kid who can't get it straight. And I hear when these catatonics pull out, they don't remember much or maybe nothing. Protective amnesia. They work harder and longer at what they're doing than they ever did when they were regular citizens. And they don't get a red cent for it. I beg your pardon? I said they were getting stiff. Anybody who works that hard ought to get paid. I uh, don't understand what you're getting at. What are they knocking themselves out for if it's for free? Doc, I tell you, I missed that mouse. I gotta save her. She can't see or hear us, but she can sure see or hear something. And I'm gonna dope her. Clocker, it's too much for you. Too much for me, huh? Who was it said Warlock had turned into a dog in his third year? Who was it had seven winners the opening day at Belmont? You take my word for it, Doc. I'll beat the schizophrenia handicap. <laughs> I hadn't been paying much attention to my tip sheet while I was doping a catatonia dodge. I tell you, I miss Zelda. I miss the bobby pins on the floor and the nylon stuck on a shower rack, the toothpaste tube squeezed from the top. I had to get her back somehow. Next day, I took a cab and went out to that place. I sat in the room and watched her dance. Oh, it was something. Because Zelda was worth watching, even with her eyes blank and her feet shuffling through that simple time step. Mr. Locke, visiting time is almost up. All right, all right. Zelda, listen, Zelda. How long can they take to learn a time step? She can't hear you. Look, kid, I don't know who these squares are that you're working for, but tell them if they take you, they got to take me too, you hear? I had an idea now. I had a dope that Zelda was showing them how to dance, whoever they are. And the only way I could spring her was to find out who was controlling her and what they were after. The first step was to get him interested in me and what I know about racing, doping horses. 
So I stood there next to Zelda, and I started to talk. Now, the first thing you got to figure is bloodlines. You take a horse, you got to know back maybe four or five generations on both sides. Then you got to know where the coat was foaled, what time of year, because all horses are one year old on the 1st of January. And there's confirmation, training. You take a horse with good bloodlines, break him in in the spring on a hard train and surface track, and the first thing you know, you got a horse with a shin splint. Oh, they may cover it up, but if you know what's there. That's a lot. I once fine. knew a horse ran in Hialeah who was hey, scared of flamingos. What are you doing? Had a fine record at Gulfstream and Bowie. But when he got down to Hialeah and got one look at the flamingos, he wouldn't run for Bean. Mr. Locke, are you all right? Shut up, I'm Mr. busy. Locke. You bet on a horse that's scared of flamingos at Hialeah and you're going to come in with your tail between your legs. <laughs> Kept coming back every day. I'd just sit there next to Zelda while she did a time step, and I'd talk about horses over and over. And then finally, finally, I started to hear voices. Clocker! Clocker! This way, Clocker, come this way. This way, Clocker. Come on now. Come with me. Like it was a fog, I could see the attendant in his white coat asking me questions, and I couldn't hear him. I knew I just kept on talking about the horses. And then suddenly I wasn't there. I was somewhere else. I was in a big square, and the buildings looked like the new Roosevelt Raceway, all modern. Or maybe like the World's Fair, there were trees and statues. And there were hundreds of people standing around, and they all looked scared. There was a little man with five focals and a vest with pins and needles in it standing next to me. He looked scared. But I knew it had worked. I was on my way to Zelda. How did I get here? Excuse me, mister. How did I get here? I don't know. I can't take time for pleasure trips. I've got a customer coming in tomorrow for a fitting. She'll positively murder me if her dress isn't ready. She can't murder you. Not anymore. You mean we're dead? Don't ask me, but uh, I don't think you're dead. That much I can tell you. Some of the people in the crowd were complaining they had families to take care of, while others were worried about leaving their businesses. And they all grew quiet when a man climbed up on a big platform in front. He was a very tall and dignified guy, and he had formal clothes and a white beard like the chief mourner at a politician's funeral. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, please feel at ease. You are not in any danger. No harm will come to you. If you will listen carefully to this orientation lecture... You will know where you are and why. What is it? I don't, I don't understand. It's a pitch. Friends, I know you are puzzled at all this. Now, let me explain. You've been chosen, yes, carefully screened and selected, to help us in what is undoubtedly the greatest cause of all history. You will learn more about it as we work together in this vast and noble experiment. What experiment? What is it? I got it picked. This is a pitch. These guys are out for something. Smells like a con. Let me state this in its simplest terms. Now, you know that there are billions of stars in the universe and that the stars have planets. A good many of these planets are inhabited. In almost all instances, the dominant form of life is quite different from yours. I am not of your planet or solar system. I am not formed as you see me. My true appearance would seem to be rather confusing to human eyes. Nuts, get to the point. The truth is, we are not here, and neither are you. Here is a projection of thought, a hypothetical point in space, a place that exists only by mental force. Actually, our bodies are on our own respective planets. What's he saying? What does he mean? Wait, he'll give us the convincer after the build-up. Our civilization is considerably older than yours. For many of your centuries, we have explored the universe both physically and telepathically, and during this exploration, we discovered your planet. We tried to establish communication, but there were grave difficulties. And it was the time of your dark ages. And I'm sorry to report that those people we did make contact with were generally burned at the stake. Here it comes. 
He's getting ready to slip us the sting. Well, I don't think you ought to say a thing like that about a fine, decent gentleman. He's obviously very sincere. The problem we face is that the human race is doomed. The history of your race is a record of incessant wars, each more devastating than the last. And now, finally, man has chained the power of worldwide destruction. The next war, or the one after that, would unquestionably be the end, not only of civilization but of humanity, perhaps even of your entire planet. Then why have we brought you here? Because man, in spite of his suicidal blunders, is a magnificent race. He must not vanish without leaving a complete record of his achievements. Now this is the task we must work together on. Each of you has a skill, a talent, a special knowledge we need for the immense record we're compiling. Every area of human society must be covered. And so we need you urgently. Your data will become part of an imperishable social document that shall exist untold eons after mankind has vanished. Oh, he had a slick con. He had that crowd in the palm of his hand like a small-time grifter selling pearl necklaces on 6th Avenue. They all cheered. They were all flattered to think that they were joining in this vast project to make a record of the human race. After a while, they broke us up into divisions, and I got herded into a building marked Sports and Rackets. They took my name and my occupation like I was applying for unemployment insurance. Now, here's our problem, Mr. Locke. We're making two kinds of perpetual records. One is written, more precisely, microscribed. The other is a wonderfully exact duplicate of your cerebral pattern. In more durable material than brain matter, of course. Of course. The uh, substance we use in place of brain cells absorbs memory quite slowly. But you'll be happy to know that the impression once made can never be lost or erased. Delighted. Tickled the pieces. I knew you would be. Well, let's proceed, shall we? First, a basic description of horse racing. I started telling them about horse racing, but they held me down to one sentence. They said I had to repeat it over and over so that that recording thing could get it. They had a picture of my body back on Earth lying in a bed in a hospital just saying that one sentence over and over again. Well, that's enough for today. Isn't it amazing? We have a more detailed record of human society than man himself ever had. Your life, my life, the life of this uh, uh, Zelda whom you came here to rescue, all are trivial, for we must all die eventually. But the project, the project will last eternally. You're telling me you know what I'm here for? To secure the return of your wife. I would naturally be aware that you'd submitted yourself to our control voluntarily. It was in your file that was sent to me by admissions. And why did you let me in? Because, my dear friend, we also... Well, look, leave out the friend pitch. I'm here on business. As you wish. We let you in, as you express it, because you have knowledge that we should include in our archives. We hoped you'd recognize the merit and scope of our undertaking. Most people do, once they're told. Zelda, too? Oh, yes. Yes, Zelda's extremely cooperative, quite convinced. Would you like to see her? Yeah, sure I would. Well, that can be arranged. I'll call the arts and entertainment section and uh, arrange a meeting. Zelda, Zelda, baby. I'm Clocker. Let's get out of here. Oh, hello, Clocker. Aren't you glad to see me? I spent months and shot every dime I've got just to find you. Well, sure, I'm glad to see you, hon, but I can't waste any time. This work is so important. I want to talk to you. That con artist with a white beard Oh, said... isn't he wonderful, Clocker? Aren't they all wonderful? Regular scientists devoting their whole lives to this terrific cause. What's so wonderful about that? They could let the earth go boom. It wouldn't mean a thing to them. Everybody wiped out, just like there never were any people. Not even as much record of us as the dinosaurs. Gee, wouldn't that make you feel simply awful? I wouldn't feel a thing. All I'm worried about is us, baby. Who cares about the rest of the world doing a disappearing act? I do, and so do they. They aren't selfish like some people I could mention. Selfish? You're darn right I am. Zelda, listen. 
I'm selfish because I got a wife and I'm nuts about her and I want her back. I have to help out on this project. It's the least I can do for history. History? What did history ever do for us? Go turn in your time card, baby. Tell them you got a date with me back on Earth. No, this is my job as much as theirs. More even. They don't keep anybody here against their will. I'm staying because I want to, Clocker. But, honey... Excuse me, I've got to get back. I'm teaching them the soft shoe now. Are you satisfied now, Mr. Locke? Listen, take away the doom push and this racket falls. Listen, suppose you're all square. Suppose you're leveling. You're knocking yourself out because your guess is we're going to commit suicide. But is there any doubt of it? Do you honestly believe the Holocaust can be averted? I think it can be stopped, yeah. Listen, between these catatonics and me, we could tell them what it's all about. I notice you've got people from all over the world here. They get along fine because they have a job to do and don't have time to hate each other. Well, it could be like that back on Earth. Mr. Locke, we have experimented in the manner you suggest... But a human psychological mechanism defeated us. Yeah? What was that? Protective amnesia. They completely and absolutely forgot everything they'd learned here. Well, what are the odds on me remembering? Well, you are our first volunteer. Look, I'll give you a deal. You let me out, and maybe I'll be the first case that didn't get amnesia. And I can tell the world all about this. I'll come back if I lame out. You can pick me up any time you want. If I make headway, you've got to let Zelda go, too. That's a very reasonable proposition. We'll lift our control, Mr. Locke, for a suitable time. If you can arouse a measurable opposition to racial suicide, measurable, mind you, then we agree to release your wife and revise our policy completely. <laughs> took me about two weeks to convince them that I was all right again. But I had to convince the world that they were throwing a race and that they needed a saliva test. So I started to write it all out in my tip sheet, in and around the horses. Around that time, I ran in the dark. Clocker, my boy, you've no idea how anxious we were about you. But you're looking fit, I'm glad to say. Thanks. I wish I could say the same about you and the rest of the world. No need to worry about us. We'll muddle along somehow. You think so, huh? I'm glad to see you've got your tip sheet going again. As long as the bobtails run, who cares what happens to anything else? Of course, nobody listened to me. I had posters printed telling everybody. I hired sandwich men to walk through the city. I made speeches in Columbus Circle. I told everybody Doomsday was near. I sent letters to Congress, to the U.N. editors and newspapers. Nobody paid any attention. I sneaked into the balcony of the General Assembly and tried to shout a speech. And they threw me out, very politely. I wrote the whole thing up for a magazine. And they printed it and sent me a check and told me if I had any more fiction, they'd be glad to run it. They kept trying to tell everybody the truth about the catatonics. We ought to go to the hospitals and get ourselves let in and have the aliens take over and show us where we're going. But nobody would listen. And then finally, I went back out to Glendale. Oh, Mr. Locke, we were wondering when you'd come visit your wife. You've been away? I want my old room back. But you're perfectly normal. Give me half hour alone and uh, you'll be glad to give me my room. Well, here I am back again. Oh, Mr. Locke. Okay, I'll give you all the rest of the dope on racing. You won't have any trouble with me. Then you're convinced you failed. I'm no dummy. I know when I'm licked. So do we, Mr. Locke. Naturally, you have no way of detecting the effect you've had. We do. The result is that because of your experiment, we're gladly revising our policy. Huh? Is this a rib? Nobody listened to me. Oh, but they did. Visits to catatonics have increased considerably. When the visitors are alone with our human associates, they tentatively follow the directions you gave them in your article. Not all do, to be sure... Only those who feel as strongly about being with their loved ones as you do about your wife. We've uh, accepted four voluntary applicants. You mean I made it? That's right. Before long, we shall have to increase our staff as the numbers of voluntary applicants increases geometrically. And then we'll be able to release the first group to go back and carry the message. Whenever you care to, Mr. Locke. 
you and your wife are free to leave. Okay, okay, but I'll tell you what. I owe you plenty. I'll help make that record before I go. I'll teach you how to dope the horses. Is that what you want? Why, yes. All right, then let's go. The quicker we get started, the quicker we can get back. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features A Touch of E-Flat by Joe Gibson. A story with a warning. Never let anyone point any weapon at you, even something as harmless-looking as a water pistol. It may be a cooling gun. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, X-1 has brought you... At the Post, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by H.L. Gold and adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Featured in our cast were Frank Maxwell as the clocker and Thomas as his time-stepping wife, Zelda, Arnold Moss as the otherworldly one, John Griggs as the doc who wasn't one, really, and Sam Raskin as the confused little tailor with his mouth full of pins. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Kenneth McGregor, and is an NBC Radio Network production. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X minus one. Tonight, Caretaker by James A. Schmitz. Commander Lowndes? Yes, Mr. Harris. Astrogation reports, planetary orbit secure. What vector, Mr. Harris? Approximately 1,000 miles above subject planet 3785. Well, we'll have to give it a name soon, Harris. Yes, sir. Engineering secured, damage control parties working on the hull. Very well. Has Martyr touched down in the scout ship? Yes, sir, we have him on the tight beam. Give him to me on my screen. Yes, sir. Clarkman, put Martyr on the command screen. Exploration ship Titan calling ship 375. Come in. Scout 375 reporting. What's it like down there, Martyr? It's not much different from the scan report, sir. I'm at the head of a valley. It's green and it's scarlet. It's all swampy. And there's a big river threading through it. Harris, get me a pinpoint on Martyr's location. Aye, aye, sir. Uh, there are mountains beyond. I can see Holman's house from here. Looks like a Swiss chalet standing over the lake. Have you made contact? Yes, sir. Boyce is over there now. How is he? Well, it's hard to say. Tell him we're recording the planet officially as Holman's planet. That might please him. No, I don't think so, sir. What? A boy suggested that during our first visit with Holman today, he wants us to record it instead as, um, well, I'll, I'll spell it, C-R-E-S-G-Y-T-H, Kreskith. What's that, local? Well, that's his phonetic interpretation of the name the people here use. Fair enough, if that's how he wants it. Anything to add on your present report? No, 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 sir. I'll call you back after we've met his woman. His wife? Yes. I'm glad it was you and Boyce who found Holman. You're reliable men, you in particular. Martyr, I don't need to emphasize that Holman's discovery of what appears to be the first genuine human race ever encountered outside of Earth is of primary importance. Yes, sir. Boys might be inclined to hurry through the uh, diplomatic overtures. 
You'll be careful about that part of it, Martha. Yes, very careful, sir. On the two continents we've scanned before, we've found no traces of human inhabitants, present or past. Yes, I know, sir, but Holman's... It's possible Holman's acquaintances are the sole survivors of humanity here. If we frighten the tribe into hiding, there may never be another contact. Yes, I understand, sir. Fine. Now then, what about these other creatures? What did Holman have to say about them? Well, in the 20 years he's been marooned in this valley, he's had only three or four actual encounters with him, sir. Rather violent encounters on his side. Apparently, they learned to avoid him after that. They're called Zares. Uh, he seems to have an almost psychopathic hatred for them. That's not very surprising. We pulled up a scout drag a little while ago, bagged a couple of specimens. The description checks with Holman's description of the Zares, the worm-like, slimy, blue body with a set of arms, legs, and head. Out of the water, they seem to wear some kind of clothes, presumably to conserve body moisture. Yes, that's what he said. All right now, Martha. I want you to continue according to the plan. And remember, be careful of Holman. He's been alone on this planet for 22 years. He deserves a lot from us. Yes, sir. But he hasn't been alone. He has his wife. Weiss? Weiss, where are you? Down here. I'm with Holman. Check in with the exploration ship? Yes, it's all right. Holman, they say they'll name the planet the way you want it. That's good. Celia will like that. Celia? My wife. I called her Celia from the start. She likes the name. I see. Where's she now? Oh, she's out somewhere. She's very timid. She'll show up sometime in the night, and I'm leaving the doors open for her. I'll talk to her a little first to reassure her, and you can meet her then. Meanwhile, would you like to see her picture? Why, do you got photographs? No, no, I painted it. I used to do a little bit before I went into service. It's over here. I've done about 50 or so paintings over the years. I paint a lot of them over, you know. Uh, here, in here. I grind my own pigments and cut brushes from the swamp grass. I'd give my arm for a good camel's hair brush. Uh, here, here she is. Beautiful. Real good looking. Of course, it isn't an exact likeness. I tried to capture the spirit. I think I've got it pretty good. You know, there's something about that picture sort well, of... Never mind, boys. Boys doesn't know much about art. Yeah, but I know what I like. I like a good-looking woman. You're a lucky man, Holman. You wanted to see the deep water well. It's right through here. Actually, it's just an opening through the concrete to the river that runs below. It's as pure as anything you could wish. If they want to refresh the water tanks of the ship... Yes, all... I'll take it up with the captain. We'll be staying a week or more... We're to follow your judgment in every way in establishing contact with the Kreskithians. Good. We can't do anything till Celia comes in, and we'll have to be very tactful then. But I'm sure it won't take a week. Well, what makes them so shy of us? Oh, it's not you, it's me. Or it's an impression I gave them of the Earth kind of human beings. Come on upstairs, and I'll tell you. Cigar? It's a local swamp grass. Is it safe? Well, I've been smoking them for years. Uh, you were telling us about the native humans. Well, I've never asked Celia much about her people. There's some kind of very strong taboo that keeps her from talking about them. How'd you meet her? Well, our ship crashed into the valley originally. I was the only man left and the original crew of four. Manning went insane two days before we made a planet fall and killed Nichols and Dawson. And so I killed Manning before he could wreck the ship completely. Have you got a light, Marta? Thanks, I'm all right. You see, it was unavoidable, but they never understood it, those people of Celia's. Well, how did they find out? I was unconscious for about a month and completely blind for six months afterwards. Blind? Well, they got me out of the wreck and nursed me back to life. But as soon as I was out of danger, only Celia would stay with me. She and I were alone for weeks before I regained my sight. Uh, how did they know I killed the others? Well, they're sensitive in a number of ways, and there were those bodies in the ship. They, well, they withdrew from me as soon as I no longer needed their help. Then in all this time, you were never able to gain their confidence? It's not a question of confidence. It's a question of, well, I'm trying to tell you. I didn't mind being alone with Celia. You'll understand that when you see her. The others stayed in a small lake village they had a couple of miles up the valley across the swamps. 
Celia went up there every few days, but she never brought anyone back with her. I suspected it was simply because I was an alien. I thought they'd get over that in time. Celia seemed happy enough, so it wasn't a very acute problem. Well, could you observe them? Well, one day, when she'd slipped away again, I remembered a pair of field glasses I'd taken off the ship, and I got them and trained them on the village. That was a very curious experience. I never found a complete explanation for it. Well, what happened? Well, just for one instant, I had everything in the clearest possible focus. There were children playing on the platforms above the water, a few adults standing in the doorways of a house, and suddenly everything went blurred. Well, something go wrong with the glasses? No, no. They didn't want me to look at them. They just blurred my vision. What do you mean? What do you mean? You mean telepathically? Well, I don't know. The glasses had a four-mile range, and they were functioning perfectly. But the instant I turned them on the village... The field blurred. Well, I never felt so snubbed before. Yeah, I guess that's quite a hint. Well, I admit it annoyed me. The next day, I announced to Celia that I was going over to the village. Well, she made no objection, but she followed me in the distance, probably to make sure I didn't drown on the way. It's wet going around here. At last, I came over a rise and found myself a hundred yards from the village on the land side, and then I realized they'd left it. I walked around it a while and found cooking fires still glowing, but nobody had waited to receive me. So I went home and sold it, and very sulky. I wouldn't even talk to Celia until the next morning. Well, did you see anybody there? Nobody. Well, I settled down and built a house for the two of us, and that took up all my time for several months. I couldn't ignore them. There was something so curiously happy and peaceful about them, even though they gave me the cold shoulder. From the one look I had of them, it showed me that they were the most beautiful people I'd ever seen. Well, you've seen the picture. It doesn't do her justice. Boy, she must be something. One day, when Celia was gone, I made another trip to the village... And the same thing happened. Well, did you make any attempt to explore further? Oh, yes. I got the little lifeboat flyer repaired enough to get it off the ground and set it down again. I had enough fuel for one 24-hour trip. I flew down the valley for almost 50 miles before I came across the first colony of the other ones, the Zares. Is that what the people here call them? No, Zare, that's the word for snake. I named them that. Did they live in caves? No, that's what fooled me. It was a village of houses just like the one here. I sat down on the lake and I saw them. They just stood there, very quietly watching me through the doors and windows. What made it worse somehow was that they, they wore clothes, but the clothes didn't cover enough. Those weaving, soft, blue, slimy bodies and those staring eyes. I backed down the ladder with my gun ready in case they rushed me. But they never moved. Did, did you find any more of them? There were about eight more colonies of Zares further down the valley, but there was no trace of another tribe of humans. At the time, I didn't know just what to make of it. There was a possibility that my village represented an advanced troop of human beings into the land of snakes. But it turned out to be the other way around. It seemed to be the snakes that were pushing out the humans. So I swore to myself that as long as I lived, at least, human beings were going to hold this section of the valley undisturbed in its safety. When I came back, I said to Celia, Celia, I must speak to your people. Go tell them I'll come again tomorrow, and they mustn't run away. Well, she looked at me, and then she went in the direction of the village. Did they wait for you? Well, she came back late at night, crept into my arms, and told me they promised to wait for me. Oh, I set out the next morning full of great plans. After all, the Zare snakes lived in widely scattered settlements. The villagers and I could wipe out those settlements one by one until we'd cleared the land. But then I didn't realize how different Celia's people were from us. How? What happened? Well, I came over that rise, and there the village was. This time I knew they'd stayed home. And then, not twenty feet off my path, I saw two of the Zares standing in the bushes, one watching me and the other looking at the village. 
They were the first ones I'd seen that close, and they were horrible. They, they had a rapacious, greedy look. They seemed oily and unclean. Each had a kind of tricky crossbow over his shoulder, and they couldn't be seen from the village. Oh, oh uh, would you like something to drink? There were, uh, there's some kind of fermented homebrew I made. No, no. What, what happened? Well, I shot them both down before they got over the surprise. It was a natural thing to do, wasn't it? Sure, sure, I guess so. But apparently, from the point of view of the villagers, it wasn't. The village was empty again. When I got back home, I was actually sick with disappointment. And then I discovered Celia was gone. She stayed away three days. And when she came back, I never went back to the village. But I, I, I don't see why... Neither did I until it was too late. Uh, they won't kill their enemies. They're too polite for that. So their enemies are gradually squeezing them out of existence. Captain, what do you expect us to do in this situation? Kill the Zares, as many as we can find. If the human beings of this world won't defend themselves, we'll have to defend them. I can't be on guard here forever. It's up to you and the other men on the ship to do the job right. You will, won't you? You'll make a report to Commander Lounge? You will. We'll make our report. Oh, that's fine. Well, uh, gentlemen, I suppose it's late now. I suppose you'll want to turn in. Uh, when will your uh, uh, wife get back? Well, she'll be back later. Don't worry about her. <laughs> Why? What do you want? Listen. What? Somebody moving in the house. Listen. Holman? No, no, no. Listen to those steps. Now, hear, hear him? That's no man. Slow, dragon. Yeah, come on. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Side arms. All right, there, come on. All right, he's coming from downstairs. Stop. Listen. Wait till I get the safety catch on. Look. No firing unless I tell you. Look, Marner, I'll take care of myself. Maybe it's one of those airs. I'd like to get a shot at them. Come on. Downstairs, all right. His light. What? What's that? A missile gun. Holman had a number of obsolete weapons down there. Hurry up. Look out. There goes the light. I've got my torch. It came from the well room. Oh, it's the door. Stand back. Turn your light in there. Uh, it, it's Holman. They've got Holman. There, there it goes. Stand clear. I'll blast wait, it. Wait, wait a minute. Get out of the way. It's one of those airs. Give me a clear shot. Hold it. You can't get out of here while we've got the well covered. Now keep your blaster ready while I look at Holman. I hear it moving back there in the shadows. He's dead. Come on, make a break for it, you rotten, slimy snake. Come on. Shot through the head with his own gun. Who's that, Sarah? That snake? You got a good look at it? No, no, it jumped for the shadows. There, there it is. Marta, swing your torch around. I'll roast it with one blast. Listen, what? listen. What? Who's that? You who are his friends, will you listen to me? Who are you? He called me his wife. What? How'd she get in here? If that Zare gets a hold of her... Why? Don't move. I won't. Why did you kill him? But I thought you understood. What do you mean she killed him? It was that Zare, the snake. Shh. There are medical men who would say he'd been insane for 20 years as he counted time. They would have forced him back into sanity. I could not bear the thought he should suffer that. Suffer what? Are you all fools? He was a fool, though I loved him. He could not see beyond the shape of things. So here among us, he saw shapes he could bear to see. And those moments when sanity came to him and he saw what was really there, then he killed. Are you all like that? What are you talking about? Is the snake there with her? Go upstairs, boys. Wait for me outside. You're going to kill that snake? Yes, I'll kill the snake. All right, take my blast. Now, be careful. Get between the eyes, Marta. Roast that zare to a crisp. Go on outside. Are you still there? Yes. Is there any way you can get out? I can leave by the river that flows under the well if you do not shoot at me. I won't shoot at you. May I take his body? Yes. And you will all leave with your ship? I loved him. Although my people thought it strange, almost beyond their tolerance, they are foolish too, yet not as foolish as you are. They saw what was in his mind, and not beyond that, and so they were afraid of him. But he is dead now, and there is nothing that your people and mine could share. We are too different. Will you leave? We'll leave. 
What did you see that was beyond his mind? A brave spirit, though very frightened. He ventured far, far, far into the dark, of which he was afraid. I loved him for that. I am coming now. I think you had better look away. Marta. Yes, sir. I've just been down to sick bay. Boyce is all right. He's in shock. Well, I gave him a shot of sedative on my way up here. Oh, the medics say he'll be all right. They're giving him a reconstructive psychotherapy fix. He won't remember much of it. If you had looked squarely at that thing, we might have had to give you the same treatment. Our pickled specimens of the Zare are pretty hideous. I suppose it's all the way you look at it. Yes, I suppose so. Coleman had his own way of looking at it. Selective hysterical blindness maintained for 22 years, with his own type of artistic hallucinations thrown in. I can't help wishing it hadn't happened to Coleman. He didn't maintain it throughout. When he was hallucinating, he saw them as beautiful. He saw her as beautiful. But when he saw them clearly, the way they really were, he killed them. Who wouldn't? I almost feel like getting out of space and staying out for good. Well, it's time to file a report and wrap up. What are you reporting? That Holman died here quite peacefully about a year before we found him, leaving a diary of inspiring courage and devotion to space exploration behind him. We'll have time enough to work up the diary. That should keep everybody happy. All secure, sir. Shall I close down the ports? Uh, just a minute. Marta, look down there. The whole galaxy. Do you think there actually are people out there somewhere? I hope so. Do you think we'll ever find them? I don't know. They've never found us. <laughs> You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features Survival Type by J.F. Bone. Score one or one million was not enough for the human race. It had to be all or nothing, with one man doing all the scoring. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, X-1 has brought you Caretaker, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by James A. Schmitz, and adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Featured in the cast were Ted Osborne, Bill Lipton, Mason Adams, Raymond Edward Johnson, and Betty Kane. This is Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. Polio is not over yet. A total of $46,900,000 is needed to continue the fight against this crippling disease. Thousands of polio victims are depending on you. Help finish the polio fight. Join the 1957 March of Dimes. The World on a New Hotline. Listen for news on the hour and the exciting hotline service all day, every day on most of these stations. <laughs> down for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X minus one.
tonight. The discovery of Morniel Mathaway by William Tent. <laughs> Everyone is astonished at the change in Morniel Mathaway since he was discovered. Everyone, that is, but me. They remember him as an unbathed and untalented Greenwich Village painter who began almost every second sentence with I and ended every third one with me. You see, I understand the change in him because I was there the day he was discovered. We were talking about his discovery that day. I was sitting carefully balanced on the one wooden chair in his cold little Bleecker Street studio because I was too sophisticated to sit in the easy chair. Come on, Dave, take a comfortable seat. Oh, no, Morning. oh, no, I know about that chair. Now, what do you mean? It's the only comfortable chair in the room. Yeah, I know, I know, look at it. Broken down springs, very high in the front and low in the back. Sure, it conforms with the position of the spine. Yeah, sure, sure. And when you sit in it, things begin sliding out of your pockets. Loose change, keys, wallets, anything. What do you do, Morning? Pay the rent on your studio with that easy chair? <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, it is rather profitable. Mm. And that's why I'll sit on the wooden chair, if you don't mind. Oh, now, don't be bourgeois. Well, I notice you always sit on the bed. That's because I'm a good host. I see. Well, how's the painting going? Oh, great, great, fabulous. You sell any paintings? No. You know, Dave, I can't wait for the day when some dealer, some critic with an ounce of brain sees my work. I can't miss, Dave. I know I can't miss. I'm just too good. Sometimes I get frightened at how good I am. Why, it's almost too much talent for one man. Uh, well, there's always... Not that it's too much talent for me. I'm big enough to carry it, fortunately. I'm large enough of soul. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear it. Now, if you don't mind... You know I... what I was thinking about this morning? No, but to tell you the truth, I don't... I was thinking about Picasso, Dave. Picasso and Rouen. I'd just gone for a walk through the pushcart area to have my breakfast. Uh, <laughs> you know, the old hand's quicker than the eye. Yes, I know. I've seen you do it. You're the only man I know who can ask directions to Houston Street and fill his pockets full of bananas at the same time. Oh, well, society owes the artist something. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I started to think about the art of modern painting. I think about that a lot, Dave. It troubles me. You do, huh? Well, I... Can... I was thinking, who is really doing important work in painting today? Who is really an unquestionable great? I could think of only three names. Picasso, Rouault, and me. Well, naturally. Just three names, no more. Oh, it made me feel very lonely, Dave. Yeah, well, I can see that. But and then, then you... I asked myself, why is this so? Has absolute genius always been so rare? Why has my impending discovery been delayed so long? Oh, I thought about it for a long time, Dave. I thought about it humbly, carefully, because it's an important question. And this is the answer I came up with. <laughs> Don't bother waiting for the answer that Morning came up with. It turned out to be a theory of aesthetics I'd heard at least a dozen times before from a dozen other painters in the village. Morning was a bad painter, there was no question about it. I say that not only from my opinion. I've roomed with two modern painters and I've been married for a year to another, but... Well, for example, a friend of mine, a fine critic of modern art, took a look at one of Morning's paintings, which he hung over my fireplace in spite of my protest, and just kind of stared slack-jawed. What, uh, what, what does he call that technique? Well, he says it's smudge on smudge. Well, I can believe it. Smudge on smudge, white on white, non-objectivism, neo-abstractionism, call it what you like. There's nothing there, nothing. Well, it doesn't even have the interest of those paintings that chimpanzee did a couple of years ago. He's just another of those loudmouth, frowsy, frustrated dilettantes that infest the village. Why do you waste your time with him? Well, for one thing, he lives right around the corner, and he's kind of colorful in his own sick way. And he does have one great talent. It's not in painting. No, no. Now, you see, I just get by as far as living expenses are concerned. Things like good paper to write on, good books for my library. Well, I can't touch them. And sometimes the yearning gets too great. You know, a newly published collection by Wallace Stevens. Well, if I find one I want, I just go over to Morning's and tell him about it. He doesn't lend you money. Oh, no, no, no. Now, you see, we go out to the bookstore, and we come in separately. And then I start a conversation with the proprietor about some very expensive out-of-print item I'm thinking of ordering, and Morniel just says, don't mind me, I'm browsing. Well, that's the high side. I'm browsing. Well, what happens? Well, while I'm keeping the proprietor talking, Morniel snaffles the Stevens. Isn't that just a little bit, uh... Oh, well, I, I intend to pay for them, of course, as soon as I'm a little ahead. 
Well, why does he do this for you? Oh, well, I pay off. I go through the same routine at an art supply store so Morneal can get canvas and paint and brushes. Of course, I really have to pay for Morneal's browsing. I have to suffer through listening to him, and then my conscience bothers me. Oh, it does. Yes, you see, I intend to pay for my things, but I know he doesn't. And that's why my conscience bothers me. Well, here he was the day he was discovered, sitting in his room, and Morneal was running on about his own genius. No, I can't be as unique as I feel. Other people must be born with a potential of such great talent, but it's destroyed in them before they can reach artistic maturity. Why? How? Well, let's examine the role that society plays in all of this. What's that? You got a hi-fi set? Nonsense. That's a crass materialistic concept that I should... Something is happening. Hey, when did you put the purple lights in? Purple? Oh, what's that? Look, look, it's it's shimmering. It's, It's coming right through the wall. It looks like a box. We can't both be having an artistic vision. You're not the type. No, I'm not. I'm not drunk either. Look out, something's going to happen. Morneal Mathaway? Well, who, who are you? Where, where, where'd you come from? You are Morneal Mathaway? Yes, 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 yes. My name is Glescu. I bring you greetings from 2487 A.D. Oh, 2487 A.D.? I realize this is a difficult phenomenon for you to grasp entirely, but here I am. We will now indulge in the 20th century custom of shaking hands. Mr. Morneal Mathaway? Oh, well, sure, 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 sure. Shake, yes. And you, sir? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, I don't mind. Shake. What a moment. What a supreme moment. Oh, well, what do you mean, what a moment? What's so special about it? Are you the inventor of time travel? Me, an inventor? No, 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 no. Time travel was invented by Antoinette Ingeborg, and, well, that was after your time. It's hardly worth going into at the moment, especially since I only have half an hour. Well, why half an hour? The skin drum can only be maintained that long. The skin drum is, well, call it the transmitting device that enables me to appear in your period. There is such an enormous expenditure of power required that a trip into the past is made only every 50 years. The privilege is awarded as a sort of go-bell. I believe I have the word right. It is go-bell, isn't it? The award made in your time? Well, you wouldn't mean Nobel by any chance. A Nobel Prize? That's it. The Nobel Prize. A trip is awarded to outstanding scholars as a kind of Nobel Prize. Once every 50 years, the man selected by the Gardamax is the most preeminent, that uh, sort of thing, you know. Up to now, of course, it's always gone to historians, or they frittered away on the siege of Troy and the, the first atom bomb explosion at uh, Los Alamos, uh, or the, uh, well, the discovery of America, things like that. But this year... Yes? Well, what, uh, what kind of scholar are you? I am an art scholar. My specialty is art history, and my special field in art history is... What? 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 You... Mr. Mathaway, in my own period, I may say without much contradiction, I am the greatest living authority on the life and works of Morneal Mathaway. My special field is you. Dave. Dave, did you hear that? Dave. Dave! I heard. Do you mean... You mean that I... I'm famous? That famous? Famous. You, my dear sir, are beyond fame. You are one of the immortals the human race has produced. That famous? That famous. Famous. Ah. Who, who is the man with whom modern painting in its full glory is said to have definitely begun? Who is the man whose designs and color have dominated architecture for the past five centuries? Who is responsible for the arrangement of our cities, the shape of our artifacts, the, the texture of our clothing? Me, you. No other man in the history of art has exerted such a massive influence over design. To whom can I compare you, sir? To what other artist in history? Can I possibly compare you? Rembrandt? Da Vinci? Rembrandt and Da Vinci in the same breath as you. That's ridiculous. They they lacked your universality, your taste for the cosmic. Wow. Uh, Mr. Glesker, excuse me. Do you happen to know of a poet named David Danziger? Did much of his work survive? Is that you? Yes, that's me. Dave Danziger? Well, no, no, no. I, I don't think so. The only poet I can remember for this time and this part of the world is uh, uh, Peter Tebb. Have never heard of him. Then this must have been before he was discovered. But you see, I, I am an art scholar. Well, you see, checking my chronometer, I see my time is getting short. But it is an overwhelming delight for me to be standing in your studio, Mr. Mathaway, and, and looking at you at last in the flesh. I wonder if you would mind obliging me with a small favor. Oh, sure, sure. You name it. Nothing's too good for you. What do you want? I wonder, I'm sure you don't mind, could, could you possibly let me look at your painting, the one that you're working on, at this very moment. Well, sure, sure. I, I have one right over here. Just uh, I'll pull the easel around. There you are. I uh, 
I intend to call this Figured Figurines Number 29. Hmm? Oh, but this... this... What's the matter? Well, surely this... This isn't your work, Mr. Matherway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's my work, all right. Figured Figurines Number 29. Recognize it? No, I do not recognize it, and that is a fact for which I am extremely grateful. Could I see something else, please? Something a uh, little later. Well, that's the latest. Everything else is earlier. Here, here, you might like this. Now, I call this Figured Figurines Number 22. I think it's the best of my early period. Oh, oh dear. You know, well, this, this looks like a, a smears of paint on top of other smears of paint. Right. Only I call it smudge on smudge. But you probably know all about that, being such an authority on me. And now, here we have figured figurines number two. Do you, do you mind leaving these figurines, Mr. Mathaway? I'd like to see something of yours with, with color, uh, with color and form. Well, I haven't done any real color work for a long time. Oh, wait a minute. Wait. I, I have one over here somewhere, uh, an old canvas. I, I was going to paint over it. Uh, ah, here we are. This is one of the two examples of my mauve and mottled period that I've kept. No, all right. I can't imagine why. It's positively, it's... Um... Oh, oh, dear. Oh, now, wait a minute. Let me show you some of my intestinal period. Ah, here. Here's a particularly good one. It's called large intestine rampant. Ah, do you like it? Oh, oh please, please. I... You know, I, I, I think I'd like to sit down. Well, take the comfortable chair. And here's another one called small intestine incisive. Oh, it's rather good, don't you think? I managed to avoid completely any definite line. You notice that? I, I don't suppose you ever drink of Glyphax. Oh, no, no, of course you don't. You, it hasn't been invented yet. I... Oh, now here's one that's bound to be great. It's one of my earlier smudge on smudges. It's called fly ash. Mm. I painted it by coating the canvas with slow-setting glue mm. and leaving it out on the window for about two and a half hours. Notice the delicate deposit of soot. Oh, no, please. Uh, please, Mr. Mathaway, please, please. Oh, I've got lots more. You know, you know, I, I don't understand this. All of these canvases, this, this is obviously before you discover yourself in your, your true technique. But I'm looking for a sign, a, a hint to the genius that is to come, and I find... Well, how about I this find... one? Here, here. Oh, please, 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 please. Oh, take that away. Oh, oh dear. Oh, dear, no, no. Oh, look, I'll have to leave soon. I, I don't understand this at all. Let me show you something here, gentlemen. Here, <clears throat> a pocket edition of the source... Complete paintings of Moniel Mathaway, 1928-1996. Were you born in 1928? Yep. May 23rd, 1928. Here. Look at the first painting. Well, that's... That's beautiful. I mean, the color, it, it, that's incredible. Oh. Oh, well, that stuff. <laughs> well, why didn't you tell me you wanted that kind of stuff? You mean, you mean you have paintings like this, too? No, 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 not paintings. One painting... Oh, I did it last week as a sort of an experiment, but I wasn't satisfied with the way it turned out, so I, I gave it to the girl downstairs. Would you like to look at it? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Very much. Very much. Well, here, I'll just toss you a book on the bed. Come on, it won't take a minute or two. She isn't at home. I thought she'd be home now. Oh, I did so want you to see that painting. I want to see it. I, I want to see anything that looks like your mature work. But time is getting short. The chronometer... I'll tell you what. Anita here has a couple of cats that she asked me to feed when she's away for a while. So she's given me the key to her apartment. Suppose I, uh, browse upstairs and get it. Yeah, but she... Suppose just... I browse through my room and get it. Get it? Oh, yeah, 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 you go ahead and browse, sure. Fine, fine, but please hurry. Oh, sure, sure, I'll hurry. I won't take long browsing. Well, that was it, the high sign. I'd seen Morneo Mathaway in action too many times as a shoplifter not to understand it. He was going upstairs to lift that book that he'd dropped on the bed. I knew he hadn't ever painted a picture like the one in the book, but he would now. Only he wouldn't paint them. He copied them. Well, I started talking automatically. You uh, paint yourself, Mr. Glasgow? No, 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 no. I, of course, I wanted to be an artist when I was a boy. I imagine every critic starts out that way, but I found it far easier to write about paintings than to do them. 
Once I began reading the life of Morneal Mathaway, I knew I had found my field. Not only do I empathize closely with his paintings, but he seems so much like a person I, I could have known and, and liked. That's one of the things that puzzles me. He's quite different from what I had imagined. Yes, I'll bet he is. Of course, history has a way of adding romance to an important figure. Mm -hmm. Oh, dear, I'm running out of time here. Do you, do you think you'll be back with the key soon? I, I practically no time left. I've just got to get upstairs to the time fence later. I, I just can't wait. I'll, I'll have to hurry now. Oh, dear, I did want to see an original Mathaway. I did want to. Mr. Mathaway, I... Oh! What's the matter? The time translator, it isn't here. It's gone. Uh, the book is gone, too. And Mathaway, he stranded me here. He must have figured out that getting inside and closing the door made it return. Yeah, he's a great figure. And he'll probably figure out a very plausible story to tell the people in your time to explain how the whole thing happened. Why should he work his head off in the 20th century when he can be an outstanding hero worship celebrity in the 25th? As to what will happen if we ask him to paint merely one picture. Oh, he'll probably tell them he's already done his work and feels he can no longer add anything of importance to it. He'll no doubt end up giving lectures on himself. Don't worry. He'll make out. It's you I'm worried about. You're stuck here, aren't you? Are they likely to send a rescue party after you? No. Every scholar who wins the award has to sign a waiver of responsibility in case he doesn't return. Yeah. No, I'm... I'm stuck here. Tell me, is it... Is it very bad living in this period? Well, not so bad. Uh, of course, you'll need a social security card. And I don't know how you go about getting one at your age. And well, the immigration authorities may want to question you since you're sort of an illegal alien. Oh, dear, dear. That's, uh, that's awful. Mm. Wait a minute. It needn't be. I'll tell you what. Morneal has a social security card. He had a job a couple of years ago. He keeps his birth certificate in that drawer along with his other papers. Now, why don't you just assume his identity? He'll never show you up as an imposter. Yes, but you think I could? Won't I be... Uh, well, won't his friends, or his, his relatives... No, he hasn't got any family, and I'm about the only friend he's got. You could get away with it. Maybe grow a beard and dye it blonde. Naturally, the big problem would be earning a living. Being a specialist on Mathaway and the art movements derived from him wouldn't get you set an awful lot right now. But I could paint. I've always dreamed of being an artist. I don't have much talent, but there are all kinds of artistic novelties I know about, all kinds of graphic innovations that don't exist in your time. Surely that would be enough, even without talent, to make a living for me on some third or fourth-rate level? Yes, certainly was. But not on a third or fourth-rate level. Mr. Glasgow, that is Moniel Mathaway, is the finest painter alive today and the unhappiest. After his last wildly successful exhibition, I remember he said to me, What's the matter with all these people praising me like that? I don't have an ounce of real talent in me. All my work is completely derivative. I've tried. I've tried to do something, anything that was completely my own. But I'm so steeped in Mathaway that I can't seem to make my own personality come through. And those idiotic critics go on raving about me when the work isn't even my own. Well, then whose is it? Mathaway's, of course. We thought there couldn't be a time paradox. I wish you could read all the scientific papers on the subject. They fill whole libraries because it isn't possible that time specialists argue for a painting to be copied from a future reproduction and so have no original artist. But that's what I'm doing. I'm copying from that book by memory. Uh, look, Blesku, uh, that is Mathaway, don't knock yourself out. But it's dishonest. No, it isn't. You're deliberately trying not to copy those paintings. You're working so hard at it that you refuse to think about that book or even discuss it. As a matter of fact, when I tried to get you to talk about it a little while ago, you couldn't actually remember it. That's true. That's true. You're the real Morneau Mathaway, and there's no paradox. You're actually painting those pictures. You're not copying them from memory. I know in my heart that they're not mine. All right, I'll forget it. Anyway, you're a much nicer guy than Mathaway ever was. And besides, a buck is a buck. <laughs> You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features Lulu by Clifford D. Simak, a story which demonstrates that a spaceship should be a darb, a smasher, a pip, a butte, but man all battle stations if it ever becomes a sweetheart of a ship. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, X-1 has brought you... The Discovery of Morneau Mathaway, 
a story from the pages of Galaxy written by William Tenn and adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Featured in our cast were Leon Janney as Mathaway, Guy Rep as the critic, Wendell Holmes as Glasgow, and Les Damon as Dave. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. This is Nightline, your tie line to the world, and this is Walter O'Keefe. Tonight, a visit to worlds strangely different from ours, the world of the future, the world of X minus one. Now, here is the future, X minus one. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X minus one. Tonight, the Clifford D. Simak story, Drop Dead. But first, hear this. Have you ever asked yourself what this country's most important natural resource is? I'm Dorothy Olson, NBC bandstand singing school teacher. Our most important resource? Well, you might consider it our mineral deposits, or our tremendous sources of water power, or maybe our just our great forests. Well, these are all very important natural resources, but there's one resource that's more important than all these combined, our children. Don't neglect them or their educational facilities. Poor schools breed inadequate citizens for tomorrow. And another thing, keep your youngsters in tip-top shape so that they won't miss important school days. Draft them against the weather so they won't catch needless winter colds. Check their wardrobe as they go back to school this fall to be sure that they have plenty of the right kind of clothing. Remember, our children are this nation's most important natural resource. It's your job to protect their future as they go back to school this fall. Now, X minus one, and the story of an unbelievable planet. Listen to Drop Dead. Exactly one hour and 20 minutes after we sent the survey ship out on its tail, the critters showed up. Ordinarily, when you make a landing on an unknown planet, it takes at least a week for any life to come creeping out of hiding and sneak a look. But there they were, the critters. They were almost cow-sized, but not as graceful as a cow. Their bodies were put together as if every blessed one of them had run full tilt into a wall. Their hides were splashed with large squares of pastel colors, the kind of color one never finds on any self-respecting animal. Violet, pink, orange, chartreuse. The overall effect was in a checkerboard made by an old lady who did crazy quilts. Max Weber, our biologist, stood at the tail fin with me and stared. Look at that on their heads. Those, those antlers. Those are not antlers, my friend. Well, I was afraid to say it. It, it looks like vegetation. As if they were trying to hide behind a skimpy thicket. What bothers me is the fruit and vegetables. That is fruit and vegetables growing on their heads. Hey, watch it. 
One of them's broken away from the herd and coming over this way. Step back. Give me a clear shot in case it charges. Look, here it comes. Huh. How do you like that? It just dropped. Dead. That animal just walked up to us and dropped dead. <laughs> We left the critter lying where it fell and started to set up camp. Carl Parsons, our ecologist, had the stove together and the supper started before the last tent peg was driven. I dug out my diet kit and mixed up my formula, and all of them kidded me about it the way they always did. It didn't bother me. Their kidding was automatic, and I had automatic answers. I know ulcers must sound silly and archaic. You ask any medic, he'll tell you they don't happen anymore. But I have a riddle stomach and a special diet kit to prove that they sometimes do. After supper, Carl Parsons, the ecologist, Max and I, dragged the critter in and had a good look at it. Hey, look at this, Ed. This animal's got different colored blocks on it, just like a, like a checkerboard. Look at this one. Holes. Yeah. Just like one of those peg sets a kid uses toys. Here, look what I found out of that. I'll poke it with my knife. There. Looks like a bee. Well, it is. <laughs> On top of being a tomato bush and a grapevine, this critter is a walking beehive. Why couldn't they be something simple? Yeah, it never is. You know, this is a screwy place. The critters? No, not the critters. The planet itself. Never saw one like it. It's positively naked. No trees, no flowers, nothing. Almost as if someone had said... Let's make a simple planet. Let's cut out all the frills. Let's skip all the biological experiments and just work on the basics. One form of life and the grass for it to eat. We unshipped the experimental animals, the rats, the zartils from Centauri and the pumpkins from Polaris. The pumpkins made an unholy racket because pumpkins are always hungry. You just can't give them enough to eat. You turn them loose and they eat themselves to death. We got them all unshipped and set up under a shed in rows when Max walked up to me thoughtfully, chewing on a toothpick the way he always did. Ed, there's something wrong. Yeah, what do you mean? There are no insects here. I wandered around, laid down in a dozen different places. Stands to reason a man should find some insects if he looked all morning. It is natural. What about the bees? What bees? Well, the ones that were in the critter. Didn't you see any? No, I didn't get close to any critter herds. Birds? Not a one. Oh, I was wrong about the flowers. The grass is tiny flowers. Uh, for the bees to work on. Hmm. Very neat, isn't it? I'm not so sure. <laughs> American tradition. Now back to X minus one and the Clifford Simak story Drop Dead. The bio team had the critters spread out on a canvas tarp. They were happily chopping him up in small pieces with a scalpel. Ed, I've got news for you. No brain. What? No brain. We can't find one, and there's no nervous system. That's impossible. How can a highly organized, complex animal exist without a brain or nervous system? He's got everything else. As near as we can figure it out, there are at least a dozen different kinds of flesh. Some fish, some fowl, some good red meat... Maybe even a little lizard. Well, an all-purpose animal. We found something, finally. If it's edible, and if it doesn't poison you, if it doesn't grow hair all over you. Well, that's up to you fellows. I'll get the cages down, and you can start killing off the little animals to your heart's content. And there's only one insect. These bees. And we never see these unless we're near a critter herd. And no birds. No fish in the water. Not even a single cell paramecium. Yeah, I was talking it over with Max. You know, I'd give my right arm to hear a cricket or a mosquito or even a hornet. This is the strangest thing we've... 
Hey, Max, what are you chewing? Hmm? Hmm, toothpick. That's no toothpick. Spit it out, spit it out. Hmm? That's grass. Oh, I don't know. I must have just picked it automatically to chew on it. Just a habit, I guess. Yeah. Well, go on with the report. Well, it's a walking filet mignon. That animal is an all-purpose for sure. It lays eggs, gives milk, and has six different kinds of red meat. Makes honey, two kinds of fowl, one of fish, and a whole lot of others we can't identify. Then, of course, the bacteria. And what about the bacteria? The critters swarm with them. And all of them the same. You know, it normally takes a hundred different kinds of bacteria to make the metabolism work. But here there's only one. It must do all the work of the hundred other species do. I wouldn't be surprised if that's the brains and the nervous system you couldn't find with your knife. The bacteria doubling in brass for both systems. The whole place balances. Nature's never static, never standing still. But here on this planet, it's standing still. Where's the competition? Where's the evolution? It's as if long ago all these life forms said, let's quit this feuding, let's get together, let's cooperate. Symbiosis. Well, we need another critter to work on. I'll bet you we get it. Luckily, Max didn't take Carl's bet. Right after breakfast, the critter came in and died with a savoir-faire that was positively marvelous. We unloaded all our supplies and got ready for a long stay. We were feeding all the experimental animals on a critter now. The carnivorous ones ate the critter meat and the vegetarians chomped on critter fruit and critter vegetables. They all grew sleek and sassy. We were sitting around after supper one night when suddenly we heard something. Hey. What is it? Listen. Thunder. Uh Uh-uh. Listen. I think... All right, quick. Everybody up into the ship. What is it? A herd of critters. Look, you see the dust? They're coming this way in a stampede. We swarmed up the ladder and tumbled into the port. Below us, the stampeding critters went grinding through camp. There seemed to be millions of them. They came pouring past for almost an hour. When it was all done, we came down and surveyed the damage. Well, the animals are safe. They were under the tail fins. Everything else is gone. Tents carried away. Food supply is gone. How about the emergency rations in the ship? I had to move them down to the supply tent so they'd be handy. They're gone, dashed into the mud. Well, even if we lifted ship immediately, it's at least seven weeks to the nearest contact point. And no rations. Well, gentlemen, I suggest you try on your bibs. There'll be steak for dinner. Steak? That's right. Steak or fowl or fish or honey, whichever you like. You mean, eat critter? You got any other ideas? (laughs) Well, for one time, Ed, I wish I had your ulcers. You've got your diet kit in your pack, right? Yeah. Well, let's get a good fire going and throw on a chunk of critter. The crew ate about a critter a day. They didn't seem to mind. Just at breakfast time, one would walk in and keel over. The crew ate like there was no tomorrow. I waited for them to break out in a rash or start turning green with purple spots or grow scales or something. But nothing happened. They felt better than they ever had. But then one morning, Max Weber turned up sick. Well, gentlemen, I've just taken a sample of my own blood. How do you feel? Lousy. I'm loaded with bacteria. Critter bacteria. I've checked some of the others. They've got a lower count than I have. Well, that figures. You got a head start. No. The rest of them have just been eating critter for a week. Mm. Hey, remember the day you ran out of toothpicks and took to chewing on a grass stem? Yeah. Well, we can't stop eating critter. It's all the food we have. 
Well, we might stop eating critter now. And there's my diet kit. We might make it home. Your diet kit wouldn't last us three days. I... I took a blood sample on the test animals. They've got a bacteria count almost as high as mine. Well, it doesn't make any difference. We still have to eat critter. We haven't got any choice. That night, Weber disappeared. We hunted him for three days. He couldn't have gone very far, but we didn't find him. We did find one queer thing, though. Hey, over here! Down in the gully! Uh, what is it? That... that white fungus. Kind of a ball. It wasn't here last week. We couldn't find Weber. And then about four days later, Carl woke me up. Ed, Ed, get up. Get up. What's the matter? Huh? The animals, the test animals. They're insisting. They're turning into cocoons or chrysalis or something. What? All of the test animals, the guinea pigs, the dogs, they're turning into white fungus balls. Carl, oh. the ball we found out in the field. Weber. Max Weber. It's got to be. We had some trouble finding the place because the land was so flat and featureless. We finally located it just as dusk was setting in. It split. It looks like an egg after a chicken's been hatched. Carl? Well, what do you think? Look inside. There are two halves of that... That cocoon. Look at the marks. You can see what it is now. Ed, you're the only one who had the chance. I think you should leave right now. Get back to the center and tell them. You've got your diet kit. You can make it. No wonder there are just the critters here. Take one drink of water. Chew a single grass stem. Take one bite of critter. Do any one of those things and you turn into one of them. Listen, Ed, you take your diet kit and notes and get out of here. But I can't run out on you. Forget us. We're not human anymore. You must not stay. If you do, in a day or two, a critter will come in and drop dead for you. And you'll go crazy all the way back home, wondering which one of us it was. <laughs> I walked slowly over to the ship and I stood at the foot of the ladder holding the notes and the diet kit against my chest. I thought of all the things we'd been through together. The crew, how they'd always kidded me about the diet kit. I thought of almost ten years eating that awful goo and that I could never eat like a normal human because of my ulcerated stomach. Maybe they were the lucky ones, I told myself. If a man got turned into a critter, he'd probably come out with a whole stomach and never worry about how much or what he ate. The critters never ate anything except the grass. But maybe, I thought, that grass tasted just as good to them as steak or a pumpkin pie would taste to me. So I stood there for a while and I thought about it. Ed, what are you doing back here? Carl, I just took that diet kit and threw it out into the waste disposal unit. What are you talking about? My friend, I am very hungry. What have you got for supper? Fred Collins speaking. And I'll have another word for you about X-1 in a moment. Hi, this is Walter O'Keefe. You know, they say there's nothing new under the sun, and maybe that's true. But there is something new under the moon, and that's Nightline. 
In Nightline, we think we've found the way to use the intimacy as well as the lightning-fast maneuverability of radio in an hour-and-a-half package of high-voltage, different entertainment. We found the way to make the airwaves your magic carpet to wherever big things are happening, anywhere in the country, for that matter, anywhere in the world. Now, let's say that your favorite comedian is performing at a Las Vegas nightclub. He's packing them in, and you've really got to have connections to get a table. Well, Nightline is that connection, and your radio is your ringside table. More things than you'd believe are happening in the so-called still of the night, and Nightline is your line to exciting entertainment after dark. My feeling is Nightline marks a new era in nighttime entertainment. Tune us in every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and you'll hear what I mean. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features Double Indemnity by Robert Sheckley. To commit the perfect crime, all Barthold needed was centuries in which to plan it and execute it, and an insurance policy with Double Indemnity. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, X-1 has brought you Drop Dead, a story written by Clifford D. Simak and adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Featured in our cast were Lawson Zerby as Ed, Ralph Camargo as Max Weber, and Joseph Bell as Carl Parsons. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by George Boutsas and is an NBC Radio Network production. You'll be on the right line to exciting entertainment when you hear Nightline tonight over most of these NBC stations. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X minus one. Tonight, Double Dare. But first, hear this. How's the weather in your part of the country? How'd you like to spend an evening basking under warm tropic breezes in the sound of a gently rolling surf? Well, that's the setting in which you'll find yourself Friday night as Monitor, broadcasting from spectacular Miami Beach, introduces you to the beauty and glamour of Florida and to the celebrities who make this resort area their winter headquarters. On Saturday and Sunday... Monitor will capture the spirit of Christmas season in music and song as great choirs from all over the country and from foreign lands join in the singing of Yuletide carols. There'll be reports on Christmas preparations in Bethlehem, West Germany, and Antarctica. Alfred Hitchcock, Eartha Kitt, Henry Fonda, and Roberta Sherwood are among the celebrities who will be visiting Monitor this pre-Christmas holiday. So start your weekend right with Monitor on Friday night and stay with Monitor all weekend long for celebrities, music, features, news, and sports over most of these same NBC radio stations. Now, X-1, and tonight's story, Double Dare. Our ship sat down on the planet Domerang right on schedule. Kermidge and I stood at the viewport and watched the big Domerangi official cross the field to our landing ramp. He was dressed in a bright yellow tunic, green-gray buskins, and was wearing a glittering jeweled diadem. He was walking in that ponderous way those people always walk. And it seemed like a long time before he actually reached the ramp and climbed into the ship. 
Welcome aboard. Greetings, gentlemen. I see you have come through the trip in fine shape. My name is Plovash. I'm your liaison while you are with us. My name's Marner. Pleased to meet you. And I'm Cambridge. Well, what happens now, Plovash? You have landed at a space port just outside our capital. I have come to take you to your quarters. We are providing you the finest accommodations our planet can offer. We want your working conditions to be of the best. Glad to hear it. The actual test will begin as soon as you wish. May I offer you good luck? Oh, we won't need it. It's not a matter of luck at all. It's brains. Brains and sweat. Very well. This is what you are here to prove. It ought to be amusing in any case, whatever the outcome may be. The whole weird deal had begun back on Earth. And it started where most arguments like this start, in a bar. Cambridge and I are top engineers back home, and when this visiting Domerangi made a few cracks about our civilization being second-rate in technology, we made a few choice remarks about his own technology. Well, the thing got to the news agencies and created quite a stir. It finally led to a regular interplanetary controversy over who had the best technical brains, Earthman or Domerangi. So, here we were, Kenridge and I, sitting in an alien hotel room millions of miles from home, staring glumly at the walls. Well, we're here, Marner, we're here. And we're going to show them up and go home rich and famous. You got that? Well, I hope we can show them. Well, we've got to. Between the two of us, we can match anything they throw at us. Well, can't we? Sure, sure we can. Hmm. You know, just look at this door mechanism, for instance. A simple cybernetic mechanism. Yeah. Ordinary gadget. Not nearly as efficient as our kind, either. That's just the point. Apparently, these Domerangi aren't half the sharks they think they are. We said we could duplicate anything they showed us, right? Yeah. And they've got two of their engineers on Earth trying the same stunt. Okay, so if our boys stick them and we dope out everything they throw at us here, we've won. The State Department's counting on our versatility, Miner. That's all we need. Versatility, cleverness, and hard work. Yeah, we'll beat those silly-looking pants right off them. Cambridge always did remind me of a football coach talking to his players at halftime. But at the moment, I was glad of it. I needed reassurance, and his own confidence was infectious. I cheered up, and by the next morning, we were ready to begin our part of the test. Plorbash came to see us again. Well, good morning, Plorbash. Good morning, gentlemen. According to agreement, we have equipped our most modern laboratory for you. We will give you two preliminary problems. When you have dealt with them, if you can deal with them, we will give you a third problem. And if we fail on any of them? Why, then we shall have proved our point. Fair enough. But suppose we deal with all three, Plorbash. How do we win this thing? Do we just go on with your projects until we miss? Oh, no, no. According to the agreement between our governments, the test is limited to three problems only. The same is true for our team on your planet. We consider that if you do indeed complete all three projects, you will have demonstrated your ability. I don't like the way you say that. What's up your sleeve? Sleeve? I do not understand the idiot. Ah, uh, never mind, never mind. Doesn't make any difference anyway. Just let's get started and prove our point. Yes. I myself am most anxious to observe your attempts. We return to X-1 and Double Dare in just a moment. Now back to X minus one and double dare. The lab that was to be our workshop until we won or lost this contest was a sumptuous place. The sort of research set up a sane engineer never even bothers to dream about. We stood there admiring it, Cambridge and I, while Plorvash waited for one of us to say something. Well, we're impressed. 
Man, it won't be hard to pull off miracles in a lab like this. You're making it easy for us, Plorvash. We are honest people. If you fail, it cannot be blamed on poor working conditions. Okay. When do we start? At once. Observe your first test. What, that little plastic bottle? The contents. It is a depilator. A bit rubbed on each cheek, and you do not need shave your beard for a week's time. Here is the bottle. Duplicate the product. But we're engineers, not chemists. Oh, never mind, Miner, never mind. Okay, Parvash, that's the first project. Uh, give us the second at the same time. That way, we'll each have one to work on. Two projects at once? <laughs> Very well, gentlemen, as you wish. The second is a trap for small house pests. Oh, like our mouse trap, huh? Oh, I do not know your mouse trap. But this is a most ingenious device. Our house pests are color sensitive, and this trap flashes colors as a lure. To cache vorks, we use this. For flames, we activate this device. And so on. Well, as you can see, it is most versatile. We have supplied you with an ample number of vermin of different sorts. They are in cages there at the rear of the laboratory. I believe you have everything else you need. You mean, this is all? Duplicate these two products, if you can. Okay. And we'll let you know the moment we finish. Yes. Do that. I didn't like the way he looked when he said that. There was a catch to all this somewhere, but I didn't have time to think about where it might be. Cambridge and I went to work on our projects at once. It wasn't nearly as hard as it should have been. Within four days, we summoned Plorbosch back to the lab. Do you mean to say you have finished already? Naturally. Uh, stay where you are, Plorbosch. I want to show you something. All right, Cambridge, activate the trap. Check. All right, stand back. I'm going to open the cages. Oh, no, 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 don't, don't. Those vermin, they'll be everywhere. Too late. Here they come. Oh, but you're mad. But they'll be everywhere. Close that door. Stand where you are and watch. You see? See that? But this... This is impossible. All running to the same place. Our trap. Look at that. They're in. Every last one of them. Remarkable. Yeah. We've improved on your model. We've built a better trap. Your model only deals with one species at a time. Ours handles every variety. It really is rather surprising. I suppose now you want to know about the depilator. Uh, that was easy, you know. With the equipment you gave us, chemical analysis is a snap. But uh, I'm afraid we've improved on the original model here, too. You have? In what way? But used at the proper strength, this depilatory of ours can last indefinitely. The effect seems to be permanent. Indeed. This is a fairly impressive performance, gentlemen. You may be interested to know that your counterparts on Earth have also passed their first two tests successfully. Oh, well, good for them. So, uh, it all depends on the third test, then, huh? It does, indeed. Shall we have that one now? Why waste time? Is that it? That thing on rollers that you've got covered up back there? Yes. Uh, permit me to remove that cover. Ah, a machine of some kind. I recognize a type of piston valve, relays... Tubes, rods? Uh, let me plug it in for you. Uh, here is the outlet. Now, I press the starting button. So. What does it do? Suppose you remove the plug from the outlet. All right. There. Hey, it's still going. Gentlemen, this is our power source. We use it for transportation and similar things. Duplicate it. This is your third problem. Well, we'll give it a try. I shall be most interested in the results. Most interested. Good day. Cheers. Well, Cambridge, the machine's still going. Yeah, I see. I wonder, can we build a perpetual motion machine? was a challenge, all right. A greater challenge than either of us had anticipated in our wildest dreams. 
Our heads reeled with the enormity of the ideas. But we worked and worked. I don't even know how long it was, but I think it was about three weeks. Finally, we summoned Plorvash, and he came into the laboratory to see our model and his side by side, both humming away with no plugs in the wall. There it is. You. You have actually done it. Yes. It's been running a week now, and it shows no signs of slowing down. It actually works, but how? A complex hyperspace function. We're making a full report, of course. I hope you realize this was quite a stunt in gravology. We didn't think we could do it until we had to, so we did. I didn't think you could do it either. This little box on our model, have you examined it yet? No, that nearly threw us. Apparently, it's tightly sealed. We didn't waste time getting it open. We bypassed that. But what is the darn thing anyway? That gentleman is our power source. Your what? A photoelectric amplifier that should keep the model running for, oh, another two weeks. Then? Then what? <laughs> Don't you see? We do not have a perpetual motion machine. We have hoaxed you into inventing one for us. What? We didn't really think you could. It took our best minds to rig up a model convincing enough to fool you. Well, I'll be... That does it. That invalidates a whole agreement. Well, now that we're through, we'll take our machine and go back to Earth. I am afraid that is not possible. What? By a statute in effect here for more than 700 years, any research done in a government lab is automatically the property of the Domerangi government. I am sorry, but I shall have to confiscate your project, gentlemen. We'll see about that. Furthermore, we are forced to confiscate you yourselves. We need you to instruct us on how to build these machines. Thorvash... Earth won't let you pull a trick like that. This is cause for war. I doubt it. Why should a terrible war come about for the custody of two men? I demand to see our consul. Of course. That is your right, I suppose. I will arrange it. Well, there it was. Now that it was too late, I knew what the cause of my uneasy feeling was. The consul from Earth was a white-haired, sturdy gentleman with a ruddy face and a suave manner. He came to see us in our hotel room that same evening. Now, please, rest assured we shall make every effort to extricate you. Do you realize what immense scientific prestige you've given to Earth? Yeah, fat lot of good that does us now. Well, authorities on Earth have kept me informed on the progress of the two Domerangi. They got through the first two projects as easily as you two did. We already know that. What of it? Well, now, this is the delicate part of the whole affair. I hate to put it into words. But, in fact, the people on the Earth end of this deal had much the same idea as the Domerangi. You mean another double cross? They put them to work on perpetual motion, too? No, not quite. They rigged up a phony anti-gravity machine and told them to duplicate it. Good night. What happened? Nothing yet. I'm told they're working on it very hard. Sooner or later, if they're at all as clever as you two, perhaps they'll hit on it. You'll just have to be patient and sweat it out until they do, and we can make an even exchange. Well, of all the cockeyed situations, you mean we have to wait until they invent anti-gravity? Well, that's the general idea. In the meanwhile, as I say, I will insist that you be shown every courtesy here on Domrang. Well, they may never discover a workable anti-gravity. Then what happens to us? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah? Minor. Yeah? Do you know anything about tensor applications and gravitational fields? Uh, what are you driving at? I'm thinking of the ideal lab setup they gave us. Do you think those two Domerangi on Earth would mind taking credit for someone else's anti-gravity theory if they were approached properly? Hey, that's right. They must be as anxious to get home as we are. Say, what in the world are you talking about? Uh, Consul, would you be above a bit of uh, smuggling? Diplomatic immunity and all that? Well, no, I, I, I don't know. I... We build the anti-gravity machine. You smuggle it to Earth and slip it to the Domerangi. Then use it as a talking point for a trade. Well, what do you say? Well, I admit, it does seem the only way out. Very well, gentlemen, I'll do my very best. But there seems to be just one hitch. What's that? You still have to invent that anti-gravity machine. Oh, we'll invent it all right, because you see, we have to. Come on, Cambridge. Let's get to work. 
Fred Collins again. I'll have another word about X minus one in just a moment. Is your head buzzing with a feverish, stuffed-up feeling of a cold? Here's how to get relief. Every second someone takes it for the miseries of a cold. Millions more take promo quinine. Every second someone takes it for the miseries of a cold. Promo quinine. More people have taken more bromoquinine cold tablets for more complete relief than any other cold tablet ever sold. Because bromoquinine is the only cold tablet sold with wonder-working quinine, nature's own miracle drug, and five other medicines health-fortified with vitamin C. Science has never found a real substitute for quinine. It helps bromoquinine do more. Bromoquinine works to relieve stopped-up nose, body aches, fever, irregularity, blues, and headache, even a virus cold. Remember... Every second someone takes it for the miseries of a cold. Millions more take bromoquinine. Get bromoquinine brand cold tablets. You have just heard X-1 presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine. Galaxy Magazine's science editor, Willie Lay, discusses medical problems of space travel in the current issue of Galaxy. Read Willie Lay's article as well as the many thought-provoking stories similar to tonight's tale of fiction based on facts of the future. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, X-1 has brought you Double Dare, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by Robert Silverberg and adapted for radio by William Welch. Featured in our cast were Ralph Camargo as Marner, Ivor Francis as Cambridge, Michael Ingram as Plorvash, and Harvey Hayes as the Consul. This is Fred Collins speaking. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future. Adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents... X minus one... Tonight, End as a World by F.L. Wallace. But first, hear this. When the place is fine and the time is right, when the moon is low and the stars are bright. You make it Pabst, cause Pabst makes it perfect. Yes, Pabst makes it perfect. Just as we always have ever since 1844. So next time, you make it Pabst because Pabst makes it perfect. America's Blue Ribbon Beer from the Pabst Brewing Company, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Yes, Pabst makes it perfect. Now, X minus one and end as a world. I saw it on the doormat in the front porch. The boy had made a lucky throw, and the paper was spread out neatly on the doormat facing me as I came out of the screen door. The headline was black across the top. They used the big type, the kind they use for presidential elections or when the town all-star Little League team won the national championship. I stood and looked at it through the screen door. I hadn't quite rubbed the sleep out of my eyes, so first all I saw was the little boxes of the screen. And then suddenly my eyes snapped into focus, and I read it. This is the day the world ends. Pete! Pete, come in and eat your breakfast. Well, just a minute, Ma. Now you leave the newspaper alone. You can read it later. 
Come on now, the eggs are getting cold. Yeah, but Ma, it's today. Well, what's today? Well, look at the headline. Let's see anything on the front page. Well, look. This is the day the world ends. Oh, that. Well, world's end or no, I won't have you eating cold scrambled eggs. Now you sit right down and eat your breakfast. I brought the newspaper into the breakfast table. I turned to the sports page. The Dodgers were winning or losing, I forget which, and UCLA was strong and was going to beat everybody they met that fall. An H-bomb had been tested in the middle of the Pacific, blowing another island off the map, just as if we had islands to spare. Ordinarily, that would be on the front page, but not today. Now, don't get the newspaper and the egg yolk. Mm. All right, Ma. Want some toast? Peter, do you want some toast? All right, Ma. It was Saturday. Big things always seem to happen on Saturdays. I ate breakfast and got up. I had the usual things to do, like mowing the lawn, for instance, but I skipped it that day. There wasn't any use mowing a lawn on a day like that. I went out remembering not to slam the door. It wasn't much, but it showed thoughtfulness. I went past the church and looked at the sign that was set diagonally in the corner so it could read from both streets. There it was in big letters, quoting from the papers, This is the day the world ends. Dr. Davidson scheduled a prayer meeting for the calculated time. It was a bright day. People were out walking or just standing, looking at the sky. It was too early to look up. Hey, Pete! Pete, here you are! Catch! Here. Hey, who showed you how to throw a football hit? Got this? Yeah. Hey, nice pass. Here you are, lateral. I got it. Here, throw, uh, throw me a long one. Huh? I'll run out on that button hook. No, no, look, I, I don't feel like it. Not today. Well, uh, what do we do? Oh, listen, the new issue of Popular Rocketry came in down at Grover's. Yeah, I, I saw it. Or we could go down and see Holly. All right. Pete? Peter? Hey, your mother wants you. Yeah, what is it, Ma? Now, don't go too far. I've got some things I want you to do. What? I want you to help me move some trash out of the basement and help me move some of the potted plants around in front. Ma, what's the use of doing things like that on a day like today? Never mind. Now, you come back by 11 o'clock, you hear? No. Oh, come on. Howie's probably down at Grover's. Hey, look at this high hurdle. I'll go right over the sign. Here I go. Olympic star Paul Smithfield. <laughs> He went up over the sign easily. Paul's on the track team in high school. I looked at the sign again as he went over the top. This is the day the world ends. They never said more than that, not in the newspapers or in the signs painted on the brick walls. They wanted it to hang in our minds, something we couldn't quite touch, but we knew was there. We walked along down Green Street toward Grover's. Well, what do you think of it? What? Well, you know, today. I don't know. What about you? We got it coming. Yeah, but will we get it? I don't know. Hey, look. It's going to be nice and bright today. Yeah, it is now. Might clot over. Yeah, it won't matter. It'll split the sky when it comes. Hey, you hear the new song? Hmm? Some disc jockey wrote it. I love you, I love you, love you. Hey, it sounds awful. Oh, listen, listen. I love you, love you, love you, till the day the world ends. I love you, love you, love you, till my heartbreak mends. And a lot more guff like that. <laughs> you know, it seems awful. I mean, making a song on a thing like that, you think you'd have more respect. Well, why shouldn't they cash in on it? How about that contest on TV? What will you do on the day the world ends, in 25 words or less? You know, some people would do anything for a buck. Yeah. You think they'd have some... I, I don't know, some understanding of how important it is. Well, they do. You should see the souvenir stands on Main Street. You know, pennants saying the end of the world, stuff like that. Ah, that's disgusting. Grover's has an end of the world Sunday. Joey Tripp had one last night. It was really the end. Yeah, he's a pig. Yeah, it sure is. Boy, it was really something with nuts on top. You're listening to End as a World, 
Tonight's attraction on X-1. Careful planning and sensible driving add up to an enjoyable vacation trip. There are a few tips from the National Safety Council that should help make your trip a pleasure instead of a tense, nerve-wracking time. Before you leave, have the car given a thorough checkup to be sure it will always respond properly to your careful control. Check the emergency equipment you'll need, such as a first aid kit, keys, permits, identification, flashlight, tire changing equipment, and your unexpired driver's license. Plan your trip for frequent rest stops with a good night's sleep each night. And then on your trip, pay attention to the job at hand and don't daydream. Stop off the road to see the sights or read the map. Be prepared for winding and straight roads, level and hilly roads, and changing traffic patterns between urban and rural areas. Obey all speed limits, traffic signs and signals, and keep your distance behind the driver ahead. This vacation is what you've been waiting for all year. Enjoy it with sensible driving. Now back to X-1 and End as a World. We went on to find Howie. He's a little guy, but he can throw a football further and faster than anybody else on the team. Howie was carrying a model of her rocket ship, carbon dioxide powered. Hey, let's see the model, Howie. Doesn't work. Well, what do we do? I don't know. We could play Saluji. No, we left the football over a piece. Oh, might as well just sit down on the grass. Okay. Hey. Yeah, I wonder if it, it'll really come. Yeah, well, will the president watch it from... He should have a good view from the White House. Mm. No better than us right here. What about Australia? Will they see it over there? They'll see it all over. Africa, too? And what about the Eskimos? doesn't matter whether they actually see it or not. It'll come to everyone at the same time. Yeah, how about that? Everybody. Not just in this town, but all over. Wherever there are people and, and even where they're not. You know what I keep thinking about? What? I keep thinking about the man who made the H-bomb. I bet he felt silly and spiteful blowing up an island. I mean, somebody might have wanted to live on it if he just left it there. Uh-huh. You know? Yeah. Bet he'd feel pretty small with his old H-bomb after today. Pow. My mother's over at the church praying. And what for? She just said that's what she wanted to spend today doing, right up to the last minute. You know, all the churches are holding prayer meetings. Town board wanted to close up that carnival on Pearl Street. You know, the one with the cooch tent? They said it wasn't dignified for today. They close it up? Mm-mm. The manager said he had his license, and he didn't care if today was the day the world ended or not. He was putting on five shows right up till it happens. Funny idea, those girls dancing and then, boom, it happens. And nobody to look at them anymore. I can't understand people. Shows and lawns and cleaning the trash out of the cellar on a day like this, it just doesn't make any sense. Well, people get used to doing certain things. Yeah, but today? Even today. That's how people are, I guess. Just got to keep on with what they're doing, even if it doesn't make any sense. Now we talked about it for a while, but we talked it out long ago. There was really nothing new we could say. Every once in a while we'd look up at the sky, but it wasn't going to come until it got here. Finally, I went home for lunch. Now you sit still and eat your lunch. Oh, Ma. It'll happen without your help. It's going to be all right. You think so? I think so. I, um, I'll give you your allowance now. Yeah, but, Ma, it's, it's only Saturday. I, I don't give my allowance. Well, I'll give it to you today anyway. You might as well spend it this afternoon downtown. <laughs> Gee, thanks, Ma. All right, I won't keep you over lunch. Now you can run uptown and watch it from there. Okay, Ma. You gonna go? Of course I'm not. Why should I get into that mob? I can watch it just as well from here. Ah, well, sure she could. It wasn't the same. Everybody I knew was going to be there. I changed my shirt before I left. I took a rag and wiped the dust from my shoes. I wasn't trying to be fussy or dressed up or anything. I just thought I should do it. I walked uptown slow because there was lots of time to kill. There was shade and sun on the streets and a few big clouds in the sky. I never knew how slow a day could pass. I suppose I should have slept late in the morning and kept busy doing something. 
Well, this was worse than putting on a uniform and waiting till game time. At least there was a coach on the field to let you know what to do as you ran through the drill. I ran into Paul at the corner of Cross and Chestnut. Hey, uh, you nervous? No, no. Why should I be? I mean, you're not in suspense? If only we had some way of knowing for sure. Radio, maybe. Oh, there's no radio. The calculations have been checked. Yeah, yeah, but maybe there's something we forgot or don't know. A lot of things can go wrong. Hi, right? fellas. Well, hi, hi Howie. You want to go down to Grover's and get them molded? I, I don't know. Well, we've still got lots of time. We won't miss anything. We all went down and had malted at Grover's. The television was on. They were showing a street in India with people looking up. They flashed all around to Italy, China, and Brazil. Except for their clothes, it wasn't much different from here. They were all looking up. Well, let's get outside. I haven't finished my malted. Uh, what's the difference in a day like today, huh? I want to finish my malted. Outside, I noticed there was a slight overcast. The big billowing clouds had passed, but this was worse. I hoped that it would clear away in time, not, not that it really mattered. Hey, it's a pretty big crowd for a Saturday, huh? Well, this isn't a usual Saturday. What time is it? I don't know. You got a watch, Paul? No. We can see the clock on the merchant's block from the corner. Come on. Hey, it's Ginny Wexelberg. You see her over there? Hey, how'd you like to spend a day with her? That'll really make it a big day, huh? Oh, you don't need that old Ginny Wexelberg to make this a big day. After today, a blind 15-year-old kid isn't going to seem so important. After today, nothing's going to seem important, huh? Well, there's the clock. We've still got plenty of time. We just walked around. A few other kids from school passed by, and we stopped. It, it was getting closer. The space between the minutes was getting longer and longer. Hey, I'm hungry. I want to go back and get a candy bar. You're crazy. It's almost time. I got a couple of minutes. Look. Well, you, you just had a malted. Well, I don't know. I'm hungry. I mean, I got a right to eat a candy bar before it happens, don't I? How can you think about food? It's only one minute. Well, all right. I just wanted to get one last candy bar, that's all. You think we could see better if we went across the street? It doesn't make any difference. It's going to be all over the world. was still a minute to go, and I kept wondering if there'd been a miscalculation. Now we were all looking up. All over the world, people were looking up. It, it, it was quiet. You could hear them breathing. I sneaked a look across the street. Ginny Wexelberg was staring up, and she was crying. I kept wondering why a pretty girl like that should be crying. And then, just as I looked back at the sky, it happened. <laughs> It came, the flash across the skies, a silver streak, the biggest vapor trailer ever was. It went from this side to that side in no time. It split the sky and was gone before the shockwave hit us. Nobody said anything. We stood there and shivered and straightened up after the rumbling sound passed. You know what? It's going to go around the whole world. Well, he did it. Yeah. Yeah, he did it. Yeah, he sure did. All the way to Mars and back. Safe and right on schedule. You realize that? He did it. He did it. The first trip to Mars. He's back. He's safe. Yippee! <laughs> the factory whistles down by the river started blowing. The bells of the Baptist, the Congregationalists, and the Roman Catholic Church were ringing. We were all jumping up and down, shouting, screaming, laughing as the vapor trail slowly faded into the overcast. I grabbed a hold of somebody next to me, and all of a sudden I realized it was Ginny Wexelberg, and she kissed me, and I kissed her back. And we yelled louder than all the factory whistles. We had a right. It was just like the paper said. This was the day the world ended, and the universe began. This is Fred Collins, and I'll be back with a word about X-1 in a moment. Hi, this is Walter O'Keefe. You know, they say there's nothing new under the sun, and maybe that's true, but there is something new under the moon, and that's Nightline. 
In Nightline, we think we've found the way to use the intimacy as well as the lightning-fast maneuverability of radio in an hour-and-a-half package of high-voltage, different entertainment. We found the way to make the airwaves your magic carpet to wherever big things are happening, anywhere in the country, for that matter, anywhere in the world. Now, let's say that your favorite comedian is performing at a Las Vegas nightclub. He's packing them in, and you've really got to have connections to get a table. Well, Nightline is that connection, and your radio is your ringside table. More things than you'd believe are happening in the so-called still of the night, and Nightline is your line to exciting entertainment after dark. My feeling is Nightline marks a new era in nighttime entertainment. Tune us in tonight over most of these NBC stations. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features William Morrison's novelette, The Sly Bunger Hop. To Colmer, it was the chance of a lifetime. He could hear opportunity knock. But where in all creation was the door it knocked upon? Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, X-1 has brought you... And as a world, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by F.L. Wallace and adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Featured in our cast were Jack Grimes as Pete, Larry Robinson as Paul, Peter Fernandez as Howie, and Alice Yorman as the mother. This is Fred Collins speaking. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. Next week on X-1, another exciting story from the pages of Galaxy. The Scapegoat by Richard Maples. If you saw a big teenage young bully beating up a helpless old man on the street, what would you do? Try to stop it? Or save your own neck by just walking away? Well, this is the story of a man who did stop it. Of a newspaper reporter who not only rescued the old man but took him home, hoping to develop a good angle for the newspaper series he was writing on juvenile delinquency. The scapegoat tells of what happened then, of the terrible threat posed by this seemingly harmless old man to the unsuspecting reporter and his family. Be sure to hear it next week on X-1. Wondering what the weather will be like tomorrow night? Will it be cool? Will it be hot? Will it rain or not? Well, don't give it another thought, because NBC's Monitor has a weatherproof evening planned for you with excursions to three world-famous underground scenic spots. You'll go roving with Monitor on a -a two-and-a-half-mile trip through Marvel Cave in Missouri. You'll listen to the music of a stalactite organ in Luray Caverns, Virginia. And you'll visit the historic catacombs of Rome. Between trips underground, you'll hear another merry report on his vacation tour of Europe by comedian Jonathan Winters. And you'll rub elbows with international celebrities at a unique party in Tutshore's famous restaurant in New York. There'll be music and news, too. In fact, there'll be something for everybody on Monitor. So start your weekend right with Monitor Friday night. And stay with Monitor all weekend long. Nightline takes you to wherever exciting, interesting, and entertaining things are happening. Tonight, over most of these same NBC stations. <laughs> 